Apocalypse Awakening Written and read by Jake Houston For more information on this book and other upcoming projects, please visit jakehouston.com Chapter 1 Front Lines What's the problem with winning battles? People like to ask questions after, especially civilian types who haven't grasped enough horny answers to know better. But tonight was supposed to be one for good impressions, so Michael took out the best smile he'd found in the mirror and got to work. How does it feel to win? He repeated. I try not to get caught in the idea of winning or losing. You know what has to be done in the moment, and I think on the results later. So, the young woman, close to his own age, drawled as she leant back in her chair, giving Michael a chance to brace himself. Ye have to treat a life-or-death battle as another day in the office? He hoped his tight grin looked genuine as the audience chuckled. Sergeant Conway. Please, Scarlet, he interrupted. Just Michael. The interviewer blushed. It wasn't obvious. A subtle layer of makeup helped hide the reddening of Scarlet's cheeks. But the bright studio lighting, plus Michael's close proximity to her, made sure he was the only one who noticed. If the audience had seen even a hint of her flush, Michael was sure they would have started ooing and shouting. They were an excitable lot tonight. So, Michael, Scarlet resumed, clearing her throat and acting as if the new form of address meant nothing to her. In the light of uh, recent victories on the Eastern Campaign, questions have begun to crop up as to what's next for the Alliance. Some have even gone as far to say the military group has strayed too far from its original purpose. Michael made sure to shield his surprise from the cameras, feeding his reaction live to hundreds of thousands of viewers around the world. The Reform Party, Scarlet continued, with the steely-eyed look of an interviewer with the upper hand, claim the Balfarians are behind the spreading Skepsis infection. Is the Alliance concerned about these allegations? The quirk playing on Scarlet's lips told Michael this was payback for startling her earlier. He smiled despite the nervous silence filling the studio. Michael was certain his publicists backstage were falling apart in the question's wake, but he had an easy out for these traps. I'm a soldier, he replied, not a politician. I'm not here to comment on conspiracy theories, but I appreciate that you think I'm qualified enough to do so. The audience's laughter was even accompanied by a few applauding hands as the tension drained. Earlier, Michael turned to look before averting his eyes. The lights were shining directly at him, making the people behind look like lurking, shadowy creatures. Scarlet ever so slightly straightened in the armchair, identical to his own, her blue suit jacket straining, and cocked her head as she smiled at him, with a remarkably straight row of teeth. Michael had been doing this long enough to tell she'd been genuinely impressed by his defence. Good to see he was getting better at this theatre act. My apologies, Michael. It's easy to forget this is only your part-time job. So let me ask, how do you perform so well at your regular one? Michael stiffened at the question. Never mind the word perform, demeaning the Alliance's fight to some sort of easy-going show like this one. Although it was true, he was good at his job. Very good. The best, in fact. They praised him for it. He hated that they did. But he couldn't stop. He wished he was back there right now. Let me ask that in a better way, Scarlet said, as she seemed to notice his discomfort. What makes a good soldier? He relaxed. She was right. It was a better way to phrase the question. Clearly, he wasn't the only one good at his job. The first thing you have to remember is that it's all relative. Michael grimaced as several people laughed. The media had recently picked up on that quote, even calling it his catchphrase. He'd promised himself to use it less. The problem with good phrases was they tended to stick. He ploughed on. Out on the field, everything changes. You'll be punished for things you do every day at home without thinking about, and rewarded for actions that would see you locked up anywhere else. In that regard, there's four virtues one needs to follow. Michael sat up in his seat. Scarlet's glance towards his chest didn't go unnoticed. 
you've got to be strong, he said, bringing Scarlet's attention to his hands as he ticked off the word. Only when you have the strength to look after yourself can you turn to help others. And to do that, you need to be brave. He folded another finger. Start by hiding your fear, and real courage will quickly follow. He locked eyes with Scarlet. Then there's passion. Michael saw her sharp intake of breath. Such games with women used to perplex him. Only recently had he realised how fun they could be. You have to fight. Not only for your fellow soldiers, but for a cause you truly believe in. Michael turned in his seat, staring directly into one of the camera's yawning lenses, as the publicists had told him to, ready for the final blow. And that leaves selflessness. To be willing to sacrifice anything, even your own life, for the greater good of others. He turned back to Scarlet as he finished. That's what makes a good soldier. Applause erupted from the audience as Scarlet gave him an admiring smile. Seemed a soldiering wasn't the only thing he was good for. A far cry better than the first round of interviews he'd done. But amongst the avalanche of congratulations, Michael could still feel it. The need to get the hell out of here. Michael took a moment, a long one, to look at the nighttime cityscape lying beyond his window. He was staying in a hotel deep within the city, his view dominated by monoliths of glass gleaming across Central Square, their innards lit by empty office lights and the soft green glow of fire exit signs. High in the building as he was, Michael saw the patches of cloud floating above the skyscrapers and the hazy, light-polluted skyline. Prosperity. He had visited plenty of cities in the last few weeks, and the pre-planned grid of city easily blended with the others, swept into a whirlwind of built-up coastlines and trendy riversides. Filled with a congregation of humming traffic and sporadic police sirens, prosperity was just like the rest. Except for one detail, if you didn't count the peculiar name. He could see it now, sitting across the square next to the town hall. The Alliance Headquarters. Turned out the bureaucratic high end of the Alliance lived inside an elongated brick of tinted window buildings, replicating the same bland skyscraper as its neighbours, neatly tucked away for Michael to find amongst the countless interviews and airports. The discovery brought him little joy. With each passing day he felt less a soldier and more a public figure, a fighter turned superstar for V and tabloids designed to attract views and waste as much of the reader's time as possible. Michael knew the reasons for his latest round of appearances. To boost morale for the Alliance, to unite the dissatisfied countries that fueled the combined military effort and raise higher recruitment numbers. It had worked in the first weeks of the campaign, but he'd read the most recent articles. The ones focused less on the Alliance's struggle to keep global order, and more on his latest leaked shirtless pictures. And now, tantalising completely fabricated stories about who he might be interested in romantically dominated the headlines. Yesterday, he'd resolved to avoid the internet for at least a week when he saw an article discussing the secret Conway diet and whether he'd really gone vegan or not. Vapid nonsense designed to distract from everything he'd been saying. A pair of arms wrapped themselves around his torso, hands tightening over his abs as a wave of perfume hit his nostrils. Scarlet rested her head against his shoulder blade, her loose hair tickling his spine as she murmured how warm he was. He lay his hands over hers, still staring out at that expanse of humanity beyond the window. At one time, Michael would have loved the attentions of the gorgeous young woman, but it had been a long time since he'd left home to be glorified by the military and thrust into the celebrity globe-trotting life. The novelty had worn off quick enough. So many fantasised about this exact scenario, although they didn't realise how fleeting it was. He should be out there with the men and women he'd abandoned on the front, achieving something, not fooling around back here. So why did he keep sleeping around? A few nights alone in bed, or in the company of a beautiful woman's body, the results were the same. By the end of the week, he would be gone. Scarlet pressed her soft body against his, 
rubbing her thigh against Michael's hardened leg muscles. The stroking of his hair, the wet kissing at the back of his neck, brought Michael to his senses. A life woman writhed against him while he brooded. He was only punishing himself by ignoring her. Come on, soldier, Scarlet whispered in his ear. I have a new mission for you to carry out. Michael turned and planted his lips on hers, mostly to stop any more bad jokes. A noise! Michael grabbed Scarlet's thighs and flung her to the left. She squealed in excitement, bouncing atop the thick mattress as Michael spun around, planting his legs wide. He instinctively reached for the rifle strapped to his shoulder, hand coming away empty as he scanned the dim room bathed in the glow of the city's lights. He looked for a movement, for anything out of place. The sound had come from directly behind. What could have made such a shrill? Then he heard the ringing for a second time. His smart gauntlet buzzed on the bedside table, outer screen glowing as it received a call. Scarlet lifted her head to look at the commotion. Leave it. It's probably another studio trying to steal you away from me. It might be the Alliance, Michael said, too concerned for the jovial mood. The Alliance will still be there when you wake up. Just ring them. Hey! Michael crossed over to the table and picked up the gauntlet. His suspicions were confirmed. A private number was calling. Alliance Command? Michael slid out the tiny earpiece from the gauntlet's left side and clipped it to his ear. He couldn't risk a member of the press listening in on this conversation. Scarlet let out an annoyed huff, sitting up and clutching the bedsheets to her as Michael answered the call. Conway speaking. Michael! He recognised the voice straight away. Lucio Cornelius, the man responsible for starting the international media blitz campaigns. Lucio had never been one of those superiors who shouted themselves hoarse at the new starts. He had a commanding but friendly aura, which earned him respect without particularly trying for it. Major, Michael replied. How are you? came the kindly voice. Michael glanced over at Scarlet, who stretched her arms over her head, pretending not to notice the sheets fall to her lap. Can't complain, sir. Yourself? A dry chuckle crackled through the gauntlet. That's a dangerous question to ask. There seems to be more bad news every day, but it's important not to get bogged down. I see, Michael said with an awkward pause. Lucio was undoubtedly talking about the spreading rebel group, who'd recently taken to calling themselves the People's Legion. It was one of the points Michael had been told to underplay if brought up in an interview. Alliance Command were worried that an admission of the true scale of rebel victories would encourage more. But the situation is improving, Lucio said in a lighter tone. We have better equipment arriving, and recruitment numbers are up, thanks to you. I'm glad to hear it, Michael said with earnest. Lucio had done a lot for him these past few years. It felt good to finally be paying back the mountain of favours between them. But... Michael glanced back to the Alliance headquarters, sitting silent across the square. Is it enough? It's more than enough. Michael wasn't sure he agreed, but Lucio continued. Unfortunately, it'll have to come to an end for now. Oh? The rebel threat has gotten worse, and our new recruits lack experience. I need you down south to help on the front. Michael's chest swelled. Back to the front. Away from the civilian gossip and wasteful parties. He was sick of being told about the good work he was doing. Here was his chance to fight again. To see some results. I'm sorry, but... No need to be sorry, sir, Michael interrupted. He glanced over at Scarlet's confused face as a broad smile filled his. I'm glad to help. It's been too long. Lucio paused, chuckled again. What would we do without you? A lot of military uniforms waited at the gate. Green and brown camouflage advertising the terrain they'd be fighting in. The men and women gathered were fresh to the business. Young faces excitably chatting, rather than old scars, grimly ruminating. The experienced lot were already with the new sets of armour, waiting at the other end of the flight, where Michael would have been too, if not for the last month of interviews and undeserved luxury. 
Few civilians stuck out amongst the throng of soldiers, waiting to board. The place they were flying to hadn't seen much of a tourist season these last years. A couple people looked his way, but none approached the lonely spectacle sitting on his empty bench by the whitewashed wall. That was fine by him. It was still more comfortable than lounging in the comfy seats of the first-class area with the other sergeants, separated from his peers by a glass wall of false value. A TV screen played above his head, ignored by everyone except one bored soldier, chewing her gum between the breaking news headlines. Alliance officials have given Siama Corps permission to expand operations on Mars in exchange for exclusive rates on all raw materials mined. The move gives the company a complete monopoly over resource extraction on the planet, despite opposition from groups who say, What are you playing at, bro? A drunk voice shouted, drowning out the TV's white noise broadcast. You know I like her. And so what? Another voice, tinged by a drunken slur, asked. Everyone knows that. Then why the fuck are you messaging her? She messaged me! Michael sighed when he saw the boisterous group round the corner. Come on, man, let it go, a third man said without much enthusiasm. Better effort than the fourth member of the group, grinning like an idiot at the prospect of his two friends throwing fists. Yeah, the smaller man who'd been doing the messaging said. It's not like you had a chance with her anyway. Oh yeah? You wanna go? The first man turned and squared up to him, bunching a strong set of muscles together. Michael stood. Only if you want to, the smaller man said, not backing down in the slightest. I'm not a bitch. I'll make you wish you were. The big man shoved. His hands didn't reach their target. They found Michael's chest instead. He stumbled back, his sour look turning to shock when he saw who he'd pushed. Leave it, Poss. Michael! Poss's pout made him look all the less intimidating. Sticking up for your brother, huh? Out of the way, Finn said, not breaking his stride. I can take this small fry. Michael shot a look that shut him up quick. Defending him again? Poss asked, readjusting his stance, finding it harder to tower over his new opponent. Not defending his actions, Michael said. I'm sure Finn's been a little shit as always, but that doesn't change the fact we're family. So if you want to get to him, there's a line you have to go through first. Don't worry, it's not long. There were a fair gathering of eyes on them now, and Poss glanced about him, uncomfortable in the heat. Whatever. He turned and stalked off, all injured pride with half the bluster. The two friends trailed after. Michael grabbed Finn's arm before he could follow. Let me go, Finn complained, loud enough for the others to hear. I'll show him a thing or... He stopped as soon as Poss was out of earshot. Gave Michael a relieved grin that lit up his face, made all the more boyish by the wisps of hair around his mouth. Thanks for that. He would have beaten the shit out of me. I suspected as much, Michael said, letting go of Finn's arm and making for his seat, ignoring the straggling onlookers. Which part? Me not wanting to fight, or him winning? Both. Michael sat, and Finn plopped into the next seat. I should be telling you off. Yeah. Because we both know how great you are at lecturing, Michael smiled. He used to get annoyed at Finn, the cheeky attitude, and his ignoring of Michael's lessons when there had been no one else to give them. At one stage, he'd learned to give in to Finn's ways, to drop the burden of being the wiser older brother, and since then, they'd been getting along all the better for it. You managed to find the bar then? Right after security, Finn said, brushing a leftover dribble from the corner of his mouth. This airport wants to get us drunk. And now you've fallen out with Poss. Again. Yeah, but it'll be fine. We'll make up soon enough. Again, Finn said, putting on a deep voice for the last word. Michael nodded, partly admirable of Finn being so flippant about fighting with his friends, part solemn about his own inability to do the same. Brooding, brooding, always brooding. There were only a few years between him and his brother, Yet Michael felt he'd aged far more than he was due. What's got you so down? Finn asked, never one to overlook Michael's moods. Something on your mind? That's the problem, Michael said, looking about the busy room for eavesdroppers. Not entirely sure he cared. I've been thinking too much. About the war? 
There's enough discussion on that already. No, my thoughts haven't been clear since the other day. Wait, Finn said, sitting up. You had that interview on Channel 4 a few days ago, with that hot bird. Bird? Really? Did you fuck her? Michael resisted the urge to tell him off for swearing. Often forgot his brother was twenty-three now. Just nodded instead. You dog! Finn yelled, making a few heads turn. What a dog! He repeated, punching Michael's arm. It wasn't the reaction he'd been looking for. I knew you'd do it, Finn said, smiling wide, proud as if he'd been the one to sleep with Scarlet. Our little Michael's all grown up. Strange sentence coming from his considerably smaller brother. Remember when you could hardly look a bird in the eye? Now look at you, picking them up left and right since you joined the army. Whereas the term bird and dog seemed to be the main things Finn had picked up since enlisting. This is great. I just won my bet with Poss. That's what you're putting money on? Michael asked, smiling at Finn's building enthusiasm. Among other things, Finn said, giving his cheeky grin again brown eyes sparkling. You're a lucky man. Michael's smile dropped. That's the thing, though. Sleeping with women. The money. The fame, worst of all. It's meant to make me feel good, but I just... don't. Finn looked confused, as if feeling good was a weird topic to broach. So when do you feel happy? In battle, in the midst of fighting where the rules were set and the objectives made clear. Us and them, survive and kill. Nothing more, nothing less. He'd discovered the joy several years ago, and he sorely missed it each time he was dragged away. Michael couldn't say any of that, of course. Admitting to that line of thinking turned a man from role model to sociopath. Instead, he simply shrugged. Finn's smile slinked back. You know what it is? You're overthinking things again. He sat forward, copying the style of an all-too-formal talking to. Why did you not enjoy sleeping with that woman? Because I didn't connect with her? So what? So, wasn't it meaningless in the end? Yeah, so what? Michael felt a little taken aback. Then what was the point? Did you feel like doing it at the time? Well, yeah. And did you enjoy it? Yes. And did she? She certainly seemed to. Then there you go, Finn said, patting Michael's shoulder, the black leather bracelet with Conway etched on the metal band clearly visible. Michael had given him the bracelet to match the one around his own wrist, a marker for the two remaining members of their family. That's all there is to it. What more is there to think about? Michael paused. Nothing. Exactly. You know how many men would kill to be in the position you're in? What's that saying? Finn asked, nudging Michael in the ribs. It's all relative. Wise words. Then there you go. You always like to overthink things, no matter how well they're going. But at the end of the day, why bother? Michael found himself smiling again. Did that a lot of his brother these days. His mind felt better too. Some of the sludge in it scrubbed clean. Had he really been considering himself the mature one out of the pair of them a minute ago? I'll talk to Major Cornelius when we arrive. We'll see about putting you on a post away from the front line. Finn suddenly frowned. Can you not do that? I'm not having you, please, he said, a rare awkward look about him. I don't want any special treatment, not because of who my brother is. Michael wasn't sure he agreed. The reason he'd said yes to Finn joining the army was because he could protect him in it. Finn, I... Don't do it, Finn stood, looking away from Michael and towards Poss, stumbling back with his two friends in tow. Bro! Poss cried, thrusting out his arms. Forget about her! We can't let a woman get between us. Absolutely not, bro. Finn roughly hugged him, the embrace resembling more of a wrestle. Good thing you came back. I won our bet. Which one? Poss asked, big face crumpled in confusion. No one about that redhead and the- No! Finn shouted, loud enough for the whole room to hear. About my brother and the bird from Channel 4. No way, you stud. One of the other friends shouted towards Michael. What a legend. Absolute dog. All right, get out of here, all of you, Michael said, failing to keep the amusement out of his voice as the laughing group lurched towards the line for the plane, arms wrapped around each other's collective shoulders. Finn looked back over Poss's shoulder as they left. 
Will you be at the base when we get there? Yes, but I'll be busy. Command wants to talk to me. Doesn't matter, Finn shouted with his usual grin. You'll see me again before you know it. He had not thought he would need the sliver of metal tonight, hanging dry from his belt for many months. Clean of sin, the day for it to be wetted again had finally arrived. He might not have expected to use it, but that was more the reason to carry these things. Just in case. Look there. They've moved out of cover. I can see that. Michael listened silently to the two men. He was close enough to hear their breaths, shallow and out of tempo with the drops of rain beating on the layers of fanned leaves. Wasn't hard to hide back here, amongst the humid black of the trees, surrounded by the clicking of cicadas, screeching birds, and monkey howls punctuating the thick mosquito-filled night. Why don't we shoot them? Not till they ever start. That's the order. Wait for my go. Michael didn't like it, but there was no choice in the matter. He'd chosen his path, and they theirs. From that point onwards, this collision had been destined, fate steering into the outcomes. At least, that's what he told himself. Always did get preachy in his head before the madness began. That sweet, simple chaos. But we might miss our chance. We'll only be ruining everyone else's if we get carried away. Hold your nerves together. I think that's a major over there. If we get him first, then the whole chain of command will collapse. They had spotted the blue A on the Major's upper arm. Impressive, considering the dense tree canopy preventing any moonlight from reaching the dark forest floor. They had to be using a pair of binos, hidden by their backs, brown coats blending into the bath of shadowy foliage. The two men must have spent hours waiting and crawling through the foul-smelling jungle muck and ditches, circling past the piquette line and scraping by the sensors buried in the bushes and long grass. A terrific effort. A mighty waste. No time for a countdown. There were no rewards for hesitancy. A round of gunfire rang through the forest, smashing the rhythm of jungle life, echoing and calling out for its rebellious brothers to join. Michael grabbed the opportunity, lurching forward and embracing the man on the left, the one in charge. The gasp was drowned out by a chorus of clattering rounds joining their leader, furious orange streaks ripping through leaves and splintering thin trunks, sinking into the larger trees. With every round fired came the biting roars, a spitting sound between the snarling of a large beast and the revving of a powerful sports engine, repeated dozens of times from the far tree line. Charger rifles, the rebels' latest response to the energy weapons arms race. The glowing orange projectiles flashed in the distance, lighting up the night and dashing through the air before burying themselves into the far sides of the ruin. Michael saw his allies, proud men and women of the Alliance, crouching behind the ancient clumps of moss-covered stone, firing back with their blaster rifles, drenching the forest in blue light and synthetic screams as the blaster shots tore into their assailants. Should we shoot now? Isn't that the signal? Michael doubted the man's companion would be responding to the panicky questions, not with an arm wrapped around his neck and a blade jammed in him. Michael hadn't been surprised by the lack of noise from the stabbed man. No one made much complaint over a knife in the back. Their bodies must realise how pointless it would be to protest. Our guys are letting up! They need our- The rebel paused in his shouting, stared at the knife handle protruding from his commander's back and the hand holding it. Michael would have met the gaze if not for the visor of his helmet, obscuring his eyes from the terrified man with a dark screen. He let go of the knife and jumped. The rebel shock delayed him, long enough for Michael to grab the round barrel of his charger rifle and shove it to the dirt. He threw himself at the man and they tumbled onto a bed of leaves that softened their fall. He easily pinned the other man to the ground, the mass of his newly armoured body crushing all resistance. The man's arms fell to his sides, and Michael dug through the dark tangle of grass, grabbing his concealed wrist. He rammed his thumb into the wrist's underside, making its owner yelp as he pressed hard between the spindly bones and delicate veins. The muscles spasmed under Michael's thumb, forcing the rebel to release his weapon. The man had lost this battle, and he must have known it. The attempts to shift off Michael's weight had grown far too weak. He saw the wide, startled whites of the rebel's eyes. Michael was grateful for being in control. He could decide how to incapacitate the young man. An opportunity to spare a life. You take the small wins where you can. Michael stooped into a crutch and rolled the man over, shoving him face first into a pile of soggy roots and decayed leaves. Sat back, 
straddling the man's scrawny back and wrapping a forearm under his neck. He placed his other arm behind and squeezed the neck in a scissor of steel-encased muscle. Michael's breathing thundered in his ears, the reverberations trapped by his helmet, and he barely heard the man's desperate choking between the bangs of nearby gunfire. It didn't take long for the man to thrash, twist, weakly flail, and finally relent. Through the flexible armour plating on his arms, Michael felt the neck muscles relax. He released his grip at once. There was a chance he'd killed the man, but at least he'd tried to save his life. No time to check the results. Michael knelt amongst the tree line, stealing the position his enemies had used. Hoped he wouldn't be receiving the same surprise they had, but you could never count on luck to survive out here. He was ready for whatever came. The forest in front was awash with sporadic blue and orange light, a dazzling firework display of both sides fighting to gain control over the clump of meaningless time-stained stone. Even with his helmet on, Michael's ears were bombarded with a cacophonous noise, difficult to discern one thunderous gunshot from the next. The weapon's sudden, contrasting fire stung his eyes, leaving deceitful afterimages to play amongst the forest. Stabbing bright charger rounds zipped from the depths of forested undergrowth that merged with cloaked, shifting men. He tried to spot the enemy beyond the shadow line of the trees and quickly realised it was hopeless. He focused on his own side instead. Soldiers, coated in armour designed with blocky flares of jungle camouflage, popped in and out of sight as they were illuminated by their blue blaster shots. They sheltered behind a thin line of lincoln-crusted stones adorned with grassy clumps. The cover wouldn't last long, not against weapons as fearsome as charger rifles. At least the enemy were worse off behind their curtain of leafy branches and tall plants. But it was obvious the rebel numbers were greater, bolstering their attack. Impossible to tell how many that number was, which is probably the greatest disadvantage of all. Where was Finn? Michael couldn't spot him or any of his squad amongst the soldiers in the clearing. Hoped that was a good thing. He might be further back in the forest, where the Alliance numbers were thicker. Michael's own squad had been ambushed coming back from the patrol, and he'd become separated, retreating alone to the forward operations base to find the two men waiting in the bushes. The enemy had been planning this ambush for a while. Michael would have to worry about Finn later, had to deal with the immediate threat first. He spotted the Major, Lucio Cornelius, who the two rebels had been preparing to shoot. He was crouched under an archway that stood further back from the walled defensive line, and Michael suddenly spotted something about the archway that the Major hadn't. The stones were flashing in and out of sight as blaster rifles near it fired, each shot painting a split picture second of the rock starting to crumble, dust sprinkling on top of the oblivious Major. The immense kickback of vibrations flung from the blaster rifles caused the ancient stones to tremble and rub against one another, and the ruin of archway was ready to give in to their dance. Lucio wore a new set of armour, but that wouldn't save him. It was designed to stop a lucky shot of gunfire, not half a ton of falling rock. Michael could shout and warn Lucio, or call him on his armour's communication system, but he realised the Major wouldn't hear him, and the call take too long. Before he could properly think, his body had already acted. Michael sprinted forward, barrelling through the jungle vegetation. Branches snapped, bushes and grass crushed underfoot. A charger shot raced through the trees ahead, slamming dead centre into the archway's keystone. A great crack. The arch broke, and stones tumbled in earnest, hurtling towards Lucio. No time to warn. No time to drag him safely aside. All he could do was push and pray. Michael jumped forward and shoved. Lucio went sprawling, arms stretched in surprise. He cleared the arch and fell behind the stone wall. Safe. Michael felt a brief rush of triumph. Then the first stone hit. It crunched into his back, crushing his armour and mushing his insides. Felt something crack. Maybe lots of things. He vomited and a sluice of blood flooded his helmet, filled his eyes. Another stone hit the back of his head, knocking in the helmet, repeating the process. No longer able to feel. No longer able to see. Couldn't hear or even smell. Only taste the blood. Everything went black. Chapter 2 Not a Good Day Dead. He must be dead. Then how could he still... Michael lurched forward and slammed onto the floor, water cascading around him. He spluttered water from his mouth and gasped desperately for air, whacking numb limbs against stone. A harsh light struck him and he covered his eyes, turning onto his back. Howling filled his ears, cold air whipping his skin. He kicked and pushed himself across the floor until his back propped up against something hard. 
Something metallic. He sat there, cowering, hands over his face, with knees drawn, waiting for whatever came next. Nothing happened. Water trickled, drained, and settled, while the howl petered to a prickling whisper. Michael slowed his breathing as he listened, but there was little to hear. He leant against the metal, using his back which only seconds before had been destroyed underneath all the armour that he no longer wore. The suffocating noise of battle and the thick hot smell of jungle. The gunfire and the crushing rocks. Where had it all gone? A chill seeped through his feet and rear, touching the hard floor, especially at his back, pressing against the cold metal. Michael had just enough sense in his numbed body to realise he was naked, although not a hint of dampness clung to him. Where had all the water drowning him disappeared to? Even more bizarrely, where had it come from? Could this be torture? Maybe the rebels had defeated the battalion and captured his wrecked body, waiting before waking him. Some interrogator would be standing over him, directing a cruel smirk at the pitiful sight curled up before his feet, preparing to hit with whatever defrosting complete. A woman's voice. He hadn't been expecting that. Defrosting? Surely that couldn't have meant him, treated like a slab of meat shoved in the freezer to stop it from spoiling. A draught carrying the chirping of a bird brushed against Michael's ears, making his skin shiver and pimple in protest. He hadn't felt a cool breeze like it in weeks. He began to open his eyes, from lines to slits to wedges. Michael flinched as a rock fell near his feet. He took a deep, calming breath and sat forward, squinting at the misshapen rock where a stick protruded from its centre. Rocks tumbling and birds tweeting in an interrogation room? No, there was no torturer, no table, no glaring light bulb, not even a wall. As his eyes adjusted to the blurry grey stone, Michael realised he lay in a cave, light streaming in from its mouth. Too weak to walk, he crawled onto his front, dragging himself across the ground and ignoring the small scraping rocks against his torso. His hand scrabbled against the surprisingly flat floor and he used his fingertips to gain leverage as he dragged. Stones jabbed at his exposed sides and Michael swore as he squirmed and yanked across the floor like a one-legged spider. The edge of the cave suddenly dipped away, allowing him to grip the ledge and pull. He finally collapsed, panting at the edge. He turned to face his reward. Grey skies, grey seas, grey giants, all layered against one another in a bleary, looming blob. Michael closed his eyes, shook his head, and let his breathing catch up. Knew it was important not to get panicky. The images would make sense, eventually. He wasn't going to let a set of blurry eyes get the better of him. He looked again, and this time the shapes took form. The skies were blanketed in thick drab cloud, blocking the sun's vain attempts to break through. The shifting sea that stretched below was moving, not from a current, but by wisps of mist and fog. And the giants were no more than great boulders, jutting from the ocean of fog, some half collapsed and leaning against each other for support. An urge rose to run from the alien world. But Michael refused to let it grow. This didn't make sense, and he'd promised himself to never panic until grasping the full picture. Still, it was hard not to be overwhelmed. Where were his allies? How did he end up here, completely alone? Even some enemies would have been a comforting sight. He began to look back from where he'd came, away from the craziness swirling outside. Saw the rock that had fallen from above. Only now did his eyes see it for what it really was. A chunk of concrete with a sheared-off piece of rebar protruding from its middle. He craned his neck and saw the ceiling above, half crumbling, half missing. Not a cavernous roof of rock, but a broken floor of plaster and linoleum. Now he was truly baffled. Michael's eyes finally focused. Outside of a room's shell lay not an ethereal forest of enormous rock stacks, but the destroyed ruins of a city. A vast one of vacant skyscrapers towering far above, 
and their not-so-lucky brethren dashed across the streets below. He gripped the edge of the floor and glanced over the side. Directly below Michael lay the contents of the next room, but when he dared look out further, he was greeted by the far drop. He looked across the street and saw his reflection staring back in the windows of an obsidian black tower. He lay in the middle of a gash in the building, where the rooms had been torn open and exposed to the wrecked cityscape. The ruined walls mirrored the dozens of surrounding buildings down and across the street. Each one had been damaged in some way, from gouges ripped through windows and steel alike, to half-collapsed towers struggling to stay upright. The destruction was so fearsome that some buildings were utterly demolished, leaving piles of debris in their place. Michael's own room had suffered during the long-dead chaos, a giant rip left in the floor. The once-gleaming monuments of glass and shiny metal were now grey and dilapidated. The only bright things Michael saw were the green vines and trees, lots of them, permeating throughout the destruction. Everywhere he looked, nature took its stranglehold, covering lower parts of the buildings and spreading higher in large green veins on a quest to reach the topmost parts of their new kingdom. A pack of dogs barked from the heart of plant-clad streets below, thick with grass and scattered trees. That worried Michael more than anything else. How long had it taken for all this vegetation to grow? There was no city, at least none he knew of, that had been allowed to fall into such disrepair. How long had he been... What had he been doing? Michael rolled over and looked back at the contents of the room. Facing him were three metal cabinets, tanks, standing guard by the far wall. Only the rightmost one remained intact, a dark grey chrome box that quietly hummed to itself. The tanks were each big enough to fit a man inside. In fact, that was their purpose, for within the left tank sat a dried-up skeleton, glowering at him with empty eye sockets and a hanging jaw. Michael realised he could have easily been in its place, if whatever had opened the other tank finished the job. A bad ending for sure. The middle tank's metal doors, which he'd leaned against moments ago, were wide open. A cool mist wafted, and a white liquid dripped from the bottom of the tank, seeping through cracks in the floor to the room below. Michael must have been submerged in the liquid while he'd been asleep. Had he really been frozen? Michael tried to stand, and ended up on his knees as he crawled over to the right-hand tank that was still closed. The dark metal had a brushed shine, a unique tinge he hadn't seen before. Black cables trailed from the ceiling to the gently humming tank. There had to be a third person frozen inside. Michael stretched out his hand and touched the metal. He yelped and fell back as an alarming sting ran through his palm from the severe, penetrating cold. He held up his hand and saw an ugly red and white mark already beginning to form there. Michael gritted his teeth, furious at his own stupidity, but this was not the time to dwell on it. Most of his palm had been burnt, and he would need to find warm water, quick, to submerge it in. Then he could... Ah! A searing pain shot through his body as he collapsed onto the floor, writhing on the concrete and arcing his back as invisible needles stabbed every inch of him. Michael yelled, swore and kicked wildly into the air, unable to find the source of the torture. The painful sensation ripped through his torso, down his arm and to his right hand, concentrating on the burn. He struggled to hold back the tears, gripping his wrist as tight as possible to try numb the area. Was that steam coming from his palm? He couldn't tell as everything grew dark. The pain vanished as quickly as it had come, and Michael gasped in relief as he returned from the brink of passing out. Through teary eyes, he saw his hand's normal, fleshy colour completely healed. What he was sure from harsh experience would have taken weeks to heal had done so instantly at an excruciating price. Now he was back to square one, lying naked on the ground, gasping for breath. Damn, he said, hitting his freshly healed fist weakly on the floor. It had been a miracle all right, but one that only left him more confused. Michael sighed and lay back, ready to sleep. A horrible thought stopped him. It was almost as if another voice entered his head, a faint, reminding whisper. Where am I? With the question lodged in his mind, he couldn't shake it. Michael lay still on the floor, staring at the cracked ceiling. Stayed like that for a long time, thinking. The Alliance. 
Finn. What could have happened to them? Nothing. Nothing in his memory explained this. Fighting for his life one second, and the next? Teleported? Frozen and reanimated? Nonsense. The words, defrosting complete, they must have come from the freezer. But who put him in there? Why release him now? A cold draught hit Michael, and he shivered, bringing him back from his musings. It was hard for a man to properly reflect without any pants on. The sun was low in the sky, and the temperature worse off for it. His first concern should be survival. Nothing's ever achieved waiting for something to happen. You have to find the solutions yourself. He sat up and looked towards the doorway. A skull stared back at him. A second one, attached to a skeleton, sprawled on the floor, blaster rifle lying centimetres from its bony fingertips. Michael didn't have the strength to be surprised. Of course, there would be other corpses. Ones probably responsible for the destruction everywhere. Cloves hung off the skeleton in several places. Good. Michael would need to cover up against the cold of the night. He stumbled over to the corpse, legs at last strong enough to support him, and examined the cloves. They were rotting, and pieces of fabric fell apart in Michael's hands as he tore the trousers off. No luck there. The only thing somewhat intact was the jacket, protected from the once rotting flesh by the vest underneath that had taken the brunt of the decay. Michael snatched the jacket from the skeleton, scattering bones across the floor. He ripped off the disintegrating collars, and used the sleeves to wrap the jacket around his waist. He supposed he'd cover his most vital area, if nothing else. He glanced at the boots, then his own feet. Could tell just by looking that he was many times bigger in size. There was no use in staying here. Time to move closer to the ground, and begin his hunt for answers. Food! That too. Michael must have been hungry enough that he imagined his stomach faintly talking to him. Wouldn't be the most surprising thing that had happened today. All that was left was the rifle. Rust cascaded from the metal as Michael picked it up. It had the similar, bulky shape of a blaster rifle, but any other details were long past discerning from this piece of crap. He tossed it over the side and listened. It took a long while for the fud to come back. It would take some time getting down. The room's only door was drop-barred on his side, but Michael didn't want to take that for it. Those bars were probably the reason he'd been left alone for so long, and there was still one more occupant in the freezers. He could come back for them later. For now, he'd drop into the room below and find a way down from there. Michael took a step forward and froze as a glint of light caught his eye. It came from the arm of the skeleton that had rolled across the floor. From the bracelet attached to its wrist, Michael rushed to the spot and knelt, cold sweat springing to his head. He liked to think himself a man you couldn't shake easily, but this, this... Slowly, he pried the bracelet from its owner. An emptiness spread through him, but that didn't stop him from feeling the lever in his hand. Stark contrast of black against his palm, the metal band in the middle standing out clearest of all. Michael looked from the bracelet to the corpse, the name Conway burning bright in his eyes. Today was not a good day. Chapter 3 Farewell Party Where do you think you're going, girl? Quidel tightened his grip around Amelia's neck, pushing her further up the crumbling sand wall, lifting her feet off the ground. She struggled to suck in breath as her hearing went fuzzy, hands scrabbling uselessly against Quidel's forearm. He leant forward, spit flying into her face as he spoke. How did you get out of your cage? Amelia was vaguely aware of Quidel's spiky mohawk, shark finning at the bottom of her vision as her eyes rolled upwards, barely felt his hand pinning her arm to the wall. You've certainly grown, haven't you, girl? I told Salt if he couldn't let you get too big. We ought to have clipped your wings before you tried to fly away, like we should the others. I knew this would happen. He never listens to me. No one ever does. Quidel's grip loosened, allowing Amelia to squeeze in precious gulps of air. Able to focus her eyes again, hearing that bit better. 
I should be the one in charge here. You know that. You know that, don't you? Emilia knew Quidel wasn't asking her of a question, ranting to himself as always, but she answered anyway. She was taking a risk, talking without permission, but she had to try. I yes she gasped in between breaths. What? Quidel asked, whipping his narrowed eyes back to hers, loosening his grip further. Did you say yes? Amelia paused, as if to speak, inhaling as much as she could. Well, what did- Amelia kicked upwards. Her right boot slammed into Quidel's crutch, immediately followed by her left. Quidel's eyes widened as he doubled over, Mohawk swishing down with his head, too pain to scream. His muscles clenched, trapping Amelia's dangling legs. They tumbled into a heap on the sandy floor. Amelia pushed away Quidel's arms and lunged for his face, throwing her fists at everything below the man's bright yellow hair. She didn't really know how to hit, but at least her aim was good. She whacked Quidel below the eye, cracked him on the side of the nose, and pummeled his jaw in quick, clumsy succession. Quidel held up his arms, meagerly defending his battered face. His legs loosened enough to let Amelia squirm free. What's going on down there? Amelia jumped to her feet, yanking the knife out of Quidel's belt pouch, and ran down the dark corridor, away from the new voice. She would have liked to see her handiwork on Quidel's face, but that would waste her one opportunity to escape. Her hands began to throb as she ran. She shouldn't have hit him so hard. She saw a bright spot ahead. Even in the middle of the night, the drunken cheers and blaring horns thundered over the trucks as they roared, trying to batter the other to pieces in the arena. Amelia had never seen much of the spectacle, always by his side, too scared to look up and attract attention. Amelia reached the end of the corridor, wrapped her hand on a rusted pipe and pivoted around the corner, launching herself down the hallway and nearly stabbing herself with Cadell's knife in the process. She bounded over the rough mix of sand and metal below her feet, knowing every second counted. The thick metal door at the bottom of the hall blocked her way. Amelia tapped, three fast raps, followed by two slow ones, copying the knock she'd heard so many times before and wincing as her sore hands complained at the slightest abuse. The door opened and a pair of worried eyes and pursed lips peered out. Green. Amelia's chest quivered as she took in a deep breath. Of all the scum in the place, this timid man was one of the few who'd never tried laying a hand on her. She'd promised herself to go free with us no matter what, but why couldn't it have been someone else? You? Why are you- Amelia thrust the knife into Green's neck. The metal lodged firmly in his flesh, and she felt the scrape of bone jolt through the knife. Green fell back, eyes wide, pulling the door open with him. Amelia let the knife go as Green fell and wrapped her hand around the side of the swinging door. The door crunched her bruised hand against the metal frame. She managed to stifle her cry to a small whimper as pain rocketed through her right hand. At least she'd stopped the loud bang the door normally made. Amelia felt something weakly hit her leg. She looked down. Green's hand flailed against her foot, standing on his chest, the other struggling to grip the knife handle protruding from his neck. Amelia stepped back, avoiding the vacant expression beginning to form on Green's face as the life seeped out of him. She had seen enough of that look before. Sorry, she mumbled, hearing the pointlessness of the word as it came out. Amelia gritted her teeth, tears threatening to overwhelm her. She ignored the pain, told herself she did anyway. Knew there'd be plenty of time for that later. Amelia reached down to pull the knife out of Green's neck, found she couldn't. Frowning, and with both hands, she pulled harder. The blood which only seeped out before now began to spill in big black spurts. The serrated edges of Quidel's knife were making the removal an impossible task. Each tug loosed more blood as the blade bored a gaping black and red hole. Amelia was beginning to feel sorry for herself as well as Green, out of breath, bare hands and wrists soaked in warm blood. She gave another tug, and her grip slipped as she fell onto her backside. Blood soaked into her ragged shorts from the puddle of gore. She smacked the floor in frustration and yelped as her sore hand spasmed. Should we shut down the match? A voice asked, floating through a grill built into the armory's wall. Are you joking? When my guy's winning? I'm not letting Quidel's sore nuts spread a panic. She's only a girl for fuck's sake. Amelia's stomach flipped. Sawtooth's voice. 
Those were his glorious words. They must have dragged him from the throne overlooking the arena. She should run to him so he could shield her, keep her safe from... No, she wouldn't be his much longer. The riders were coming, and once here, she'd be taken away from the only good thing in her life. She had to find something else to replace it, had to at least try, especially now that she'd killed for it. Amelia glanced around the room, scanning the racks of blades, guns, and stacks of ammunition before landing on the shelf of pistols. She plucked the double-barreled blaster pistol from its depths. Her pistol. She clutched it to her chest and felt a warm relief spring forth from just holding the companion in her hand. The small handle and two oversized barrels, grooves and notches, wood and metal, fitted more naturally in her hands than anything else in the world. With the pistol back, she was whole again, could fight, even without Sawtooth by her side. Amelia vowed this time that she would never let it go. The same vow she made every time the weapon was in her hands. The armory's open! Amelia spun back to the guns and grabbed the right holster. She buckled it to her shorts and slid the pistol into its familiar home on her hip. She ran to the far door, away from Green's leaking corpse, and carefully closed it behind her. Amelia thought she could make out faint scuffles coming from the armory as she began running. A few moments later, the alarm screamed. She's not in here. Did I fucking stutter? Fine, fine. Just make sure I don't get any further interruptions. Amelia hoped it was only dirt she smelt amongst the rubber as she strained to listen to the conversation. She watched Fuse's men filter out of a garage between the lines of spiked motorbikes, armoured cars and buggies, all branded with Sawtooth's red face symbol. She'd been hiding for nearly half an hour, waiting for the search party's inevitable sweep. Fuse was chatting to Rusk, taking so long Amelia was certain the oceans would reclaim the desert before he was finished. Amelia had spent so long locked away that she was normally good at waiting, but with the exit this close, her patience was quickly running out. Patience. That was a nice word. At least the piercing alarm had finally stopped, giving Amelia's ears some respite. The exits were one of the first places combed free when an alarm sounded, eager men jumping on the chance to find a runaway woman from the cells. Dirt bags, all of them. Apart from Sawtooth, of course. He was better than the scum he led. Fuse, wearing his backpack generator, was a particularly nasty brute whose fascination with the effects of electricity on Amelia's body did not make for pleasant memories. She could only spend a few minutes alone with him before entering her shell. The big man grunted as he shifted his backpack. What are you working on? Fixing this bike first, Rusk replied, without looking up from his work. Then I'm going to start work on that haul truck. Amelia flattened herself as Fuse glanced her way. There was a pause. Large bloody truck. Sort of must have something big in mind. Oh, yes, Rusk replied in his typical monotone voice. There's plans to bring unity to the whole area with that massive peacekeeping vessel. Really? Fuse had never been good with sarcasm. Wasn't good at much, other than electrocuting things. Rusk didn't bother to answer, allowing Fuse to realise his own blunder. Whatever! Fuse snapped. Why are you working here so late? Good point. I love welding in the middle of a scorching day. Really brings out a shine in me. Alright, save the sass for someone who gives a shit. Fuse said as he slung the shock rifle out of his backpack, cord trailing from the butt of the gun to the generator. Keep an eye out for the girl. Make sure you take her alive if she comes through here. Sawtooth was very keen on that. Same to you, Rusk said, deadpan again. Everyone knew Fuse took his targets alive. After all, it was harder to make the dead dance with his electric currents. Fuse grinned as he stalked out of the room, rifle drooping by his side. Rusk slid the round, tinted goggles back over his eyes and leant down to his work back facing Amelia. He resumed the welding, flaring a lightning-bright arc. Amelia let out a long breath she didn't realise she'd been holding. She rose, wincing as her skin plucked free from the ridges of rubber. Her ratty t-shirt provided little protection against the massive grooves of the haul truck's wheel that had wedged themselves into her soft body. 
She slid from the top of the tire, twice the height of a man, and dropped the last meter, landing with a thump onto the oil-stained concrete. She twisted, heart beating. Rusk worked on, one hand holding the car's frame while the other wielded the welding rod. Amelia crept towards him, pulling the double-barreled pistol from her hip. She came up a car length away and took aim, hesitated, then lowered the gun. Rusk had come to Amelia's cell a few times before, breaking one of Sawtooth's laws with scraps of food and kind words. She'd had no choice with Green. Perhaps this time she could save some blood being spilt. Amelia sidled to Rusk, gripping the pistol's barrels, nearly falling backwards as she raised the heavy weapon overhead. Rusk paused his welding and turned. The wooden handle cracked against the side of his head. He grunted as he tumbled, and Amelia clambered over him, kicking off the goggles from Rusk's face, catching his nose in the process. Wait! Rusk grunted, moustache bloody. Amelia brought the handle down, whacking Rusk's forehead against the floor. He went still. She turned the pudgy man onto his side, relieved to see he was still breathing bloody bubbles through his nose. She angled Rusk's body, preventing the trails of blood trickling into his throat. That was about all she had for first aid knowledge. It was the first time she'd saved a life, Amelia reflected as she ran between two workbenches towards the garage exit. Then again, she'd been the reason his life was in danger, so not a great start. A cavernous mouth sat ahead, the exit of Sawtooth's rock, the metal parasite infecting its red dirt host, sat gaping open. Underneath a starlit purple sky, the open expanse of desert beckoned. A strange feeling twitched at Amelia's cheeks. She was smiling. Hey, Rusk, forgot to tell you. The fuck? Fuse had returned. Amelia ran harder, making for the closest vehicle to the exit. A big, clunky car with armor she couldn't quite remember the name of. A Humver? The first line of defense stood ready at the entrance in case of raiders. Not that there were likely to be any. Sawtooth had told Amelia his imperial borders stretched far beyond her wildest imaginations, and that his enemies were terrified of even the mention of his name. The Humver used to belong to some unknown army, a few flecks of blue paint still speckled on the sides where the desert sands hadn't stripped it off. Amelia pulled the driver's door open as quietly as possible. The inside was surprisingly spacious, and she dropped into the driver's seat, scooting low. Fuse unwittingly followed Amelia towards the exit, voice creeping closer as he talked into his smart gauntlet. Rusk was down a bloody. The bitch must have made a run for it through the garage. No need to worry, though. Only desert out there. Gather a few of the lads and we'll start searching with bikes. Amelia held her breath, holding the door ajar. Maybe Fuse would take Rusk to the medical room. Yeah, I'll wait here. When would she stop expecting life to be easy? Amelia sat up, shut and locked the door with a big clunk. She chose the Humber for one simple reason. It always had the key in it. After all, who would dare steal directly from Sawtooth? She hoped the driving part would come naturally to her. She twisted the key. The engine roared to life, its growls echoing off the garage walls. Amelia felt tingles as the mechanical rumble vibrated through her. This was no fantasy, no long-repeated dream to fill the endless nights and terrifying days. She was actually doing it. There she is, Fuse shouted pointlessly. Amelia pushed the pointer stick to the D symbol like she'd seen the men do before, had made sure to memorize it for this very moment. She pushed down the accelerator, her foot barely reaching the pedal, the seat was too far back. She yelped as the car leapt forward and swerved right, slamming into the wall. Her head whipped and banged against the horn, making the Humver honk in protest. Should have worn a seatbelt. Amelia sat up sluggishly, head buzzing, the Humver's interior spinning around her. She fumbled with a sore hand, buckled herself in. A face with a narrow jaw and large brow suddenly appeared at the driver window, a triumphant gleam in its eyes. Amelia jumped back as Fuse smiled at her. Got you now, girl, came the voice, muffled by tempered glass. You have an appointment with Sawtooth for being a cheeky bitch. Don't worry, we have time to play together first. 
just you, me, and some new toys of mine prepared specially for you. He pulled the door handle. It didn't budge. Fuse's face switched from menacing grin to dumbfounded open mouth, slow on the uptake as always. Amelia realised she was being slow too, staring at her would-be tormentor. World slightly more stable now, Amelia tore her eyes from Fuse's and shoved the stick to R. She struck her foot down and the car jolted backwards. Fuse yelped as he did the same, managing to pull away just in time from the spinning wheels and hurtling wing mirrors. Amelia pushed the other pedal and stopped the humver before it slammed into the fuel truck. She rammed the stick back to D and aimed the wheel, the tires crunching beneath. She pressed the accelerator and the humver sprang forward again, out of Fuse's grasp, through the exit and into the sands beyond. Amelia pushed the brake, stopping the car with a sudden skid on the sand. She couldn't just leave. The bikes would catch her on the open plain. She had to delay them. Amelia left the engine rumbling on, unbuckled her seatbelt and clambered to the back seats. Climbed. Fuse's puzzled face gazed from the garage, his hand frozen on a gym buggy's side. His eyes widened as he realised what she was planning. Amelia bared her teeth at him, then, with both hands, gripped the handles and pivoted the Humver's blaster turret towards him. She pulled the trigger and the turret shuddered violently against her bruised hands as it let loose a black, shining blast towards the garage. Fuse dived out of the way as the shot exploded against the buggy, smashing its armoured side and sliding the whole vehicle back a metre. Amelia was thrown by the recoil and her waist whacked against the Humber's roof, ghost of the blaster shot's explosion ringing in her ears. Her hands throbbed from the turret's harsh kickback, but she forced herself to grab the handles again. Ignoring Fuse, she swung the barrel left, aimed at the chain, holding up the men's second line of defence. Quidel once called it a fancy name, something like Portycully. All she needed to know was that it was a big gate. She fired the turret, letting another blast hurtle through the air. The black mass of energy ripped into the roll of chain hanging above the gate. It sheared the metal apart, spewing loose chain links and red rock. A rolling, echoing crash resounded as the gate fell, wedging itself at an angle between the floor and its other straining half. Amelia turned her body ever so slowly, followed by her arms, and then the stubborn, steaming turret that got heavier by the second. As she lined up the second roll of chains with the turret sights, she saw movement. She ducked as something small whipped through her hair. Fuse's remaining shock darts pinged off the Humber's armour, crackling in anger at having missed their target. Amelia, still crouched, pulled the trigger. The weapon slammed into her shoulder and flung her back into the Humber's depths. The crash of the rest of the gate collapsing into place drubbed at her ears, then fell silent, replaced by a high-pitched whining. For the second time that night, the world spun. Amelia pushed herself up, collapsed, as her left arm stayed still, the shoulder unresponsive. She hit the floor, whacking her eye against the metal. Amelia screamed, half in pain, half in anger at the constant abuse her body was receiving tonight. She was used to being beaten by others, not by her own mistakes. Using only her right arm, Amelia clambered through to the driver's seat and fell into it. She glanced at her limp left arm. The shoulder had popped out of its socket. Three of Fuse's backup arrived in the rear-view mirror, all trapped behind the gate's thick bars. She saw Fuse's face go red as he screamed abuse at the men. That sight alone brought back a triumphant surge within Amelia, a new rumble of life. The humver stick was still in D, its engine humming away. Amelia made sure to buckle herself in and pushed the accelerator with her shoe's tip, urging the car forward, steering with her one good arm. She drove, slowly at first, then faster and faster as the rock shrunk and the desert grew. Her left eye began to close as it swelled, her arm hung uselessly. Both hands throbbed, their bruised colour hidden beneath layers of dried blood. Amelia ignored it all and drove on into the dark night, the humver's beams cutting a path over the sand. She had never felt happier. Chapter 4
downpour. Cold. So very cold. The streams continued to spread. They seeped amidst rocks and roots, between crumbling concrete and twisted tree trunks, and from smashed skyscrapers to ruined roadways. The deluge continued unabated, pattering against mangled street signs, burbling in growing puddles and dripping through tree leaves only to repeat the process amongst the sheltering shrubbery. It began last night. First crept a light mist into the city, hanging between the balance of fog and low cloud. After the reconnaissance, a spearhead of drizzle swept the area, coating any surface still clinging on to the hope of staying dry. Then the real assault began, a heavenly torrent that didn't allow a moment's rest for the earthly ruins below. The battle, now firmly in sodden hands, turned to a civil war, raging between monsoon curtains of heavy droplets and sprays of confused rainwater cast about by stray gusts. Michael watched the thriving street jungle's thick leaves and tall grass blades sway with the rain, happy to oblige in the jig of nature. Michael was not as happy, surrendering the struggle to stay dry hours ago. He walked, bare-chested, down the middle of yet another dilapidated road. The many street blocks might have looked different from one another on a sunny, restful day. The way the once trendy glass skyscrapers have been smashed into one another, intertwining with their neighbours to create a new kind of absurd art form, intrigued Michael from his perch high amongst the buildings yesterday. Now all the structures seemed the same, lurking behind shifting sheets of icy water, adorned with cloudy grey hats. He couldn't tell if this was the fifth block he walked down, or the tenth. One thing was certain. He was lost, within a giant city of dull, straight crosses. At least the flat streets were easy routes for Michael to navigate. Shame he didn't know where he was meant to be navigating to. The next wave of rain droplets rushed towards him from further down the street, the drumming water trampling over the lighter deluge in its way. Michael held an arm over his eyes as the onslaught engulfed him. Each new raindrop trickling off him took a little of his willpower with it. His hands were prune-like, soaked through and chilled to the bone, every saturated fold of skin complaining whenever it moved, which was a lot. The rest of his body fared little better, much of it numbed completely, cold and clammy. Water dripped from the hair plastered to his forehead, having grown noticeably longer while he slept. The lashing waterlogged the jacket wrapped around his waist weighing him down like a training belt. He barely saw ahead when he felt brave enough to look up, always casting his battered eyes from the stinging drizzle. No one could enjoy such a miserable barrage. Michael's foot stung as he crunched on a twig of brambles. He swore and tensed, waiting for the rush of pain to ripple through his body and press on his soul. He waited. Water dripped off his nose, feeding the valley of rivers flowing over his pecs as he stared at the splattering puddles at his feet. Nothing. He plucked the thorn from his wrinkled foot, a step closer to learning how much damage his body took before the mending process began. It had happened this morning when walking through the skyscrapers to avoid the rain, the ground floors carpeted with glittering shards of glass. Twice Michael accidentally stepped on a piece and twice he doubled over in pain as all his energy concentrated on the single point in his foot. Every time he drew blood, the strange force would come with it, and the last time he'd confirmed it. He did emit some kind of hot vapour with the healing, steam spewing out of the open gash and surrounding pores. He didn't know why, and with no control over the power, he'd opted to walk directly down the street where there was less debris, sacrificing all elements of stealth. It didn't seem to matter in this place. Michael clambered over a felled lamppost and landed in a mud-filled hole, blown into the road. Once again, he cursed his lack of shoes, pulled out his feet one at a time in a great squelch. The rain drowned all of resigned, washing Michael in a drape of sonorous pitter-pattering. Nothing had happened in the last few hours of wandering along the valley of abandoned monoliths, giving plenty of time to ponder this ghost of a world. Somehow, there was too little and too much to think about. He focused first on survival. He might be barely clothed, but Michael doubted he would catch any illness because of the cold. If his body could heal any injury in an instant, 
then surely sickness would pose no threat. Hopefully. He was more concerned about the lack of food. He felt weaker each time the healing surges rippled through his body, and his stomach started to clench and rumble, its growl drowned out by the rain. Last evening, after waking from the tank, Michael spent nearly an hour chasing dinner through the building's basement car park like a madman. At first he was patient, listening for the telltale squeaking and scrabbling amongst the crippled pillars and rusted car husks. He had leapt at the rats when in sight, but they slipped away every time, scurrying with tiny claws in a speed he couldn't match. Eventually, Michael lost his temper and started flinging loose pieces of rubble at the little shits. They were small, fast, and he had left humiliated. Rats were another item on his growing list of dislikes with this city. Rats weren't the only animal around. Barks and howls ran amok in the distance. Dogs. He was less scared about being attacked by feral mongrels, and more fearful of his own reaction if he did see some. Detestable to think. He might have to kill and eat a dog. They were strays left behind after the chaos. Or, if they had owners, they'd yet to introduce themselves. Michael was certain he'd find someone eventually. All the buildings and cars he'd come across had been pilfered, including one market shop devoid of everything except a set of plastic-sealed birthday cards. Someone must have survived the devastation to root around for supplies, but where were they? And more importantly, were they friendly? Perhaps the main perpetrators had long left the city after their attack, leaving behind the survivors to gather the pieces. Or maybe they were still here. He didn't fancy fighting a group capable of wiping out an entire city's population. But, if extermination was what they were after, why not use weapons of mass destruction? These gashed buildings and broken streets had been hit hard, but not obliterated, not nuked. Weapons as large as cruisers had been involved, but why in the city and not above it? And if he was thinking along the line of cruiser battles, then the Alliance had probably been on one side. Who had faced them? The rebels were nowhere close to building something as complex as a cruiser. So who'd attacked this city? Who killed Finn? Michael had found something on his brother's body that confirmed it was murder. He started walking faster as he fought back to it. When he found who was responsible, he'd hunt them down and rip them apart. No weapons, no tricks. He'd use his bare hands to strangle the very... Michael knocked his shin against a bollard and stopped letting the pain in his leg throb alongside his angry thoughts. He couldn't think about Finn. Not now. It was too distracting, and speculating wouldn't help. More possibilities, and less answers. Although, what was he distracting himself from? On missions, saddled with responsibilities, he had a clear goal to focus on. Now, somehow, there was too little and too much to think about. A chasm pulled Michael from his musings. It ran the length of the street, blocking his way, and contained an uninviting pool of re sludge, flanked at either side by a large sewer pipe rent in two. He looked for another route. A dark red shape to the right of the road caught Michael's eye, glinting from under a mass of vines. He struggled through the long, whistling grass, expecting another car to be hidden underneath. There's something ominous about one abandoned car in a street, with dented doors and smashed windows, but it's all relative. A whole city of them was overkill. It would probably contain nothing useful, a few more unclothed corpses to grimace at, but no harm in trying. He gripped a dribbling vine and ripped it away, tearing off a clump of its soggy brethren with it. He dropped the vines, took a step back and fell into a patch of grass. He shrank away from the glaring eye. Fenn loved the rain. It reminded him of home, of the valley he grew up in, filled with its fair share of wet seasons and jungle. Not too different from the street they walk down now. Take away the skyscrapers, tarmac, wrecked buses, dilapidated signs, wonky lampposts, eroded statues, constant grey skies, dreary atmosphere, and a few of the rotting bodies? and it would be just like home. Fenn slung his oversized hood further over himself, water dripping from the tip onto the blaster rifle hanging by the chafing strap on his neck. 
He wrestled with the soggy coat sleeves eclipsing his hands and swung the rifle onto his back, trying to redistribute the weight from his straining shoulder. Lugging around this hulk of metal wasn't a great love of his. Or roadblocks. They'd left the car four streets back when the amount of crap clogging the road became too great. Oi, Fen, quit trailing back there. You're making me bloody nervous. Coffee. The thin man with dark skin peered out from under his own hood, veil of rain cascading up the front. Fen hadn't talked with the man outside of late, drunken nights at the tavern. Usually, Fen only did patrols with other members of his clan, like everyone else. It had been that way for years, but this was an exceptional case. A special mission, Head Chief Arminius, insisted be a joint clan effort. Now Coffee, representing the Steelbreaker clan, trudged ahead, making sure to stay at the front of the pack. The man sure was acting suspicious, with those shifting eyes, although he could be a good laugh, provided you got him drunk enough in the tavern. Fenn certainly wished he was there now, sat by one of the fires, feet warm and dry, larger crisp and cold. Unfortunately, they weren't in the tavern, and drinking was not allowed on patrol. Not since that idiot from Fenn's own clan, blind drunk, and with only a blaster rifle and shit aim to hand, had shot at an unknown gunship five days ago. Now that man and his entire party were dead, and the drones hadn't even got a good picture of the culprits. Bloody technology, Fenn thought. You can always count on it to fail at just the right moment. Ever since, the tipsy buzz of walking through the abandoned city had been stolen away replaced with nothing to block the harsh reality of the depressing, rain-swept landscape. A few hours spent venturing into this shell of a city, completely sober, felt like a long time indeed. A steelbreaker nervous, Fenn teased, lusting for a little conversation to distract from the drudgery. I thought you guys feared no being without armour. He was mocking the steelbreaker motto, which people took about as seriously as all the other clans. The Hollow Cloaks had started spouting some nonsense strapline about being there but not seen, and so, not to be outdone, every other freelancer clan clambered onto the idea. Oh no, I fear people who know how to fight, like any sensible man, Coffee said, his voice carrying a sly smile with it. So, no worries where you're concerned. Nice one. Fenn replied, but Coffee had begun walking away, unable to hear him over the pounding rain. He cupped his hands and strode after him. Are all hollow cloaks so quick-witted on patrol? An essential fighting quality and shit! Fenn shouted as he caught his foot on a mischievous root. He tripped and slid on the wet tarmac, arms scraping, rifle clanging, face landing in a perfectly placed pothole of mud. So much for not embarrassing myself in front of the other clans. He grumbled and picked himself up to the sound of coffee chuckling. Even the man's laughter was strange, all bellow and echo, like the laugh of a child enjoying genuine amusement instead of an adult's mocking scorn. Are all the best groovers so nimble on their feet? Fenn grinned, gloop sliding from the ends of his moustache and pointed goatee. One of the best groovers, he shouted back. Are you joking? If I was one of the best... I'd be in my cosy warm office right now, as far away from the action as possible. That's enough, both of you. Gods, here comes Killjoy. Bram. The tall, horse-faced man was so dull you couldn't cut butter with him. Fen would be better looking to the corpses littered around his feet for a lively comment. If you pair keep, we'll get in no time. Bram was apparently talking, his voice whipped away by the windy downpour. Fenn raised a hand to his ear. What? Bram shook his head and gestured for the pair to join him. Fenn frowned. Bram seemed to be under the illusion he was in charge here, just because he was part of the Hollow Cloaks. They thought they were the top dogs, ever since becoming the biggest freelancer clan last year. Far too cocky an outlook, considering the combined might of the other clans. Fenn joined Coffee and Bram under the flimsy bus stand, its thin strip of plastic canopy a meagre shelter. Stop shouting, both of you, Bram said, sour little pout on his lips. What if we get spotted? Spotted? Coffee raised his arms to either side. Who by? 
There's just as many people wandering around here as usual. None whatsoever. Let's take a rest and cook some lunch, Fenn said, nodding to Bram's backpack strapped underneath his raincoat to give him a hunchback look. Put the barbecue to good use. Grill some tasty meat. Eh? Eh? No, Bram said, curt as a dam. We have reports of that gunship being spotted twice in the last few days. Reports from overexcited youngsters with no evidence. We carry on until I say so. Now hold on a moment, Bram, Fenn said, crossing his arms and leaning back against the plastic bus stand. We agreed to a joint expedition between the clans. No one assigned you as leader. Coffee nodded. Bram stared at Fenn, too close to give her eyes narrowed. Besides, Fenn said, breaking out a smile despite the dank tension and weather to match. We're dealing with a gunship here. What a suicidal maniac would fly in this weather? A committed one. Oh, that was quick. Had he been saving that line? Perhaps. But risk a gunship today when tomorrow's weather awaits with clear skies? Fenn shook his head. Trust me, they'll wait. Bram glanced at the grey roof of clouds. He pulled out an antique brass tube from his pocket and extended it, pressing it to his eye. The ludicrous telescope was barely longer than two lengths of Bram's hand and completely useless in this weather. Anyone could see the storm wasn't stopping for hours. Come on, Bram, Fenn said, interrupting the fruitless sightseeing session. Let's stop for lunch, at least until it dries a little. There's a spot over there. Fenn pointed to a reception lobby, sliding doors bashed open. Left of a chasm running the width of a street that contained an unappealing pool of rain-spattered muck and a wrecked sewer pipe. Chapter 5 First Impressions The wet grass swung with the rain, tickling Michael where he sat, panting with his hands splayed behind him. The eye continued staring at him. It had an angry appearance due to its straight-edged, four-sided shape, but apart from that, it stayed motionless, unblinking, dead. Michael shook his head and cursed, annoyed at getting panicky over a fake gaze. He wrestled himself out of the grass, scratching at his bare legs, and bent close to examine the object. The diamond-shaped eye was made from a panel of thick red glass, rainy tears sliding off the surface. A small light bulb, maybe more, was underneath the panel. The eye sat on its side, with its back slightly raised, at an angle that gave the impression of a frown, with neither eyebrow nor mouth needed. It was surrounded by thick black metal, raindrops pinging off the newly revealed rivets of welds. Armour. A black armoured object with an intimidating eye to match. Michael looked over the length of vines covering the eye's owner. Its body was about the length of two cars, but strangely enough, just the height of one. Almost shaped like a limo, except bulkier, and capable of taking a much bigger battering. Michael's eyes travelled to a thick, stocky tree branch protruding sideways from the top, strangled by a strand of vines. The black tree branch gulped water down its hollow inside. No. Trickling into the barrel of its cannon. A tank. This definitely wasn't Alliance technology, and unlikely a rebel weapon. The design was too unconventional. Possibly Balfarian tech? No one knew the full extent of weapons hidden away in their arsenal. Over here! Michael spun into a crouch, eyes searching through the rainfall for the voice's owner. Not there, you! Any gust could blow it out! He strained to catch the scraps of chatter over the pounding shower. It's out of the rain, isn't it? What more do you want? What I want is... Food that's not blown onto the ground. You see how much shit is on the floor? Quit your bickering and light the damn thing. We shouldn't waste more time than we have to. Male voices, coming from a half-crumbled skyscraper on the other side of the chasm. A light sparked behind a set of smashed-in sliding doors, accompanied by a brief flicker of shadows. They were sheltering inside the ground floor. The voices settled down. Too quiet to hear. Michael stooped and began stalking through the rain, exposed back bent, calves aching from the awkward movement. These were the first people he had encountered in an otherwise abandoned city. 
Only an idiot would not take the utmost caution in approaching them. Still, he felt himself becoming excited at the prospect of finally meeting someone. Hopefully, they could provide him with supplies, shelter, and answers. Maybe they knew more about the tank. Most importantly, he would ask about the Alliance and see if they were close by. If there was anyone who could help him find his brother's killer, it was them. He reached for Chasm and paused. No way of getting around it without a serious detour, and he wanted to reach the men as quickly as possible. Michael half lowered himself, half slid down the muddy bank, loose gravel nipping at his ankles. He moved too quickly and slipped on a slick patch of clay halfway, tumbled into the brown water in what must have sounded like a mighty splash. He resurfaced his head with a gasp, lungs straining to heaping gulps of air. Freezing. Good thing the puddle wasn't too deep. Underwater, his first involuntary gasp could have been lethal. Rain thundered as it burst on the pool's surface around his head. No movement came from the other side of the chasm. His crash had gone unnoticed. At least the raucous downpour had done him one favour today. He began to rise, body shaking, too numb to feel anything other than cold. Michael hoped the open sewer pipe on either side of him was thoroughly disused, as he pulled out of the sludge, sucking at his legs, one hand digging into the wet dirt after the other. He dragged himself out of the pit and clambered onto the other side, relieved to be on solid tarmac again. Mud was trapped under his fingernails, dripping from his skin, sticking firm to his legs and the ruined jacket around his waist. He used a dirty forearm to wipe away a thick layer of muck from his face, stinging his eyes. He must have looked a real state right then. Good thing there were no ladies in the area. Just him, a foul mood, and a set of gruff voices for company. Half crouching, half crawling, Michael struggled onwards, his empty stomach protesting at all the work he was putting it through. He reached the side of the sliding doors and crouched at their edge, thinking. A direct approach without a reconnaissance was a sure way to get himself in trouble. He started moving along the side of the building, looking for a side entrance into the men's nest. A thin trickle of smoke rose from the meagre pile of whitening charcoal, curling through the black, grime-crusted rack. Fenn eyed the tinfoil base, certain the flimsy material would give way at any minute. The three men had formed a tight circle within the breezy reception lobby, shielding the smouldering heap from occasional rainy gusts. Fenn scooched closer, hoping to warm his hands above the grill, but found scarcely enough heat left over for the six pale sausages, which were taking their sweet time to brown. His hands remained stubbornly cold and soggy, along with the rest of him. Rainwater continued to drip in sonorous taps onto his makeshift seat of overturned desk drawer. His two large khaki-coloured jackets lay draped over a dead stump of potted plant in the corner, having done little in terms of keeping him dry. At least he could stretch his back a bit, relieved from the weight of his weapon. A fallen wooden banner near the entrance to the room read, Valentine and Crockwell, advertising some lawyer service that used to inhabit the place. Not much use for legalities in this city nowadays. Besides, Fenn couldn't remember one positive thing lawyers had done for him, other than provide an easy profession to rant about. Their free blaster rifles were leaning against the sign, barrels up, water dribbling from the rounded top guards. They were all the same model, the BR-16, famously the world's most reliable blaster rifle. And amongst the cheapest too, which was why so many freelancers used one. Fenn wasn't very informed about guns, but even he knew how the BR-16 was named for the year it was first built. He'd always liked that. It showed the simplest of rifles were best suited to the simplest of names. Fenn glanced up, caught Coffee's eye from across the fire, who quickly looked away to scrutinise the sausages. With his hood off, Coffee revealed his afro-textured hairstyle, or simply short afro in Fenn's opinion. Coffee had leapt to his feet a couple minutes ago, when startled by the sound of debris falling into a puddle outside. He sat down again, grumbling, when he saw Fenn's amused expression. Fair enough that he and Bram were suspect, but being paranoid of someone lurking in this drenched city was sheer folly. All the city's survivors had either joined the freelancers in the fort or fled long ago. Arminius favoured complete control over cohabitation with anyone else. A winning strategy until recently. 
Bram hadn't moved in the last few minutes, long face illuminated by the pale ghostly light shining from his forearm, where his smart gauntlet was wrapped from elbow to wrist. He'd prized open the display screen on the outer body of the gauntlet, along its hinged line of tiny interlinking segments, pushing the screen back from the curve of his arm to an upright position. The display was a touchscreen, and a light-up keyboard could also be summoned at the base of the newly exposed area of the gauntlet, like when the keys revealed themselves on a freshly opened laptop. What is Bram doing on his gauntlet? Fenn couldn't tell as he faced the back of the opaque screen. Was he informing the fort of their progress, or plotting with his hollow cloak buddies? Maybe he was updating his social media account on whatever platform was popular nowadays. Fenn wouldn't know. He smiled at the thought of Bram uploading some ludicrous-looking selfies in the rain, coffee glaring behind him. Fenn glanced at his own forearm, where his black-faced watch with the broken minute hand ticked away, devoid of any gauntlet. The less contact options, the better. It was tiring enough keeping track of his own problems without tallying other people's. He slipped his hand into his pocket and pulled out the only device that should be kept close at hand. He began to unscrew the cap. Fen! Bram glared at him, gauntlet illuminating the deeply etched frown under his blonde hair. You know what Arminius said. Oh, my bad. Fen paused, then continued to unscrew the hip flask. Coffee chuckled, a twinkle in his eye. Fen, stop that right now. Bram kept his voice deadly low, like a scolding mother. If you return to the fort pissed, it'll be on all our heads. Pissed? Fen asked, in feigned shock. What makes you think I'm drinking alcohol? The devil's drink. This is simply a refreshing flask of water. You don't expect me to drink that rainwater, do you? Who knows what's coming out of those filthy clouds? He took a long drink from the flask, the sweet flavours and harsh burn duetting a gentle melody in his fruit. You wouldn't stop a man from replenishing himself, would you? Fen asked jollily, ignoring Bram's bared teeth as the scent of whiskey wafted from the flask. Or from refreshing his friends? He held out the flask. No, Coffey replied with a sour look. He suddenly let loose a smile, a wink, and a flourish as he whipped out his own hip flask. How could I take water from you when I brought my own to share? Their laughter slapped around the dank lobby. Who knew a steelbreaker had some fire in him? Fen joked as Coffey took a long swig from his own flask. Fen took another drink and, with eyes alone, grinned at Bran over the top of his flask. Fen stayed late most nights in the tavern and he'd noticed those who held a weakness for the place. Bran was not there all the time, but often enough to fall into the vice quelling category. Fen took yet another drink. Twelve ounce hip flasks took a while to empty. You drink fast, Coffee commented. Tolerance is a bitch, trust me. I won't be getting drunk. Fen stopped himself and glanced at Bram. I mean, I won't be getting more hydrated than you. Hydrated? Oh, oh yeah. Coffee chuckled with a wide smile. We'll have to see about that. My water's 45%. That didn't even make sense. Fen gave an obligatory smile. At least Coffee was loosening up. Crap jokes were more tolerable than none. Bram cleared his throat. Perhaps, I, I mean, I forgot to bring my own water. Now I think about it. Fenn smiled, glancing at Bram's half-empty bottle on the floor. That was quicker than he expected, and he got to see Bram acting flustered for once. An unexpected reward. Michael sucked through clenched teeth, not daring to make a sound as Pian clawed the tear in his foot, steam gently hissing. He felt loose skin pull and close over the open wound where the glass had sliced him. The healing process was becoming less unbearable to suffer through, although he was still left weaker after each iteration. He resumed his slow walk, limbs weighing more with every step. The seemingly empty corridor proved quite the obstacle course. Sharp shafts of wood and jabbing stones lurking amongst the collapsed plaster coating the floor. Michael held up the latest culprit from its hiding place amongst a dust pile. The smooth shard of bloody glass reflected his darkened face. A mirror piece. A sharp peal of laughter bounded down the corridor. Michael quickly knelt. The group of men, he heard no womanly voices, 
was becoming louder, more excitable. They each had different accents, but Michael was relieved to hear scraps of his own language coming towards him from all the men. That meant the universal translator implanted within his ears still worked. UTs survived most temperatures and depths of water, although he'd had a nagging worry that being frozen in the tank had broken it. How long could a UT survive like that? Not too long, surely. Michael looked back to the mirror shard, wiped the blood and dust from its reflective surface. Too dark to see anything in here, the reception lobby down the corridor would be brightened by whatever murky daylight the storm failed to halt. He needed to get a read on how trustworthy these men were before he approached them. Then again, Michael was not sure a stranger would count him as trustworthy, stalking through the dark corridor, leaving a lopsided set of blood-stained, muddy footprints in his wake. Fenn sucked through clenched teeth, keeping his annoyance in check as Bram took another drink. I remember offering Bram a sip, not half a flask. Ahem. <clears throat> Fenn coughed, holding out his hand. Bram glanced over mid-swig, tilted the flask further back. Bram! Fenn barked. He stopped himself from swearing at the thief. A drink too much amongst friends was one thing. There was no excuse when it came to potential adversaries. Bram lowered the flask and handed it back, avoiding eye contact. That's right, Bram. Ignore the man you're trying to take advantage of. Fenn took a swig and mellowed out again. There was still plenty left for himself. Coffee can have more if he wants, but sod, Bram. You get what you give, and so far, Bram had provided no drink, and even less whimsy. Are the sausages ready yet? Coffee asked, interrupting Fenn's irksome thoughts. Bloody hope so, Fenn replied. I could eat a horse. Uh, probably some horse in here. Coffee poked the tongs at the closest sausage, where a sliver of browned meat burst from the skin. I reckon I can see a hoof. You'd be lucky with horse. Bram suddenly said in an ominous voice. At this stage, I reckon we've got some human meat in there. Nice bit of thigh would taste better than the normal shit. So what's that meant to be? Fenn used a stick to give his own poke at a hardened slaver of gristle. Someone's wishbone? Wait, do humans have wishbones? Hmm, I wonder, Coffee mused, dramatically stroking his chin. If you cooked someone fat enough, would you get a layer of crackling? Like with pork? Fenn shuddered. He had smelt burning human before, and it wasn't too different from the sausages sizzling in front of him now. What was that? Fenn sluggishly turned his head towards the corridor behind Bram, trying to spot whatever had briefly shone from within its depths. I'm not that drunk, am I? Someone fat enough, eh? Only one way to find out, Bram said, looking over to Fenn with a smile. What are you getting at? Fenn asked, ignoring the corridor and placing a hand over his beer-swollen belly. This isn't fat, it's loose muscle. Ha! And I'm the fucking elected general while we're at it. Hmm, you can have elected general, and I'll take the grand leader position. Hey, where does that leave me? Coffee asked. Oh, you're still the same, Coffee. Bram leaned forward, smiling. Only this time, we'll pretend you can shoot at a cruiser from two meters away and actually hit the fucking thing. I reckon that would be the biggest lie of them all. Fenn laughed, and Bram beamed at the positive reception. I enjoyed talking about the sausages more, Coffee sulked, taking another swig from his hip flask. Oh, I bet you did, Fenn said, winking. Coffee snorted mid-swig, vodka dribbling down his chin. Not like that! Do you think Baby Snatcher made one of those for us? Bram asked, lifting a dripping sausage from the grill and turning it over. Now it was Fenn's turn to snort up his drink. He'd forgotten who first started spreading that ridiculous nickname, but every time he thought of a waistcoat-clad man and his overly large briefcase, he couldn't help but laugh. That creepy bastard. I hope not. I'm surprised to hear one of his own clan using that name. Bram shrugged with a sly smile. Only outside the fort. Funny name for a weird man, although be careful. If he hears you calling him that, you'll be dead before you could finish your piss. Speaking of... Bram began to stand. His legs slightly buckled before he straightened himself, seemingly not caring if the others noticed. 
Fenn watched Bram stumble off towards the darkened corridor, aware he probably wasn't much more sober. Perhaps the man wasn't as bad as he'd first thought. Damn it. Fenn had forgotten how fickle he could be. He had to be careful. In this world, dishing out too much friendliness could prove lethal. Michael couldn't believe it. He shrank back into the shadows, taking the sliver of mirror he'd been holding around the corner with him. There were three of them, sitting next to the entrance. One dark-skinned man with an afro-textured hairstyle, an older man with a weird-fashioned white beard, and a third whose back faced him. Michael thought he'd been spotted at one point by the bearded man, but he'd been distracted. Distracted by the closest man's vile plan. These three men were cannibals? Clearly, this city was desolate, but were things really that bad? They even threatened to cook the old one, devouring the fat from his flesh. Like crackling. Was it a joke? What monster would joke about something like that? Michael placed a hand on the wall to steady himself as his stomach spun. His thoughts raced as the closest man stumbled towards his hiding spot. The men didn't look malnourished, eating enough to stay at a comfortable size. The bearded man was even flabby in the stomach area. Eating flesh to survive was one thing, but these three ate more than needed. Another staggered step. The tall man entered the corridor, groping his hand along the wall to regain his footing. Ah, fuck! The man lurched and grabbed a protruding edge of plaster to save his fall. Someone ought to... to clean this place up! Ha! Michael held his breath, a few paces away, crouching utterly still in the darkness. He needed to make up his mind. Should he reveal himself and trust his life to these villains? These bandits, whose guns were sitting ready in the next room? The men who walked through an abandoned city, armed and saturated with booze, preparing to eat humans. They'd also referred to a comrade who, from the sounds of it, stole innocent babies. Michael made a decision. These bandits were evil. Simple as that. And it had fallen upon him to purge that evil. He knew what was right, and his conscience wouldn't let him turn from the task. Michael took out the object next to the bracelet from his jacket pocket. The knife. The same he'd found on his brother's corpse. It was a hunting knife. A capitalised letter I intersected by a small circle engraved into the wooden handle. Its blade disturbed Michael the most. The rust told him it hadn't been properly cleaned. Not since stabbing someone and left bloody ever since. Lying under its victim's corpse. Who was to say one of these bandits hadn't been the wielder? An unzipping sound emanated from the darkness. Had he been spotted? Michael tensed, mid-crouch, and strained his eyes on the shadowed man blocking his way. The smell of sausages, human or not, tickled at his nose. Eat! Fucking hell! Did the man in front of him say that? He'd heard two completely different voices. A gushing sound. The man started releasing himself. He was pissing, and Michael swore as the stream hit his mud-splattered chest. What the fuck? He leapt forward. I think we're ready, Fem. Right you are. Hand me the buns. Buns? Buns, baps, bread, whatever it was you brought. A crashing sound came from the corridor. Stop falling over, you drunk idiot! Fen shouted. He turned back to coffee. You were meant to bring the sausage buns. I thought you were. Me? I brought the ammo. Me too, Coffee said, gesturing to their pile of bags, tucked into the driest corner of the room. No, I was meant to bring the ammo, and you were supposed to... Oh, gods. So not only did we both have to carry... I said shut up, Bram! Bram? The noise had multiplied into a series of thuds, each louder than the last. It sounded like Bram was repeatedly throwing himself against the wall. Was he trying to break it down? Or... Are you trying some weird sexual shit in there? Fenn shouted. Coffee gave a one-syllable chuckle. It was weak. Nervous. 
The banging stopped, but soft noises continued from the darkness, almost inaudible over the thunderstorm outside. Was that a snarl? Coffee looked to the shadowy corridor, then back to Fen, eyes widening. Are you okay in there? Bram was likely to do many things, but succumbing to a thrashing fit in the corridor was not amongst them. Something wasn't right. He ought to run in, go to Bram's aid straight away, but some deep-ingrained instinct of Fen's was whispering. Don't go into that corridor. Coffee, grab the rifles. Coffee stood up, nodding his head vigorously. He didn't move from the spot. Coffee! Oh, me? I thought you were getting them. Now, you pissed fool! Coffee stumbled in a drunken arc to the entrance, arms spread wide like some absurd land bird. He bundled two of the large BR-16 rifles in his arms, metal clanging, plastic clacking. The noise coming from the corridor was getting quieter now. Fenn didn't think that was a good thing. He felt the panic start to grip. God, when was the last time I panicked? This kind of thing didn't happen. Not anymore. Not here. Fenn stood, swore as he swayed under the unexpected boozy wave. Coffee finally came back with the rifles, and Fenn grabbed the nearest one. Pulled. It didn't budge. What the fuck? His eyes strained to see in the dim light. Coffee struggled with his own rifle from the other side. It's the straps! They've wrapped around each other! Shit! Fenn hissed, fumbling fingers tugging at the shoulder straps. They stubbornly refused to come free from the jostling barrels, not helped by Coffee's yanking on the other side. Stop pulling and let me! A thump interrupted Fenn. They both turned as a head flung itself into the light of the lobby, smacking the floor, its body concealed within the dark corridor. The head began to rise, revealing bloodshot eyes and purplish skin. A trickle of blood ran under the chin, seeping from the protruding knife handle. From Bram's neck. Bram looked up at Fenn, eyes distant, mouth hung. Fenn stayed glued to the spot, transfixed, as a thick, muddy arm came slivering out of the darkness and wrapped itself around Bram's neck. With a jerk, the head yanked back into the corridor. Coffee squealed. Fenn tugged his rifle towards him, swinging the other rifle and Coffee around with it until both their guns pointed down the corridor. Slap. Fenn slapped again, and on the third attempt, he found the button above the rifle's trigger. The torch attachment, jutting from the bottom of the rifle, flickered to life. Fenn gawked. Coffee squealed again. Bram's head had turned into a red hanging blotch, obscured by dirty dangling hair. His sagging body continued to spasm as muscle grips contracted in a way that reminded Fenn of a fish stranded on land, right after it had the life crushed out of it with a rock. A huge figure filled the corridor behind Bram, flickering in and out of the torchlight as it lumbered towards Fenn and Coffee. It held Bram's body by the neck. A makeshift shield coming towards them, doused in the stench of sewage and blood. Not only was the monster behind completely naked, but also covered in layers of dirt and grime. Fenn angled the torch, his eyes struggling to comprehend. The image appeared, vanished, reappeared again as Fenn's shaking hands struggled to keep the torch steady. Bram had already been a tall man, whom the monster matched in height, but while Bram was lean and lanky, the monster had a huge set of muscles to match his stature, filling the space. His muddy body gleamed when it swung under the beam of torchlight, pecs, biceps, and abdominals bulging and shining. Its face remained hidden behind Bram's, hair slicked down with shiny brown filth. Then, what do we do? Coffee's teeth clattered, and he nearly stumbled onto the barbecue as the monster and his corpse shield edged closer. The monster turned its head, opened its mouth to reveal a black hole, luminous white teeth shining within, half clearing its throat, half snarling. Coffee screamed. His high-pitched girlish wail reverberated around the room, bringing Fenn back to his senses. Why am I staring like this? He'd seen worse, survived worse. He hadn't gone through the horrors of the Apoch just to die at the hands of some mud-dweller. 
The monster was halfway across the room, and Fenn suddenly realised he and Coffey had slowly retreated to the other side. Screw Bram's dignity and death. It was time to save his own skin. Quiet, you devil! Fenn shouted. Coffee! Fire! He pulled his trigger at the same time as Coffee, and the conjoined guns leapt out of their arms, flung back by the recoil. Two black blaster shots soared through the lobby, hitting Bram in the chest and exploding on impact. Skin, ribcage, lungs, spine and blood all boiled and burst under the ferocious heat of the blaster shots, spitting fragments of human shrapnel around the room. The monster behind Bram yelled as the blaster shot's leftover power burned through and tore its chest apart. Fenn fell on his arse, bruising his left buttock on lumpy concrete. He covered his eyes and cursed, the black shimmering light of the blaster shot still dancing over his pupils. He always forgot how bright the weapons were. And how loud. Dust and a pink mist settled over the room, and the pattering echoes of rain seeped back into the lobby as the ringing noise of the blaster shots faded. Fenn's heart slowed as his senses recovered, reappearing from their foxhole to observe the damage. The smell of cooked flesh reached his nose, adding to the aroma of burning sausage. There was no need to panic any more. Monster or not, human shield or none. Nobody could survive one, let alone two blaster shots to the chest at such close range. A cough shot out of the darkness. Fenn fumbled towards the source and grabbed the man lying next to him. Get off me! Coffee slapped Fenn's searching hand away. Why'd you have to do that? You hit me right in the face! No, I didn't. I hit Bram and the big bastard. With the gun, I mean. <coughs> Shit. Hurts to talk. The pair of guns must have whacked Coffee in the face when thrown back by the recoil. Fenn let out a deep breath and chuckled, feeling giddy relief. Could have been a lot worse. At least it's over now. I guess. Definitely for Bram. What was that? A monster he had fought. Fenn shook his head and let out an exasperated sigh. Of course it wasn't. And to think Coffee actually screamed, just like a little girl. He would make fun of him later for that. He was just a man of sorts. A large, muddy one, but still a man. The bigger question is, where did he come from? Also, where's this steam coming? A shift in the rubble. Was that his imagination? Another movement, a squelching one, as wet flesh pulled apart. The room was becoming humid, like a sauna, and Fenn heard a soft hissing as more hot steam filled the air. Far more than a couple of blaster shots would emit. Coffee, is that you making that noise? Fenn asked quietly, already knowing that Coffee lay to his left, not at the entrance to the corridor. Another shift, and this time he'd seen it. The pile on the other side of the room had moved. Fenn shot backwards, kicking away with sudden panic as terror reflooded his veins. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? Coffee stammered, pain to talk forgotten, as he copied Fenn, retreating as fast from the reanimated corpse as he could. No one should be able to survive a blaster shot like that, not without armour. Fenn had seen men and droids alike crumple in their path. Even a fully grown Balfarian could be downed in one go from the deadly force. And to stand after receiving two? Impossible. He had been wrong the first time. It's not a monster. It's worse. Fenn's base instincts kicked into pure flight mode. He felt himself rise and turn, scrambling towards the open entrance, feet tripping over debris, arms pushing back up without hesitation as he hurtled for the door. He was vaguely aware of Coffee running next to him, overtaking, dashing outside into the freezing rain, not a glance back. Fenn couldn't agree more. The deluge had never looked so appealing before. He heard rubble tumbling behind him, and Fenn sensed the being's huge physique standing up. He followed Coffee and fell onto the slushy slope of rubble outside, catching his arms on loose bricks. The curtain of rain drenched him instantly. His coat was still in the lobby, but no way in hell was he going back for that. Fenn jumped back to his feet, ignoring the scrapes and bruises, slipping as he went downwards. He paused when he reached the black bitumen of the street, glistening with the rain's beatings. Was it following? It was foolish, but Fenn couldn't help himself. He had to look back. 
He turned his head, heartbeat pounding in his ears, mouth dry. The huge, silhouetted figure stood slouched at the top of the slope, steam simmering from its chest. Through the darkness, through the mist and rain, Fen could tell the monster. No, a demon was staring at him. Could tell, not because of that strange sixth sense people get when studied from afar, but because of the demon's eyes. They were glowing. Two tiny rings of bright blue amongst the looming darkness. The irises shone, staring straight into Fen's own. Now it was his turn to scream. Just like a little girl. Chapter 6 Heat Wave Hot. So very hot. The broiling stones atop the cracked mud shimmered warning signals to any creature foolish enough to approach. Trees with crisp dead branches curled and twisted in on themselves in a vain attempt at shelter. Even the still, dry air succumbed to the sun which continued to beat down. The sand basked happily in the barrage of heat, undisturbed by any breeze or moisture, celebrating another day of peace in the vast desert bowl. Amelia scraped her feet over the hard-packed sand, barely lifting the soles of her shoes above the ground. She had never felt so small, trudging through the open expanse of ankle-high, dirt-dusted scrub. So, this was freedom. She wasn't a big fan of it so far. Amelia hadn't realised how horrible struggling through the wilderness would be. After all, who would dwell on this? It was easy to forget the sunlight that fiercely burnt the exposed parts of her body, especially brutal to the skin long concealed underground, broiling it into worrying shades of red. The heat which had occasionally marked a brief period of freedom from Sawtooth's base now bit at her every will to keep moving, even stinging her nostrils when she breathed too hard, not content with just hurting her on the outside. Again, she looked back at the same view that faced ahead, which wasn't easy to do with only one open eye. The other was sealed shut by the big bruise with an angry sting. Clear blue sky above, rust-red sand below. With her limited view, it was all Amelia could manage not to get swallowed up in the shimmering sea of contrasts. Small flies buzzed past her ears, clinging to her bare arms as they crawled around in search of meaning. Some of them found it on her lips, settling down to suck at the tiny hints of moisture. At first, she'd tried swatting them away with her one working hand. Now she let them stay. At least she had company. Them and the vulture circling above. Best not to think about him. Amelia stared resolutely forward at the line of muddy brown cliffs, inching ever closer. Or maybe she only imagined them. She'd seen a line of water edging the horizon that turned into a desert mirror up close. Mirror? No, that wasn't the right word. A string of unmoving wind turbines waved to her from the glimmering horizon. One had fallen onto its side, two of its three blades sunken into the land, the third held up in the air, saluting the flatness trapping it. The car, emptied of fuel, was long gone. Amelia had no idea how far she'd gotten the Humver. Hopefully enough. Although, Sawtooth's Rock had water. Food. Shade. Everything she could ever dream of. Would it be so bad to go back? She would be caged again, but amongst the other women, Amelia was the favourite. Got to sit by Sawtooth's side the most, smuggle secret smiles to herself when he laughed. Such a special sound, someone's laughter when it's not directed at you. Especially his. The other woman might hate her for it, but Sawtooth would take special care of her. When she returned, the men would punish her, of course, probably no worse than the usual, and then she would just use the shell. Every time the punishments came, Amelia retreated within herself, 
to the special shell which had taken years to build. It was weak at first, and she vaguely remembered it cracking a few times under the pressure, but she'd rebuilt, over and over. From mud to wood. Wood to metal. Metal to... to an even stronger metal. Now the shell could withstand anything. As long as she had that, and the double-barreled pistol at her side, even if its swinging holster bruised that side right now, then she was invincible. Amelia realised invincible might not be the right word, as another headache pounded inside her skull, accompanied by a throat as dry as the desert sand. Her right shoulder continued to throb, where her arm swayed uselessly from the socket. The hand beneath was sore and stiff, from where she'd hit Quidel last night. The skin scraped red off her knuckles, the blood on them dry and crumbly, falling off in tiny flakes. Waste of energy to try rub them clean. Her feet began to stumble, head hazy. She knew a few fancy words, always on the hunt to discover more. A secret power she stole for her own. Amelia remembered one that people in the rock liked to complain about a lot. Dehydration. She was definitely dehydrationed. No. Dehydrated. She had to keep going. To reach the big concrete cube, whatever it was called. The one with the shops and tents and the free women. It sheltered near the cliffs, but how far did she have to get there? Could she even make it? Could go back. Amelia was still alive after all these years because of Sawtooth and his men. If she begged, after being given permission to speak, of course, then perhaps she'd be forgiven. Sawtooth would take her back, but could she trust his men to return her safely? Probably depended on who found her. Quidel, for all his threats, was too scared of Sawtooth to disobey him and hurt her. Hawker and Sonny wouldn't do much, just get the job done. Hush and daggers she didn't know well, but weren't too bad. Not like the four worst members of Sawtooth's inner circle. Screamer, Rammer, Fuse, and Firecrotch. The worst men she knew. The cruelest in the world. Regardless of them, she couldn't go back. A hum in the distance. Something different from the buzzing of flies. Emilia's thought snapped back, and the blurry wall of shimmering colours took form again. Her head throbbed as she spun around, scanning for the rumbling noise. Had they found her already? Now they were here, all she wanted to do was run. She couldn't go back, not with the riders coming. The sound came from above. Were they flying? She craned her neck. The sun had disappeared, blotted out by a huge, hovering shape. Amelia closed her eye, briefly enjoying the sudden relief from the shadow. Her wits popped back and Amelia took a step away from the roaring shape. Four fires spewed, two on either side of the main body, creating an enraged wind that whipped her hair and scattered loose sand around her feet. The shape floated closer. A ship. They glided effortlessly through the sky, and Amelia always wondered what it would be like to fly inside one. Away from the men, the ground, everything. But this ship looked different from the husks left to rot in the boneyard near the rock. Black and bulky, with legs curled to its underside like a set of claws. A boxy, red-tinted window faced her, reflecting blood-coloured sand. The fiery engines were attached to the ends of four separate wings, and from the centre of each wing drooped a blaster turret, all the same size as the one on top of the stolen Humber. A black and red ship? That's when she remembered the one thing in no man's land that Salthoof's men always ran from. Everyone did. From the flying army who had destroyed Sawtooth's empire and now roamed the wastes looking for slaves. The rock had been bad, but this ship was worse. Worse than the riders. Worse than anything imaginable. The ship began to fall, the cylinder-shaped engines swaying and screaming. 
They grew louder, closer to the ground, sand shrieking as the heat blasted. People would come out of the ship when it landed. Amelia had seen it happen from afar. She turned and began to sprint in the opposite direction, her loose arm flapping. The flies fled in every direction as she ran, abandoning her. Amelia panted as she ran through the heat, drubbing sunlight, making her dizzy. She couldn't give up. This was her only chance. Had to ignore the pain. It would be less sore than being a slave. Just had to keep. Another, identical ship swung down directly in front of her, engines thundering in her ears. Amelia skidded to a stop, too hard, and tumbled into a thorny shrub, sand, dust and stones scrabbling against her face and under her top. She pushed herself from the dirt with one arm, gasping, staring one-eyed at the newcomer. It took her a few seconds to realise it was the same ship coming to take her away. Amelia picked herself off the dusty floor and ran back the way she'd come, not caring if she headed towards Quidel, Fuse, Firecrotch, or any of the other bastards. Had to get away from the closest threat. Then she could hide and properly plan her next. The ship roared overhead and dropped in front again, blocking any escape. Amelia came to a stop, bent over and breathing hard, too dehydrated to cry. She turned her head and scanned the empty horizon. No wonder the flying army prowled the desert for slaves. Nowhere to run. No one nearby to help. Not that anyone would help her anyway. She was hungry, exhausted, in no condition to fight with her bare hands. Surprise was her best weapon in a fight, and she had less than zero of that now. Only one choice left. She made sure to keep her front turned away from the ship as it landed, bowed her head and slowly lifted the pistol out of its holster. Her back stiffened as the fiery roar quietened and the ship's legs opened with a creaking whine, heard them stab into the ground and sigh as they took the full weight of the body. The loud click and swoosh of a sliding door unleashed itself onto the empty landscape and two sets of feet jumped out paused, before padding her way across the hard-packed dirt towards her. The pistol trembled in her hand. It didn't matter how many times Quidel said it before. Today Amelia would prove she wasn't helpless. She made sure to keep her weapon in front, struggling to hold its considerable weight aloft with only one hand. She shoved the double barrel between her legs and cracked it open at the hinge attached to the handle letting the metal dig into the back of her thigh. The gun sprang open at the centre, allowing Amelia to check the lengths of the two barrels. Smoothed metal bores stared back at her, daylight pupils shining through the ends. Suddenly felt as hollow as the tube sitting between her legs. She forgot to grab blaster cells in the armoury. Stupid. So, so stupid. Maybe Cordell had been right all along. It was over, and she hadn't even left the desert. A free life had all been the imagination of a lone woman in a big, uncaring world. At least she wouldn't die of dehydration. Amelia clicked the gum back together, leaving it clenched between her legs, stared past her pistol's handle to a patch of scraggly brown grass in front of her worn-out yellow trainers. A fly buzzed lazily around it, surveying the struggling clump of life. Did the grass start off green and slowly wilt to such an ugly state, or had it always looked like that? Two more sets of feet joined hers, one pair of scuffed hiking shoes and a large pair of clean black boots. All three pointed towards the grass, forming a little gathering around the brown display. The fly flitted away. If only she could do the same. Jesus, someone's been through the wars. You see in this blood? Looks like a dislocated shoulder too. A deep intake of breath, high above. I should have guessed something would go wrong, said a second, deeper voice. Aye, the first voice again, chirpy and grumbly at the same time. That's what we get for giving Rusk a task that can't be fixed with a shifter or a plasma drill. 
Where is he, anyway? Rusk. The name of the mechanic she'd hit. So, these men weren't with the flying army. They must have been sent by Sawtooth. She closed her eyes, feeling herself sway, too exhausted to fight. Knew it would only make more trouble. Did she fall asleep? Hello? Can you hear me? What's her name again? Amelia. She lashed her head up. The two men were taller than her, but the one on the right was gigantic, towering into the sky, with a body bigger than Sawtooth's. He was the one who had said the name. Her name. Didn't he know it was against the rules? She stared at his blonde hair and deep blue eyes. Only one other person had the same colour eyes, although just in his right, and these eyes didn't have the same expression. They were sad, in the same way the other prisoners at the rock were. That certainly got her attention. Amelia, was it? Now the other man had used her name too. She snapped her head towards him as he took a step forward. He looked small next to the blonde giant, with a beard that only grew around his chin and lips, and one of the palest faces she'd ever seen. Where had they come from? Neither of these men had much tan, despite everywhere outside the rock having a blazing sun on clear days. Sorry to scare you with our gunship there. It's great for warding off unwanted company, but not so much for relaxed approaches. So, Amelia, how does it feel to get away from that rock? You must be over the moon. She felt herself blush, not used to hearing her name in such a casual manner. The man with the beard didn't react. The sunburn must have hidden the extra red running to her cheeks. He smiled, furrows deepening around his eyes, and Amelia instinctively looked away, squeezing her one eye shut, waiting for the shouting or the hitting to start, the way it always did when smiles were aimed at her. Scary one, isn't she? What did that mean? It's all right. We're not going to hurt you. Lies. Amelia opened her eye and saw the big man's hand moving towards her. Amelia yelped and tripped over herself, landing on her bum, pistol skidding across the dirt. She held an arm above her head, knowing it wouldn't help. Jays, I think you broke her. Another deep breath. I wasn't expecting this. What were you expecting? She's been in that bastard's clutches for her. Well, you know how long. Amelia heard an unzipping sound, followed by a thud on the ground in front. She raised her eye. The bearded man sat a few paces away. She lowered her arms, squinting at his absurd pale blue shirt covered in pink flowers. Here. The man placed a seafree bottle on the floor and rolled it towards her. She fixed a hungry gaze on the transparent liquid within. It's water. Go on, you must be dying of thirst. Quite literally, I reckon. He had a strange way of speaking. Emilia quickly picked up the bottle, wincing at the pain in her hands, uncaring if it was drugged. At least this was a nice, painless way of bringing her to Sawtooth. She unscrewed the cap and took a sip. A larger one, then started emptying the bottle with a lent-back head, clutching both hands to the bottle like a greedy baby gulping the lukewarm water. A dam burst in her throat, life-giving waves rolling into ripples of physical relief that flowed throughout her body as the thick sludge of dryness washed away. She stopped when she felt a trickle run down her chin, anxious not to waste a drop. She hefted the big bottle, scrutinising the half-empty container. Bet you feel better now. The bearded man rested his arms on crossed legs, lines wrinkling around the smile in his beard. Maybe he wasn't as bad as she'd thought, but there were very few trust-filled experiences to go off. Plus, the other man continued to tower with that huge height of his, ready to bundle her up at any moment. Do you want more water? The bearded man asked. We can give you more, but first, we need some questions answered. Can you understand us? Have you got a universal translator in your head there? Amelia nodded. She'd never heard someone she couldn't understand, no matter how different the accent. Good. It's very important that we find out what happened to Rusk. She hadn't tried to kill him. Hoped he wasn't dead. Can you talk? 
gave another nod. Well? Trick question. They'd hit her if she said anything. That's how it always went. They hadn't given her permission to speak, and when she did? Well, she'd have to retreat into her shell. She only talked freely with the other prisoners at the rock in hushed tones after sundown. That was all. All she deserved. A breeze, the first of the day, tickled the shrub of grass between them. The man stroked his beard and looked to his companion. The giant just stood there, blinking, and Amelia sat, staring back at the pair of them. Not exactly going to plan, is it? Looks like there's not much choice. He slowly shifted back to his feet, and Amelia flinched as he headed past her to the ship, where the four engines continued to rumble steadily in the background. The blonde giant continued to stare at Amelia, a desperate look in his eyes. She never liked that look, often spelled trouble for her. Amelia, we're here to help you. I'm sorry. The nameless giant reached out, and Amelia scuttled back, puffs of dust springing up as her only shield. He grimaced, slowly retracting the empty hand. It's no good. The other man trudged back. We can drag her with us if you really like, but I don't reckon that's a good way to start a trusting relationship. A hand grabbed her left arm before she could react, shoved upwards, sliding into her shoulder. She yelped at the jolt of pain, sprang back, and defensively brought both arms in front. The bearded man grinned. Looks like that did the trick. Her arm. It was working. She held up her hand and marvelled at the wiggling fingers. What magic had he used? As Amelia stood, something plopped onto her head. Before she saw what, a bag was thrust at her, making her catch it with the newly working hand. She turned the heavy bag by its twin straps, unzipped it, and saw three more large bottles waiting inside. The sight was better than a stack of gold. She turned her head and realised the sun wasn't as harsh anymore, her neck mercifully cooler. She pulled at a flap, hanging in front of her vision. That's a sun hat. It'll shelter you before you completely burn up. And here, appreciate you not using it right then. He offered Amelia the pistol, handle first. He hadn't seen the empty barrels. She took it and let it hang by her side, too heavy to hold up. Now, we were here to invite you to our humble abode, but we need at least a sliver of trust between us. We've given you enough to keep you going a day in that bag. All we ask for is you tell us what happened to Rusk. He paused. What was he waiting for? He nodded. Thought not. Real shame, seeing he's the reason you got out of that place. Was Rusk the reason her door was unlocked last night? She had assumed it was a mistake. Maybe she should say something to them, if they really weren't with Sawtooth. But the man barreled on with his talking, and the revelation sprang away with the new words. Now, if you insist on going your own way, I would advise heading left instead of straight. You see those cliffs? Lot closer than the direction you're heading. Amelia looked to where he pointed, gasped at how much closer these cliffs were than the brown smudges she'd been aiming for. They were close enough to see the sparse trees and large boulders gathered around the base. Her original goal. When had she started walking away from them? Either the desert, or lack of water, played tricks on her. Just around those cliffs... Our Valugo apartments. Only place nearby where you can survive once that pack runs out. You better hurry, because they have a curfew, and once it's in effect, no one gets in. Head of security is real strict. You got all that? Ah, keep forgetting you're playing the silent act with us. The bearded man turned to his companion. Come on, no point sticking around here. Amelia still gazed at the cliffs when she heard the men turn to leave. She spun, shocked they would let her go like this, with all these supplies, free to make her own decisions. Not much choice, though. The Lugo Apartments. That was the name of the concrete block she'd been aiming for before losing her way. The first stop on her path to freedom. You know something? The bearded man turned and smiled. I wouldn't have the patience to slug through this desert. Never was fond of the things. 
Bit of a lifeless atmosphere, don't you think? The big man was already halfway back to the ship. He seemed easier to understand than the talking one. Emilia never wasted words. They were a rare treat for her to share, but this man in the flower shirt was happy to spew out as many as he could. Now stay hydrated. Best apply that sunscreen in the bag too. It'll make an average moisturiser where you're already burnt. And there's a blanket in there. Remember to wrap up warm tonight. You wouldn't think it now, but this place can have a shocking chill to it. Right then. I would offer to shake your hand, but I get the feeling you wouldn't reciprocate, would you? Nice word. The one starting with R. Amelia stood, backpack in one hand, pistol in the other, big hat drooping to the side of her head, staring numbly at the chuckling man strolling back to his ship. The big man continued to stare at her from inside the ship, so intently that she could feel those blue eyes of his. The sliding doors cut him off as the ship rose, engines flaring, legs folding, body turning, fires roaring. Dust spewed, and the weird vehicle, the one belonging to the flying army, disappeared into the dazzling sky. Like that, it was gone. A gentle breeze blew a scattering of pebbles and twigs against Amelia's legs. A soft whistle, and then silence once more. Quieter than before. Even the vulture had left. An empty pit suddenly grew inside her stomach. One not caused by lack of food. Was it a sensation she felt before? Long ago? Almost nostalgic. Was that the word? Tap, tap, tap. Quinnell lifted his eyes, averted them as soon as he met his mentor's biting gaze. Dared to look again when he felt the eyes shift to the next man in line. His mentor stopped tapping his long pointed nail against the armrest encrusted with circular cutting blades attached to the chair made from buzz saws, hack saws, chain saws, and longer spikier saws whose names Quidel had long forgotten. Saw to have stretched back into his throne, the saw blades fanning out behind him in deadly peacock fashion. He jutted out his lower jaw and pulled back his lips, a common expression for his mentor to adopt. One designed to show off his spiked front teeth, glinting in the firelight that flickered from the red walls. The teeth complemented the craggy set of shark fangs that dangled between the many tattoos, decorating Sawtooth's bare-shaven, oil-glistening chest. Quidel liked the look of his mentor's teeth, tried copying them, got hit by Sawtooth when he showed him the first filed-down result, who screamed something about stealing his image. He licked his one sharpened tooth, top centre right, tongue stinging from where he had bit into it. Had bit in frustration after he'd failed to hold the girl. The bitch hurt him, hurt his face and his privates below. Worse, she'd hurt Sawtooth's trust in him, needed to rebuild. Had a way to do so. After all, Sawtooth still had to teach him the many ways of life. He'd been lost after the apoch. Lost before it, too, but Sawtooth had shown him the light. Kudel lusted for more. More teaching, more knowledge. Then he'd become the boss, take over, set in the saw-spangled peacock chair. Get access to the better girls, maybe even the best girl. The only one Sawtooth kept forbidden from everyone else. But for now, she was gone, and the patrol led by Hawker had lost her trail. Rusk, bandages wrapped around his head, and Fuse, sweating like a no-man's lander with a mortgage, stood next to him in line. The throne room was hot. Quidel sweated under his black leather jacket. And cramped. Sawtooth was so close he smelt the wood-scented oil smothering his chest. Torchlight and banners flagged the throne on either side, displaying bloodthirsty sigils with skulls, bones, beasts, and other variations on the gloried theme of death. Kudel had thought he recognised the banners from a show popular before the Apoch, but Saltif assured him it must have been a documentary telling tales of real-life, long-dead empires. The very empires that Saltif descended from and from the ashes of their legacies he had formed his own, 
before being smashed apart by the flying army. The red pointed face of Salt Hoof's empire was smeared onto the black wall, painted using the blood of Salt Hoof's enemies, stretching from throne to ceiling. Three lines, two for the narrowed angry eyes, and one for the wicked grinning mouth split in the middle. A cough came from Sawtooth's left, and he snarled, violently jerking the chain shackled to the throne. The chain's owner yelped as she was yanked by her manacled neck into the light, her oiled skin as shiny as the top of Sawtooth's head. She fell onto her knees. Quidel stared at the scantily clad woman, started licking his tooth for a whole new reason before Sawtooth's voice brought him back to attention. Fuse. Sawtooth hissed, drawing out the name. Quidel glanced to his right and noticed Fuse's big bottom lip quivering. Wondered if Sawtooth noticed as well. His question was immediately answered. You look scared. Why is that? Sawtooth asked, the rumbling words crashing after one another in a slow-timed tumble. Fuse gulped. Not, not scared, Sawtooth, sir. Not scared at all. You should be. Sawtooth paused. Fuse sucked in his breath. Not of me. You should be scared of your own inability to find a single girl. I'll have to reconsider your usefulness. Quidel silently agreed. He had been barehanded when the girl attacked him in such a sly manner. Only explanation for her getting away. Fuse, on the other hand, had his electric toys and still failed to catch the runt. I'll start with a test. Sort of continued. Go fetch me some sweet tea and then report to the kitchen. Leave your weapons here. You're going to be the kitchen whore's dog for a week. Sweeping floors, cleaning dishes, emptying bins. All women's jobs. The lowest there are. Go, now. And extra bourbon in the tea. Fuse slinked his head, carefully shrugging off his infamous backpack and trudging from the room. Quidel admired the decision. Domestic servitude would hurt a man like Fuse much harder than any physical punishment. Doubtless anyone but Sawtooth would have made a better call. Well, apart from himself, of course. One day, sooner or later, he'd be sure to be the one in that position. Then he could... Quadal! Stop your muttering! Shit. Didn't realize he'd been making a noise. But people often were saying that about him. They didn't appreciate that there were too many thoughts in his head. Couldn't keep all of them to himself. You still have to explain yourself. Quidel snapped his head up, soaking in the words addressed to him. He was sought with star pupil, of that there was no doubt. It took a huge amount of courage to hold his mentor's gaze, and to keep staring into the oddly coloured eyes. One green, one blue. You say you confronted her. Are you so weak that you can't stop a frail girl? Not at all, master. No one could get past me. Not in a fair fight, that is. The girl, she... Quidel realized he was talking too fast. Always did in his mentor's presence. Just couldn't wait to give him every word he could. But he needed to figure out how to phrase this carefully. She used... dishonorable methods. Sawtooth chuckled, and Quidel's heart skipped a beat. Honor... In a woman, you are funny. Sawtooth sort of yanked his chain again, forcing the oiled woman forward onto all fours. Quidel hungrily stared at Sawtooth's sort of pet. His mentor always did reserve the best ones for himself. She was a curved beauty, complemented by her long black hair, which scraped the floor. Sawtooth sort of forbade his whores to cut their hair short. The woman whimpered as Sawtooth rested his thick calf muscles onto the small of her back. Give the bitches a chance and they'll take everything from you. They've done so for centuries, no, millennia. 
It's our duty to ensure the proper order is never flipped again. While Saltif crooked his head to inspect the woman, Quidel heard Rusk whisper next to him. Someone's been on the bad end of a divorce. Quidel gritted his teeth, annoyed at the mechanic's impudence. Such obliviousness to reality. Never had liked Rusk or his warped humour, but he'd fix his attitude soon enough. But. Sawtooth grumbled, sitting back into his chair, shifting the leopard-skin loincloth wrapped around his waist. My Amelia was different. Quidel bit his lower lip, thinking of the tanned little beauty. He felt himself harden every time he heard her name. Of course, he'd never disobey his mentor, but what he would do to her if allowed only a little... Quidel! Muttering! Not that I blame you for getting excited. She was my prized possession for a reason, and sure to fetch a high price from the riders. But you let her go. Quidel winced, but he wouldn't be deterred. Now was his time. About that master, I have some information that I'm sure will please you. Boy! How dare he not respond straight away? Boy! One of the double doors behind him opened, and the boy, Cyrus, came rushing in, sweat sticking to his spotty forehead. Yes, sir? Quidel smiled to himself. Only proper he be called, sir. Boy! Tell Master Saltooth who you saw opening the cage of the girls' quarters last night. Go on. It's not very hard. He's in this very room. Quidel grinned across at Rusk. The mechanic stared back at him, unblinking. He dare look bored? He was the one who did it. Why wasn't the boy talking? Well? Quidel glanced around. Cyrus stared, wide-eyed, at the girl underneath Sawtooth's feet. The boy practically had his tongue out. Even the woman who received this treatment regularly blushed. The woman's back gave under Sawtooth's feet, and she suddenly slammed onto the floor. Cyrus gave a shock to yelp. Fucking teenagers. Quidel kicked the boy in the shin with his steel-capped warrior boot, hard, and the wimp fell onto his knee, crying out and clutching at his leg. The pathetic sound was enraging. Quidel, Sawtooth warned in a low voice. The red haze shifted from Quidel's eyes as he withdrew his boot's second kick. Was always forgetting not to get too carried away with his punishments. Between sobs and without raising his head, Cyrus finally pointed at Rusk. Looks like today is my lucky day, Rusk said, his bored expression unchanged. Why, Rusk? Sawtooth asked, eyes narrowed to slits. Rusk, examining the dirt under his nails, shrugged. Guess you'll have to torture me to find out. Although I'm sure you'll do it either way. Quite handy, actually. I've been meaning to get my back looked at. Oh, don't worry. Hush will see to that, and much more. The woman cringed from the force of the last barked word. Even the insolent mechanic ought to be scared by now. Quidel stepped forward and could tell he'd done well, as Sawtooth didn't yell at him to go back. Good thing the boy came to him first, and not Sawtooth. Cyrus had waned on the idea of pursuing the girl, spouting some nonsense about letting her have a new life. But Quidel assured him she couldn't survive the wastes of no man's land. They'd be doing her a favour by bringing her back. Besides, what life could be better than one inside Sawtooth's rock? And I've got more good news, master. I had the Cyrus boy send out his drone. Found what Hawker couldn't. The car's south. It's abandoned. But we've tracked her footprints, and I know where she's headed. I only ask you let me lead the party to retrieve her. His mentor's brow furrowed. Had he gone too far? Saltuf displayed his spiked tooth smile, and Quidel felt a wave of pure ecstasy surge. Approval. Nothing could have been better, and his gamble had paid off. 
Sawtooth never left the rock, and someone else would have to lead the search party. A chance to redeem himself. I like your eagerness, Quidel. So, where has she gone? Quidel smiled. The Lugo Apartments. There had been no footprints, the red dirt too hard, but in terms of walking distance, there was nowhere else to go apart from desert. He hoped the girl was smart enough to aim for the apartments. Otherwise, she'd be dead. And he really would be in trouble. Chapter 7 Sightseeing The muscles in Michael's thighs burned, creating fierce competition for his aching calves as his breaths became strained and heavy, sweat dripping from his naked torso. This was hard. Harder than it should have been, but he reckoned he could be forgiven for that. It wasn't often a man climbed a skyscraper the day after being shot in the chest. The stairwell might be challenging, but there was no way Michael was letting a set of steps get the better of him. He reached another landing, glanced at the faded number 45, peeling from the wall as he passed. Surely, he was getting close. Then again, what could he expect from choosing the tallest building he saw from street level? He tugged at his backpack and wrestled with the rifle strapped over his shoulder as he tried to jog the pair into a more comfortable position. Failed. His mind quickly switched back to the next discomfort. The trousers clinging tight to his legs. Their last owner might have been the right height, but he'd been far skinnier than Michael. To make matters worse, the man's shirt and coat had been burnt and torn apart by the blaster shots, leaving a set of rags in worse condition than Finn's old jacket. Michael had tossed it. His brother might be dead, but it made no sense carrying around a ruined jacket to remember him by. The knife and bracelet made up for that. It wasn't all bad. Thankfully, one of the men had abandoned the khaki-coloured coat currently wrapped around his waist, which fit him surprisingly well. Michael had also awoken to a set of abandoned cooked sausages. Burnt, cold meat never tasted so good. Only after eating every scrap did he remember what the sausages were made from. It was sickening, thinking about the contents of his stomach, and he felt guilt-ridden when remembering how much he'd enjoyed them. Not even three days since leaving the freezer, and he'd already resorted to such disgusting measures. The sausages had helped him survive, and for that, he'd ensure whoever's flesh went into making them wouldn't go unavenged. Patches of sky were appearing in the sides of the stairwell now, letting shafts of daylight and glimpses of ruined city leak in. Michael expected this. From the last remnants of what used to be a road outside, he had seen the building's partially destroyed top, leaving an eroded crown to frame the sun above. The sun bothered him. He'd been woken by the morning light seeping into the reception lobby, tickling his face where he'd collapsed onto the floor, disturbingly close to the cooked corpse of the man who had been shot by his friends. Maybe friends wasn't the right term. The encounter left him with a lot of questions. He had been meaning to take the tall bandit hostage and interrogate the other two, but during the struggle, the knife he'd been holding to the man's throat ended up sticking through it. Either by accident or on purpose, Michael still wasn't sure, but that wasn't what worried him. Why had the two other men shot Michael and their comrade and fled afterwards, leaving behind free blaster rifles and bags of supplies? Why not capture him or finish the job once he'd passed out? Most remarkable of all was how he'd survived those blaster shots. He'd felt the first one shudder and rip apart the tall man, right before the second exploded inside his own chest. And here he was, back to normal. He hadn't expected his healing power to be strong enough to reconstruct entire body parts. Just how far could he push this new ability? Now yet another set of questions needed answering. He figured it was time to solve a few and the quickest way to do that was to get up high. Michael rounded the corner to be greeted by a gaping doorframe, the roof torn away by... Well, that was another mystery. He climbed the last few steps, slightly queasy, raising an arm to cover his head as he passed under the crumbling archway. Seemed the collapsing ruin in the jungle left an impression on him. 
one to be added to the list of battlefield souvenirs. The stairs must have continued at one time. Not any more. Michael surveyed the leftovers of a disintegrating platform, thinly shielded from the elements by a few columns of surviving wall and wretched piles of rubble. Metal beams stuck out from the debris, the skyscraper's skeleton, only covered in part by concrete, like that of a burning man's flesh sliding from his body, exposing the bone. Michael blinked a couple times, trying to forget the image. Didn't like how easily his mind wandered to memories like that one. He took a deep breath, stepped onto the platform, and focused ahead. A panorama stretched out before him in all directions. Had to take a moment to process the image, realising that he had indeed been transported very far. Much further than he'd been guessing. There were no thick forests creeping into the city. There wasn't even a floor. In the distance was only ocean surrounding him and the city he was perched right in the centre of. To his front and left, buildings claimed the land before abruptly stopping at the shoreline, where the calm flatness glinted at him between the gaps of a dishevelled city skyline in a big, toothy grin. He thought he smelt seawater, now it was there, but he knew he was too high up for that. The bandits from yesterday could be anywhere in this mess. How long would it take him to find their base? Michael turned. Found it. He took the eyeglass out of his trouser pocket that he'd found on the dead man and extended the tube. Decorated with a pleasant brass casing, it was a handy tool. Looking through the glass's eyepiece, he studied the base at the far end of the island. More accurate to call it a fortress. A patch of the city had been completely cleared to make a field of flattened rubble beyond which squatted a thick red wall topped by towers and battlements, designed by an architect very fond of triangles. The fortifications were tall, making it hard to see what hid behind them. The only visible occupants were another set of red walls on the left, layers getting smaller nearer the top, and a set of closely grouped skyscrapers on the right. Michael didn't need to be an expert on castles to know the second set of walls was the keep, the main base of operations. The huddled skyscrapers behind the walls were the only ones spared from being scrubbed off a site. Something on top connected the buildings, although it was hard to tell what from this angle. Movement. A twinkle of sunlight reflected off moving glass. Michael strained his eye through the tube and his heart fluttered when he saw the ship gliding above the walls, coming to land. His hopes sank, along with the descending gunship, which was clearly not from the Alliance. An elongated passenger transport, with windows running along the sides that allowed the occupants to look outside. Another ship appeared, taking its predecessor's place as it flew out towards the sea. It was larger than the previous vessel, with two large shipping containers strapped onto its back. Civilian ships, or ones repurposed by bandits. Michael lowered the eyeglass and wiped his forehead. Despite the nipping wind, his skin was still hot and sweaty. Maybe his theory of being immune to illness had been off. He unstrapped his rifle and backpack and untied the coat from his waist to shield himself. He rooted through the backpack, took a drink of water and put the flask back next to the two cardboard boxes filled with blaster cells. The cells were matte grey coloured, each cylindrical tube the size of his thumb or an old-fashioned shotgun shell. There were thirty in each box although unfortunately their bottom quarters were wrapped in black lining, the marker of black blaster shots. Black market produced, fittingly enough, they provided a less powerful payload and shorter range to their blue counterparts. The cells came from the abandoned bags in the lobby, so at least his enemies would be using the same ammunition. That brought Michael closer to a level playing field. He was good in those. He looked from the bag and smiled at what lay in front. A rare feeling in recent days. Perched on a cairn of flat stones was a round metal compass encased with a glass cover. An antique, also made from brass like the eyeglass. He'd thought physical compasses like this one had long been relegated to museums. Out here, it seemed the old techniques were the best. Michael bent and clutched the compass. Found it stuck fast, glued to the top of the stones. He cast his eyes about, 
grabbed a loose rock and bashed it beside of a compass, denting the casing before it sprang off the smooth surface, like removing a limpet. Every other item had been looted from the city, what was the harm of one more? Michael held the compass flat, using the needle and its lettered subjects to map the island in his head. The fort dominated the western side, and skyscrapers occupied the south and east. A clump of high-rises stranded in the sea. There were more to the north, a white stadium sitting amongst the thrashed buildings, and behind all that, a great rise of dark rock. For some reason, the sight seemed familiar. The mountain ran the length of the north side of the island, tallest in the centre, sloping down again on either side with widespread arms to shelter the city. The cropping of rock wasn't just dark, it was pitch black, a volcanic material. Michael only knew that because prosperity was fenced by a similar type of mountain. Exactly the same type. Everything fell into place. Michael slowly reeled his eyes back, soaking in the view with a fresh sight. How could he recognize any city that had been so tarnished? Once he realized where he was, it became obvious. He stared down, over the precipice, and recognized the square sitting below. The same he'd gazed out at during his night with Scarlet. He looked for the building across the square. Gone. All that remained of the Alliance headquarters was a waveless beach of mortar and rubble. Michael dropped the compass and it rolled away without complaint. He sank to his knees, eyes cast to the ground. Took a deep breath through his nose, let it sigh out through his mouth, closed his eyes. The Alliance, who governed the world and brought the rarely appreciated gift of peace for those who deserved it. The strongest pillar of civilization there was. They couldn't be. There were times in Michael's life when everything seemed hopeless. No matter what he tried, things just got worse. Slipping. Slipping. The only direction downwards, until he'd snapped his eyes open and realized a horrible truth. He was at the bottom of a deep, dark pit. He might have been lucky enough to have friends and family on the surface, those who shone a light from the top to reach down, but that's all it would ever do. Give him a weak warmth. It's these moments where life's true tests lie. He could bathe in the light and become forlorn and motionless, eyes turned to the dark. Or he could turn towards the light, push forward, and reach for solutions. His brother might be taken from him, the Alliance destroyed, but Michael didn't need a light to guide the way. He'd been here before, and knew, no matter how bad things seemed, there was always, always a way out. And this time, it was all on his shoulders. Michael opened his eyes, picked up his things, and stood. Needed to concentrate on the immediate future. Had to keep moving, before he drowned in his speculations, and he'd seen something in the square that he wanted to investigate. It would have shocked him on a normal day. Intimidated him, even. But, well, it's all relative. Michael exited the skyscraper through the dishevelled hotel lobby he'd stayed at weeks before, venturing into Central Square. It formed the focal point of four massive roads that followed the compass's points to the ends of the city. Two of the roads led to the ocean's sudden drop-off, and he would have been able to see the red walls of the fort down the western road if not for the heap of collapsed skyscraper blocking the way. A huge, colonnaded building, the old city hall, sat long and fat along one side of the square, its roof crushed in by whatever fighting had happened. Michael tried not to dwell on the building next to it. Perhaps the Alliance had survived and moved the location. Although, hope can be a dangerous monster when exposed for the trickster it is. Michael focused instead on the square's main occupant he'd seen from above. A massive clump of metal, covered in so much vegetation it gave off the appearance of a hillock having sprung up amongst all the man-made construction. A black material poked through the gaps in the thicket, mirroring the vine-strangled object with the red eye from yesterday. Only this time... It was much, much bigger. 
He trudged forward, sidestepping huge blocks of concrete, wearing mossy coats. Tried to ignore the niggling pain building in his head. A shadow fell on top of him. He looked up. Another archway, so large that Michael hadn't seen its curved top till now. It began next to him, a gargantuan shaft of black metal, thick as a bus, wrapped in branchy tendrils, but stretched far into the sky, before falling back down again and merging with the ominous hill. He couldn't shake the impression of a limb sticking out from the torso of a carcass. A dead beast. He looked to his right and saw more metal limbs stemming from the beast. One sprawled out to stretch across the entire square. Two more curled in on themselves. Four in total on this side. He'd been walking towards the wreckage to find a way inside, and Michael wondered if he was about to perform an autopsy on a behemoth's corpse. No. Despite its appearance, the thing was only a piece of technology, soulless even during its working days. He was searching for something capable of destroying a city, and this metallic beast had just climbed to the top of his suspects list. It went a long way to explaining the cruiser-scale damage scarring every street, to the Alliance headquarters slain next to its corpse. Once he reached the structure, metres away from where its body met the ground, Michael encountered a problem. There was no easy way in. Thick grass had forced its way through cracks in the surrounding paving, relishing the challenge of clinging to the metal and creating a bushy growth. The metal itself formed a second barrier, a tall black wall that stretched far into the sky wherever Michael looked. He walked alongside the wall, circling the beast, like scouting the edge of an arena, too big to take in all at once. The task took even longer due to the two limbs he encountered, laid out possessively across the square. He was able to climb the first sheer metal edge by pulling himself up some supporting vinery, but by the time he reached the second, he was so tired and his headache so severe that he simply walked around it. It took ten minutes to scout the length of the limb, its end buried in the churned-up ground, driven into the soil by its own weight. Michael had already finished the bottle of water in his bag when he rounded the leg and was on his way back. His head pounded more. Incredibly, Michael found himself wishing for some rain to provide another drink. Eventually, he reconnected with the main body of the beast, where the square met the wide, western-leading road, and he noticed a difference. The wall and foliage dropped away, where another chunk of black metal jutted out its top smooth and round like a giant egg. Even with the lower half buried into the soil, Michael could tell it was the beast's head. One massive red panel of diamond-shaped glass, a gargantuan version of the eye he'd seen yesterday, coolly gazed at him. Standing next to the beast, Michael felt small before, but this eye stretching to five times his height made him feel minuscule. He was very glad it was dead. To the right of the eye, the buried forehead, covered with moss and grass, provided a sloping rise for Michael to climb. It wasn't easy going. Weighed down by his rifle and backpack, he clutched onto springy plants and clumps of lichen to get a grip over the slippery metal. A few times he grasped handfuls of thorny vines, making blood bead out of his fingers. Michael gritted his teeth as pain and steam bellowed at the slight wounds, doing no favours for his building headache. At last, he reached the top of a rise, a plateau from where, to his delight, he found a hole blasted into the metal armour at the neckline. Michael paused, unstrapping the rifle from his shoulder and swinging it in front of him, switched the safety off. That eye set him on edge, the pure darkness facing him even more so. Out of the three rifles in the lobby, this one was in the best condition. The gun had a polished, matte grey length, a short shiny barrel protruding from the end, and a thick magazine jutting out behind the handle and trigger. He recognised the weapon instantly, due to the slight curve of the rifle's top guard above its barrel, where most of the weapon's heat vented. The BR-16, world's most reliable blaster rifle, at least in the eyes of criminals, revolutionaries, and any other group that favoured reliability and ease of use over all else. He held such rifles before, and despite its cumbersome size, the rifle was rather light. 
He might dislike its owners, but Michael held a certain respect for such steadfast design. Plus, it brought him a chuckle when he heard people confuse the name. BR meant blaster rifle, that much was true, its mysterious designers not wishing to claim ownership with a distinctive name. But 16 did not stand for the year it was built. The number was based on the model. The first experimental blaster rifles had not provided the safest experience for their users. Michael approached the opening in the beast's body. It was a small crack compared to the rest of the mighty creature, but big enough for Michael to slip through with ease. He scarcely believed the size of the armour as he moved past, over half a metre thick. He ran a hand along the makeshift entryway to confirm his eyes weren't tricking him. The beast's limbs would have needed every ounce of strength they possessed just to lift the abundant mass of armour. The utter lack of light waiting for Michael inside caused some primal part of his brain to recoil at the sudden plunge into the unknown. With the darkness came a deep, muffled silence, a close stillness that smothered his ears. No wildlife or wind in here, only a cool dampness with a heavy metallic smell that tickled his nose. The same scent as blood. Maybe it was. The oppressive atmosphere only worsened Michael's headache, now thundering with every heartbeat, and he paused, wondering. Everything exploded. One second, he strained his eyes. The next, he was thrashing, muscles tensing and convulsing at a sudden, unknown abuse. What was happening? Had the inside of the beast brought this on? He couldn't tell. Pain clawed at every fibre of Michael's being, so sudden and intense that he was certain he'd just been obliterated, torn up, ripped apart, and allowed to continue feeling. He couldn't tell where his limbs had gone. All that existed was the sensation of physical hurt attacking him both within and out. He looked around desperately for the exit, beyond the lights sparking and flashing in his head, for the gap in the armour. Was that steam rising around him, blocking the way? Where was the exit? He couldn't tell if his eyes were open. Rational thought escaped the world. Senses gone. Didn't even know if he was standing or curled into a ball on the floor. He tried to scream, but couldn't. The muscles in his windpipe refused to cooperate, wrapped in their own convulsing battle to survive the pain. When the wave of cruelty finally ended, he was not sure if he was passing out in the darkness or drowning in it. Chapter 8 Emergency Summit Fenn's liver-spotted hands wandered over the selection of blades, sharp edges sending glittering invitations his way. He pondered, which to choose? He could pick the largest knife, ideal for carving away large sections of the target, but he had only recently used it on his subject, rendering another use so soon redundant. How about the smaller, thinner blade? Perfect for jobs requiring more finesse. Then again, his current patient was already well worn down. An even more delicate tool was required. Ah, there it is. He laced his fingers around the handles and pulled the set of scissors from their resting place at the edge of his collection. Twin blades freshly sharpened from last week's session. Fenn raised his head, stared straight into the face of his victim. A set of unwavering, grey eyes gazed back. He thought the eyes might be mocking him, for he sensed a hint of jollity in them which neither he nor the years that passed had yet managed to kill. Good to see something still left. Fenn raised the scissors and snipped. He watched the single hair tumble in the mirror's reflection before landing amongst its brethren in the sink. He continued to cut away at his beard, shearing the loose bristles threatening its shape. He trimmed the wispy moustache gathered on his upper lip, accompanied by a triangle of hair under the bottom ending in a pointed dagger hanging off his chin in the classic Van Dyke style. He lowered the scissors and studied his beard, stark white in colour, identical to the thin cropping of hair atop his head. Rather dashing for a man in his mid-forties, even with the lack of colour. Fenn took a moment to admire the pristine edges of his beard, kept under strict control for another day. The one area in his life that he, and he alone, kept under his purview. A loud banging at the door interrupted his thoughts. Fenn sighed and turned from the sink to face the rest of his bedroom. 
Now this is an area I've long given up trying to keep control. He thought to himself, as he picked his way through the mess of clinking beer bottles, tangled wires from outdated knick-knacks, ancient books whose undisturbed pages had begun to colour, and finally, through the swath of dirty clothes he'd managed to hoard for years of prowling the city. Another set of bangs, louder this time. A light knock would have sufficed. Did this person think he couldn't hear them? Perhaps they thought him lost amongst the many vast chambers contained within the tiny room. Fenn scraped a pair of brown corduroy trousers off the floor. The I Heart NW t-shirt he was wearing would have to do. I hear you, I hear you, so stop your incessant pounding, you impatient bats. Ah, Tonkai, how are you doing? Tonkai, a stocky, short-set man with stubble passing as a poor excuse for hair, glared at him, left eye twitching. Fenn. Tonkai, Fenn repeated. Try to smile. I see you're back from Shankmora. Nice weather, I hope. Better than here, I'm sure. I swear, it hasn't been this bad since. Cut the shit, Fen. I'm not here for small talk. Typical Tonkai, brusque as always. Fen smiled, settled into a frown as he leant against the door frame. Just beg talk, then. What about? What do you think? Tonkai spat, quite literally, and Fen made an obvious point of wiping the spittle from his cheek. Dead. A fucking hollow cloak dead, and are you and that other idiot's watch? Fen marvelled at the way Tonky's accent managed to be as blunt as its owner's square head, while simultaneously as sharp as one of his razors. Do you know how suspicious this looks, Fen? And of course, it's neither of your two's fault. No, it's all some giant mud monster. Giant mud demon, Fen corrected. If he was going to present a picture of the enemy he'd heroically fled from, then he might as well paint a good one. And now, on top of this gunship fiasco, we also have a dead holocloak on our hands. As if everyone wasn't on edge already. Did you not think how this would affect the clan? You mean affect your business? It was a lot harder to ship goods by renting the other clan's vehicles, with murderous intent in the air. My fault? Fen asked, shifting himself from the doorframe. It could have easily been me, or the steelbreaker killed by that demon. I'm lucky to be alive. Tonkai gave a derisive snort. Good to know how concerned he is about my well-being. You are lucky. Lucky that a idiot is still alive to corrupt corro- To confirm your story. Ha. Huh. Couldn't even say corroborate. Hardly a big celebration, though. Tonkai was still the boss, and Fen still sober. Tonkai's eyes flared at Fen's smirk. So, where's Billy and Oscar? Fen asked, moving on before he received another rant about respect. I thought they'd be the ones running to put out the diplomatic fires. They left for no man's land and won't be back for a few days. So, for now, I'm the one who has to handle this crisis you've caused. Gods. This very irritable, slightly psychotic stack of muscle was in charge of the Creevers? This really was a crisis. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that, Fen said, swooping around his door and plucking a khaki coat from its hanger. He lost his raincoat when fleeing the demon, leaving him with only four khaki-coloured coats to choose from. Hard times indeed. He turned to find Tonkai glaring at him, left eyelid still jumping. He had hoped the man would be gone by now. Tonkai wasn't the sort for heartfelt goodbyes. Good, I see you get the picture. This way. The meeting's starting in twenty minutes. Meaning? Fen asked as Tonkai marched down the corridor. Damn, he'd been planning on going to the tavern. Fen locked his door. Padlocked, to be more precise. Like hell was he paying for a locksmith. He rushed along the corridor, filled with doors of varying quality that led into other bedrooms he suspected were all bigger than his own. So, Fen panted as he caught up to Tonkai, dreading the answer to his next question. Who are we meeting with? Tonkai gave a sigh, far too exasperated for such a sensible question. The other clan chiefs, who else? Marie has called the three involved clan chiefs and the two fools out on patrol with the hollow cloak. That means you. Fen groaned. Great, an afternoon of high politics. The highest politics in this place anyway. He had managed to avoid these meetings, flying under the radar of responsibility, as he liked to phrase it. He'd lost his appetite for pointless squabbling long ago, but it always seemed to find a way back to him, sooner or later. 
Why don't you have a gauntlet? Tonky asked as they walked. It's a pain coming all the way down here to fetch you. Well, get me a room in the clan quarters and you'll have a much shorter trip. They're reserved for important Creever members. Not you. This way. Really? Free the exit? Who would have thought? He was treated to a lovely sight of Tonkai's arse as they climbed the ladder to the hatch leading onto the surface. As Fen struggled to heave himself off the last rung, he couldn't decide what was more depressing, climbing through a hole to start the day, or descending into one to finish it. Standing on top of the underground apartments, Fen stretched his complaining back, rotating his chest left and right, squinting in the harsh daylight that might have looked drab to someone without a hangover. He was ringed in by tall brick walls, whichever way he looked, adorned with stocky, cylindrical turrets, each equidistant from its neighbour. Good castles took years to build, and this one had been slapped together in a few of them, leading to leagues of haphazardly misplaced bricks, skewed staircases and wonky balustrades, but at least all the bricks were the same rust-red colour. He currently stood next to the base of a turret, its massive girth casting him in deep shadow, while the furthest part of the wall, the section drawing a line between fort and sea, sat half a kilometre away. Yep, still the same old jagged fort. Interrupting the historic brick decor were three identical skyscrapers lined along the right-hand side of the fort, easily twice the height of the wall encasing them, plain white on the sides, fronts and backs covered in a sheen of windows. From his current angle, Fenn saw how the sides of the skyscrapers got narrower towards their slanted tops. The sole survivors of what used to stand here before Arminius cleared the site on moving day. He didn't have time to admire the site atop the three skyscrapers today, as Tonkai had already turned towards the hive of activity to their left, and Fen's biggest obstacle of each day. The courtyard. It held a jostling mess of ships that landed amongst trucks and cars, being unpacked and loaded on the spot, before taking off again into the crowded airspace. Men squeezed between them, carrying supplies or trying to look useful, while shouting merchants flitted around, buying and selling to anyone worth bothering, divided again by streams of residents being taxied amongst the pandemonium. Every man, woman and vehicle wrestled for space amongst the chaos, keen to get their work over and done with, being held up or holding up others in the process as everyone prioritised themselves, slowing the whole machine to a monotonous churn. There was no queuing culture to be found here. Tonkai wasn't headed for the scramble, but rather to a small line of parked vehicles, the closest thing this side of the fort had to a taxi rank. Way to go, Tonkai. I forgot you had your own ride. Tonkai shot Fen a rare smile, as susceptible to flattery as anyone else. The perks of wealth, my friend. He made for a large motorbike, polished to a gleam, two huge silver exhausts complementing the shiny black body sitting atop a mighty set of tyres. Nice ride, Fen said casually, holding back his excitement. He'd be clinging on to the back of Tonkai as they rode, but that didn't matter. The bike looked like it packed a large punch he was eager to try. If I'm not mistaken, that's a cruiser. Tonkai glanced at the bike. Actually, it's a power cruiser. Best play it cool and pretend I know something about bikes. What size engine we talking? Tonkai shrugged. Don't know. Don't know? What motorbike owner doesn't? Oh no. Tonkai walked straight past the lustrous bike and clambered into the next vehicle, if you could call it that. He leaned out the side. There's no room up front. You'll have to get in the back. Fen gawked at the three-wheeled scooter cased in a dull green and yellow body, headlight hanging off the front with its back wires on display. Is that a tuk-tuk? No, it's an auto rickshaw. More practical than any of those ridiculous bikes. Now get in. It's a bloody tuk-tuk. Fen mumbled as he sidled into the back seat, old leather squelching. He had thought, or dared to hope, that all these boxy mopeds had been destroyed in the apoc. Seemed someone didn't do a proper job. Fen was surprised to hear the old engine splutter to life. Tonkai urged the tuk-tuk forward, trundling over gravel constructed by crushing the previous buildings standing in its place. Fen dismissively surveyed his surroundings, like a surly housewife being taken out for a Sunday drive, as Tonkai weaved between converted gunships and shouting peddlers, looking comical as he raced a lumbering truck in his motorised box. Fen had to give Tonkai credit, 
they were making good pace as they darted through gaps in the crowd, leaving the larger cars in their wake. They only stopped once, when a stolen hoverback helicopter landed directly in front of them, twin rotor blades kicking up dust, and angry shouts from the shawled woman it nearly squashed. She started hurling stones from the gravel floor, pelting the cockpit where a red-faced pilot flipped her off, but refrained from exiting his protective bulletproof casing. Tonkai honked his horn, blasting an unhelpful blare into the clamour surrounding them. Fen stifled a yawn as they slipped under the hoverback's tail. You could get bored of anything if you saw it every day. They finally reached some sense of calm on the other side of the courtyard, where Tonkai parked in a much longer taxi rank, one of the few areas patrolled by Arminius's men. They were directed to a park between a hijacked NWCD patrol car and a dirty white van, the type that gave off child abduction vibes. More gravel crunched underfoot as they walked towards the keep. Three layers of walls and spiked ramparts in a classic wedding cake shape with red brick icing. No windows or peepholes occupied the ground level, but as Fen looked up at the looming battlements, he spotted various cannon and artillery protruding from between the bastions. All various makes and design. You tended not to be picky when you didn't build the weapons yourself. I sold them that one, Tonkai boasted, pointing to an anti-aircraft cannon, its four barrels protruding upwards, looking as likely to stab the air as to shoot at it. Fen was no expert, but even he knew the gun with flaking orange paint was a charger-type weapon. Good job, Fen grumbled, making sure not to ask any follow-up questions that risked starting a conversation about Tonkai's arms business. They stepped through the keep's black double doors, riddled with metal rivets and plating, and past two of Arminius's guards. They leant against the doors, blaster rifles hanging by their sides, lazily scanning the crowd. The ruckus outside shrank to idle chatter as they entered the warm air of the keep, where overhead bulbs cast a dim light on the spacious interior. Yet more red bricks lined the hallway. Arminius really did like a consistent theme. If only he cared half as much about consistent organisation, then Fen wouldn't have to wrestle through lost, jabbering crowds in the courtyard each morning. At the centre of the keep's ground level, they were presented with a five-way choice. To their left lay the corridors for the canteen and the fighting pits, to their right the brothel, and then, Fen's personal favourite, the tavern. There was a woeful lack of signs for the identical-looking corridors. They should really label the damn things and stop lost fighters and sex pests from wandering into the tavern. Fen followed Tonkai towards option number five, the stairs. They passed two more of Arminius's guards, who somehow managed to look even more bored than the pair outside. One gave him a suspicious look, but made no indication of stopping him, or of movement in general. Fen suddenly realised that he'd never been upstairs. Someone behind him must have noticed too. Oh, look at that! Fen's been promoted! Drunken jeers accompanied the taunting. Sounded like a few regulars had already beaten him to the tavern. Friends of yours? Tonkai asked accusingly, his left eye nearly collapsing into itself at such a concept. That's a generous term for them, Fen said. Without turning, he held up a solitary middle finger behind his back. That got a chorus of laughter from below, and another glare from Tonkai. They passed more doors on the first level, which must have been either executive apartments or ammunition storage for the keep's weapons. Maybe both. Finally, and with a lot less breath, they reached the top level. Before them lay another set of black doors, a pair of guards, and the famed chief's chamber within. There he is, one of the guards remarked, although Fen had no idea who he was addressing. After you, Fen said. Of course, Tonkai snapped, parading forth and thrusting open the doors. Fen had been slightly curious to see the grand ruling parliament of the Jagged Keep, only to be disappointed as usual. A table ran the length of the room, accompanied by a line of lever chairs either side of it. It was identical to every other conference room in the world, another unpleasantness that hadn't been killed off by the APOC. At least this room had windows, unlike most of the keep. Half opened onto the ruined city beyond the walls, the other half out to sea. And yep, there they are. Arminius's banner and the original symbol to represent the freelancers hung at the far end of the room, behind the head of the table. It had a grey background, with a white side profile of a skull, a gear cog sticking out of its head. The other four clan insignias, all newly commissioned within the last year, 
hung from our own banners, spread out down the sides of a room. Fan didn't give them a second glance. They displayed the epitome of pomp and personal branding that made his stomach curl. Why do they have to draw even more lines between the clans like that? His illusion of the freelancers as a united community was crumbling year on year. So far, there were only two people sitting together at the far end of the room designed for at least twenty. As he approached, Fen recognised the closer man's dark skin and short afro instantly. A few ugly bruises had blossomed on his face, where the recoiling blaster rifles hit him yesterday. Fen offered his hand. Hello again, Kofo. It's Coffee. Ah, shit. Always was terrible with names. It's good to see you, Coffee said, beaming and taking his hand. Good. At least he doesn't remember my... Fen. Damn. Why couldn't he have the courtesy to pretend he'd forgotten my name too? You're still in one piece, Fen? Hmm. Barely. I'm still a bit shaken, if I'm being honest. Coffee suddenly became serious. It was a very close call yesterday. Closer than that. After the mud demon's attack last night, Fen and Coffee hadn't stopped running until reaching the car. Fen had been jittery until driving far from the cursed block of skyscrapers, while Coffee took longer to recollect himself. He hadn't spoken until Fen dragged him from the car outside the fort's walls and told him the plan he'd whipped together. Time to see if Coffee played his part right. Do you have any idea what that thing was? Coffee asked, slight shake to his voice. That's why we're here, for others to tell us what we saw. He looked past Coffee, and a sudden pressure fell onto his shoulders as he locked eyes with Kenji Saburo, chief of the Steelbreakers. The man adjusted the spectacles, resting under his combed grey hair, soundlessly studying him. Fen's head began to churn, recalling snippets of conversation in the tavern. Saburo had a certain reputation, one that demanded respect. The obvious care he'd taken of his immaculate grey suit confirmed it. Mr. Saburo, I assume, Fen said, nodding. Nice to meet you. Saburo analysed him, probably listening for ridicule. I'd better come across as well-mannered. Fen had spent more than enough of his childhood being trained in the art of arse-kissing. Saburo finally nodded. Fen, I believe. It is nice to meet you, too. I only wished we met under more pleasant circumstances. The chief steelbreaker was very proper indeed. Saburo, Tonkai said as he trudged past. Fen, don't forget who you're here with. Fen smiled apologetically and followed Tonkai, admiring how someone could be so oblivious to established niceties. Or maybe he just didn't care. Fen took a seat at the table to Tonkai's left and directly across from Coffee and Saburu. It was one of those tables that disguised itself as being constructed from light brown wood to hide the cheap chipping stuffed inside. Just like any other conference room. Coffee and Saburu whispered in hushed tones across the table. Whispering. What a pain. Fen found it hard to hear what was being said, even when he was the recipient of such murmurings. Still, hushed tones were better than none. Tonkai sat wordlessly next to him, ignoring everyone in the room, buried in his smart gauntlet, and Fen crossed his arms, simmering at the silent treatment. Brisk steps began to trickle in from outside. The doors barely had time to crack open before the room's next visitor proclaimed, Hello, hello! How are we all doing? A small, thick-set woman waddled into the room, head bobbing above the chairs. Half-grumbled responses greeted her. Good, good. She didn't really seem to care. Fen searched vague recollections of whom the woman, a bit older than himself, and her clan might be. She passed by the two steelbreakers and sat at the head of the table, between Saburo and Tonkai. Sitting underneath the banner, with a skull and its gear cog cap, the woman's identity suddenly clicked. Marie, second in command to Arminius and their clan, the gearheads. It seemed the rumours of Marie taking over as de facto caretaker of the freelancers weren't as absurd as Fen had thought. So, Marie said, glancing at her gauntlet without opening it. The time shone on the gauntlet's outer screen as she did, resting atop the closed lid. We're still waiting for Hilda? Let's start without her, Tonkai said, snapping his own gauntlet shut. 
It's her fault she's late. Marie leant against the table, propping her head on her meaty clenched fist. She looked Tonkai up and down from beneath her shock of neck-length silver hair, fringe cast to one side. I take it Billy and Oscar are busy, then? Fenn had to stop himself from laughing. The skin beneath Tonkai's stubble reddened. I'll have you know, Marie, that I'm just as qualified at running our clan. Very gracious of Tonkai, saying our instead of my. Uh Uh-huh. Marie glanced away, much to Tonkai's obvious annoyance. Glad to see you made it, Mr. Saburu. Saburu, quiet and measured. Of course, this is a very serious matter, of which Coffee is keen to clarify. Coffee! Marie leaned back in the chair, arms spread on its rests. You were one of the men on patrol? Coffee's eyes were darting, frantically analysing the room, in the same way he had done in the ruined reception lobby. He straightened. What? Oh, yes, yes. The patrol gave me quite a scare. You could say I was terrified. He smiled and winked, as if he'd told some in the no joke. Fenn couldn't figure out the man's thoughts. Everything about Coffee's words and expressions seemed a minute off. So I hear. And the other man? Dead. Yes, very dead. The one who didn't die? Oh, Fenn! Huh. He wasn't as scared as me, I believe. Coffee laughed and winked again. Why does he keep winking? Fenn, was it? Fenn stiffened as Marie looked his way. She had one of those staring sets of eyes, but wasn't scared of holding long gazes. I've heard your name before. You're one of those wasters in the pub, aren't you? Good to see my reputation hasn't failed me. Someone's got to keep the owners in business, Fenn said. He was saved the effort of chuckling to fill the silence by Coffee, who boomed with laughter, far too loud considering the tame joke. Marie lounged in her chair, waiting for Coffee's echoing chortle to finish. Witty as well? I can see why you're in Billy's clan. Fenn refrained from mentioning that he'd never met his own clan chief, Billy. After all, the Kruvers were the second biggest clan in the Freelancers, and that meant having several hundred members in its ranks. Of course, Fenn preferred the anonymity. To his relief, Marie's penetrating stare swivelled to the chamber's opening doors. This meeting was meant to be kept small? The other clans have two members present, so it's only fair I bring a second. After all, it seems I'm short one man. Fenn had no trouble identifying this newcomer. Hilda Roth, chief of the Hollowcloaks. Her long red hair winnowed about her sour face as she snapped her gaze from one man to the next before settling on Marie. The woman was standing, but her head barely came over the table. And he'd fought Marie on the short side. Hilda must have been at least head and shoulders shorter than Fenn. Starting a little early, aren't we? I don't see why. You can't get anything done right without me. Hilda's physical size was minuscule compared to her attitude. Says the one who's late, Marie replied distractedly. Now hurry and sit so we can get this show on the road. What's your words? These men have killed one of my own. I demand. Yes, yes, we're getting to that. Marie started clicking her fingers, bracelets on her arm jangling. Come on now, quick meeting's a good meeting. Not many people got away with talking to Hilda like that. Fenn had to admire Marie's imperative manner, and he had to admire himself for knowing a word as fancy as imperative. Hilda narrowed her eyes and flared her nose at Marie. She stubbornly looked away like a petulant child, lips pursed and strode to the chair next to Coffee. She sat herself rather close to the nervous-looking man. "'What's wrong?' she asked, leaning across and nearly biting Coffee's face off as she spoke. "'If you've done nothing wrong, then there's no need to look so scared!' Fenn was amazed such a scant, pale woman could produce so much noise. "'Thank goodness she didn't sit on my side of the...' A figure fudded into the chair on Fenn's left. He slowly turned and had to resist pushing away from the table, gliding to safety on his wheelie chair from the huge, glaring man. Where Hilda had been small, this man was the opposite, excessively so. At least a head, no, two heads taller than Fenn. The man's black, bald scalp glistened with sweat, and two rings of white poked out from the surrounding dark skin in a beam far more intense than Marie's. You've heard of me. The rumbling words vibrating around Fenn were stated, not asked. It took a great deal of effort for Fenn to appear calm, as if he was accustomed to conversing with giants that looked like they wanted to tear his head off. 
I might have. You're Bingo, aren't you? Master of the fighting pits, or whatever's written on that sparkly belt. Bingo leant forward, and Fenn willed himself to stay stationary, hoping his bobbing Adam's apple wasn't too noticeable. I have to say, I'm surprised to see you with your chest actually covered for once. Bingo paused his snarling and stared down at his green and brown camo shirt, taken aback by the comment on his clothes, just as Fenn hoped. Outlandish phrases proved remarkably helpful in throwing someone's anger. Bingo's head whipped back up. Want to see me shirtless? Then let us fight. In the pit! And show off my own hairy chest. I wouldn't want to subject you to such an ungainly sight. Bingo was interrupted before he could respond. Back off you! Only grown-ups can speak at this table. Tonkai, always the diplomat. What did you say? Bingo leapt up, a landslide in reverse. Bingo! Hilda growled warningly. Tonkai rose to the challenge, making up for the smaller height by squaring his shoulders and puffing out his chest. Fan shrank in his chair. He always got a shit hand in long-tabled seating arrangements. Enough! A hand cracked on the table. Everyone looked to Saburo, a furnace burning in his eyes. You are both acting disgraceful. Show some decorum to one another. Fight if you insist, but do it outside, in the proper fashion, like gentlemen. Gentle was the last word you could attach to this pair, but still, they settled back down, Tonkai with the most indignant glower now. Fen sighed. He should have chosen the seat next to the exit. Marie still lounged in her chair, elbow nestled on the left rest to support the hand resting against her face. She nodded her thanks to Saburo, whose eyes had already settled back to cam pools underneath the surface of his glasses. Now then, dicks properly measured, how about we get started? Started? Hilda asked. Without Arminius? He's still in charge, is he not? Arminius won't be joining us. He's currently... Marie waved her hand through the air, fishing for the right word. Unavailable. Not to mention madder than a Mercurian plant worker. A few eyes shifted around the room, leaving a pause. No one raised further objections to their glorious leader's absence. After all, it meant one less raving lunatic to deal with. Marie filled the silence by tapping the console built into the right armrest of her swivel chair. A blob of white light sprang into existence, mid-air above the table. Fan swore and jumped back from the sudden apparition, earning a chuckle from coffee. He squinted at the dazzling floating light and trailed his eyes down to the table's inbuilt projector. What's that supposed to be? Tonkai complained. Bear with, bear with, Marie tapped the console. The brightness is too high. The image darkened to form distinct white lines, morphing into rectangles, and finally a jumble of skyscrapers hovering above the table. A highly built-up city block. Coffee whistled. Can you change the colour as well? I wish. This projector was appropriated. Mary waved her hand dismissively. From some faction or other. Whoever uses white colours. Reformists, Tonkai grunted. And I've got the best weapons, if you're interested. Marie wasn't. Well, there you go. And what city, exactly, are we looking at? Thank goodness Tonkai wasn't afraid to utter the very question Fen felt too self-conscious to ask in front of this unsympathetic gathering. He copied the smug looks Hilda and Bingo swapped over the table, abruptly dropping the smirk when Tonkai glanced his way. It's this city. Marie flourished one of her many waves towards the row of windows facing the island. The wall's red bricks blocked most of the view, but the tips of a few taller skyscrapers peeked over the spiky top, looking in much worse condition than their counterparts glowing above the projector. This is the last model of the city mapped before the Apoch, so you can ignore that whole section. Marie gestured at a clump of towers that only resembled the fort's current position due to the three skyscrapers that currently overlooked Fenn's deluxe bedroom complex. He recognised a few of the more intact buildings from his patrols of the city, dotted in various places, but other than that, the map was next to useless. Most of the buildings had either been destroyed or massively damaged, and Vanver was the clutter of demolished roads and wrecks, especially the massive spydroid in the centre of the city, that were absent from the image. Everyone still stared at the hologram, as if something else was going to happen, so Fan took an opportunity to speak, eager to get the meeting over with. Can I propose explaining my side of the story first? Propose? Tonkai spat. What is this? A bloody court hearing? 
Whose side is he on, anyway? I agree, Bingo chimed in from Fen's other side. This man cannot be trusted. Who's he agreeing with? No one mentioned my trustworthiness. So what? I'm not allowed to speak? You? Ideally, no. Oh, great. Now Hilda's joining in on the witch hunt. Then what am I supposed to... Might I propose? Coffee, speak first. It seems the easiest way to cross this impasse. Saburu, with no great effort, had captured everyone's agreement. Even Tonkai nodded, seemingly happy with Saburu's use of the word propose. The favouritism amongst this lot was unbelievable. Fan fumed as Marie spoke. So then, Coffee, seems you're going first. Hopefully Coffee followed the plan laid out for him yesterday, otherwise they were both screwed. Marie flipped open her gauntlet. According to the guards, you reported to the Eastern Gate at 1627. The three of you were checking for gunship activity in the eastern part of the city. While stopping for lunch, you were attacked by a... mud monster. Mud demon. Marie shot Fen a glare before continuing. This monster proceeded to not only kill Bram, but also apprehend... She paused. Apprehend? Seriously? I thought the word provided some nice ceremony to the story. To apprehend three blaster rifles, two cases of blaster cells, and one sentimentally valued coat. Hopefully someone's going to refund me for it. Now! Marie whipped her arm back, snapping the gauntlet shut. The guards reported you both reeked of booze. You were on the drink, during patrol, despite Arminius's recent orders? You mean morally bankrupt prohibition? Fenn caught Coffee's eye, cast the briefest of nods. Coffee sat up, and despite only wearing a t-shirt, pulled at its loose neckline as if to relieve some stress. Drink? Yes, well, I'm not going to deny that we might have partaken in the substance. Coffee glanced over again. But I did not bring any alcohol myself. In fact, the only one who brought a drink was Bram. Fenn refrained from whipping. He insisted but we take some of his drink, or else he'd hit us! Bullshit! Bingo rained his fist on the table, coffee the new focus of his fiery hatred. Bram would never have done such a thing! Coffee avoided the man's gaze, staring resolutely at the White City. Patrolling that ghostly city can change even the greatest of men. What a great saying. Fen was glad he'd given it to coffee yesterday. Hilda shot Coffee a glare that could cut diamonds. You're taking the piss telling us that shit. All right, Hilda, you try writing a better line. Fen, Marie inquired. He'd rarely had a more uncomfortable spotlight shone on him. Well, to be honest, I did see a new side of Bram yesterday. And as much as I hate to say it, if I didn't have a sip of his flask, I'm pretty sure Bram would have ripped off my beard and shoved it down my throat. Hmm, Saburu murmured, taken aback by the colourful revelation. It's a shame he didn't, you lying sack of shit. Fen wasn't winning any points with Hilda today. He held up his hands. As Coffee said, patrol changes. Hilda was past the point of listening. She leaned across the table, hands bunched into little fists. We all know who really brought drink out with Fen. She glanced down at Fen's open jacket and wrinkled her nose. Clearly someone wasn't a fan of the I Heart NW shirt. You can take the man out of the tavern, but he'll still be a useless drunk. How had all the freelancer chiefs pegged him as a tavern local? He'd always thought these people stayed holed away in their respective clan headquarters, drinking expensive wine and eating fish eggs, or whatever it was fancy people did nowadays. Let's stop talking about who got who drunk. We already know the answer to that. What I want to know is... Why did you kill Bram? Did Billy tell you to do it? Watch it, Tonkai snarled. We didn't do anything to him. It was Fen's turn to raise his voice. It was the Mud Demon. Mud Demon? Hilda shook her head, red hair swinging hypnotically. Some creature just appeared, covered in mud, and killed Bram? Yes. It stabbed and strangled him right in front of us. We shot it. Twice. Then the creature collapsed and got back up again with these demonic blue eyes. Like a picture right out of a horror book. Ask Coffee. I can still hear him quaking in his boots. 
Huh? Two shots, Bingo snorted. Nonsense. No one could survive that. Well, like I said, this thing did. Then where is this creature? Hilda asked, sitting back in her chair and crossing her arms. Fenn resisted the urge to look under the table and see if her feet actually touched the floor. My man only got there late in the morning because you pair conveniently forgot where you abandoned Bram, leaving plenty of time for this boogeyman of yours to escape. I can never remember where I end up in that damn city, and Coffee's gauntlet was... I'm not finished. Cheeky bitch. You're asking us to accept your words after giving me no reason to trust you. Well, how can I... When you know that things here are already at a critical tension. That has nothing to do with... And now you're going to blame me for being suspicious of one of my top men being killed in the presence of two rival clans? What kind of inquiry is this anyway? Are we just going back and forth for fun now? We're getting nowhere. I agree, Marie cut in. Tonkai, do you have something to add? Oh no, don't get him involved. Let's see, Tonkai said, slowly stroking his chin, savouring the limelight. I've had a few cases like this during my time, selling weapons. Fan rolled his eyes and heard Coffee snicker across the table at his exasperation. Even Saburo let out an annoyed sigh. Officially, or at least between parties big enough to call themselves official, factions could not directly sell to one another. That's where Tonkai came in, acting as a middleman for weapons and ammunition between the bigger factions down south, skimming a profit off the top in the process. An impressive feat to be sure, and the very reason he'd bought such a high position within the Kruvers. However, Tonkai managed to ruin any good reputation gained from this venture by mentioning his trade in every other conversation. Between meals and calls, from orders given to news delivered, Tonkai always found time to describe exactly how well his wares were selling and how his list of contacts flourished, transforming his respectable accomplishment into a running joke, shared amongst everyone at the fort, apart from himself. When parties disagreed on something the other had been accused of, Tonkai continued, oblivious to the derision, we settled the issue by finding evidence, for without evidence, everything is just hearsay. Good for Tonki, outlining the most basic precedent of any legal proceeding. Why is Coffee nodding along with that admiring look, as if Tonki's banal observation is a slice of sagely revelation? Very well then. Saburu took his glasses off and rubbed at the already spotless lenses. If what Coffee and Fen say is true, then we must find this mud-clad attacker and deal with the threat. And if we find nothing, we shall reconvene under new light, where calmer tempers will prevail. Fine, but be ready, Saburo, because if there's no demon, the new steelbreakers and the Kruvers will have to pay. Saburo wordlessly met Hilda's gaze. Does that work for you? Marie asked Tonki. Yes. As if Tonki has the authority to speak for the Kruvers. Great. Then Fen and Coffee will take part in the search and tell us if we've found our mysterious mud friend. Looks like they weren't getting a say in the matter. Marie tapped the console built into her chair's arm, and the map, still hovering above the table, enlarged and split into two copies, flipping so both sides of the room were treated to a bird's eye view of the city streets. Ah, Coffee marvelled. I thought that might be for more than just a light show. Shush. Now. I say we send out three groups to search the city from east to west. One group takes the northern sweep, one in the middle, and one south. Marie dragged her finger across the console's touchscreen, drawing three lines on the hologram to illustrate her point. Fenn didn't like the image. Even with drone assistance, those three lines still left a lot of ground uncovered. And if we don't find the demon? Well, that's not good news for you, is it? If those two are coming on the search... Bingo said. Then I insist I lead the party with both of them in it. New rules are in place. As long as every party has members from each of the top three clans, that's fine by me. What? Join a party led by this vindictive tank of a man? Surely that was a joke gone wrong. Fen gave Tonkai an appealing look, but his compassionate boss only shrugged. I approve, as long as I lead one of the other parties. Typical. 
Fenn wished everyone would stop saying parties, as if giving the task of searching for a blood-crazed maniac in an abandoned city a fun festive bow. Mr. Saburu, can one of your lot lead the third party? Good. Then shall we begin the search at dawn? Rising at dawn would be a pain in the ass, but if he started getting up earlier each morning, then by next week, what date? Tomorrow. Tomorrow! Fenn exclaimed. A set of unimpressed faces turned to him. Is that a problem, Fenn? Marie asked, in a tone that said it better not be. Not at all, Fenn grumbled, cursing the productive side of these higher-ups. I'll just have to make some extra arrangements. I'll have to drink a pint of water before bed to quell tomorrow's hangover. Make sure you do. Right, then. If that's us, shall I call this meeting over? Over? No one had even mentioned the gunship spotting. The one that started this whole debacle in the first place. Oh well. Fem was as eager to get away as the currently departing clan chiefs. He turned to leave and found his path blocked by Bingo, who grinned down at him with teeth alone. See you tomorrow. Friend. Fenn shook his head as the massive bulking back muscles thudded away. If that man was a metre shorter, and I a metre taller, then... he'd still win in a fight. Coffee! Fenn called as the rest of the room filed out the door. Coffee turned, one eyebrow raised. Fancy heading for a drink? The man beckoned, and Fenn, who was already next to him, awkwardly sidled closer. Coffee leaned in with a stern look. I'm afraid I can't, Fen, he said in a sinister tone. Maybe he was angry at the lies Fen had forced him to be a part of. Coffee took a deep breath, and suddenly broke into a large, shining smile. I quit alcohol. Fen gasped. He had been right about the sinister intention. Quit? You were drinking enough... Fenn caught sight of Hilda and Bingo still close by, and leant in, matching Coffee's conspiratorial distance. You were drinking enough yesterday. I know, Coffee whispered, placing a hand on Fenn's shoulder. I also quit yesterday. After that whole Bram incident, I've decided to take a new path. Don't tell me you've turned to religion. Coffee leant back and gave a booming laugh. No, no, Fenn! I'm going to run. Run? Yes, every day, around the fort, maybe even outside it. I'm off for a jog right now. It gives you an appreciation for your surroundings and all the secrets they contain. Even in this shithole? Fenn asked, half jokingly, half truthfully. Even in shit, there are kernels of corn to be found. What a disgusting analogy. Another laugh. I encourage you to come along, Fen. It's time to take care of our bodies. We're not so young anymore, you and I. You barely look twenty-five, Fen muttered as Coffee hurried towards Saburu's stern look from the corridor. What was with him? One near-death experience, and Coffee had become a reformed man. If Fen did the same, he'd be a bloody saint by now. But that would run the risk of having an airport named after him. And who the hell wanted that on their reputation? Chapter 9 Fruits of Freedom The sun was settling down to sleep for the night, pulling a red cover over the listless town, inviting it to join in its slumber. Amelia would have loved to doze with it. She'd been awake the whole night driving, and the day walking, wearing down her shoes until the soles started to flap and twist with every step. She couldn't stop, not before reaching the patchwork town of orange sands and grey cracked roads she didn't know the name of. The first sand-blasted wooden husks of housing were within throwing distance, nestled against the brown speckled cliffs that had beckoned to her all day. The layer of sweat clinging to Amelia turned from moist and sticky to cold and clammy. The sinking sun was taking back the heat it had lent to the dry air, in the same way Hawker took his money back from spectators in Sawtooth's Rock. Only a different kind of red came out when he collected. At least her burning skin had been soothed by the sunscreen from the men in the ship. Amelia still couldn't figure out what they were after. Maybe they were luring her into a trap, waiting to be sprung in the Lugo apartments. What choice did she have but to continue? There was no other option. 
Nowhere to walk to. Nowhere that she knew of. Luckily, she'd been to the apartments before, remembered the layout. She would grab more supplies, slip away when the men showed, and start her true journey. A chain-link fence came into view, its curly barbed wire top poking above the low square buildings, blushing in the sunset. The Lugo Apartments. It was plopped right in the middle of town. The fence encasing the apartment's open top floor where lights already shone from the residents' tents, demanding attention against the darkening sky. Amelia lowered her head and focused forward. She'd managed to open her bruised eye in the last few hours. It smarted, but at least she could get a better view of the town sliding by. There were few people wandering the streets, more just sitting around doing nothing. She made sure not to look too long at anyone. Voices shouted from surrounding houses, a ship's engine rumbled overhead, and a truck suddenly rolled past, nearly squashing her on the narrow street, as it carried supplies towards the ramshackle tents and shops inside the apartments. Amelia heard the apartments had once been called a car park, but she dismissed that as a joke. Who would make a park for cars to hang out in? She had to get to the apartments quickly, couldn't spend the night outside with these people lurking in the shadows. A lot of them weren't here to trade. Plundering and raiding was a main pastime in no man's land. Amelia rounded an abandoned car dealership, and there it was. The Lugo Apartments. Lights and torches shining from the gaps between the concrete floors, pockmarked by pillars, all fenced in with gates and mesh. Another cage. The lines of light stretched across the empty space between the apartments and the buildings, started to lurch from side to side with each step. Amelia realised she was limping, left leg flagging, ankles chafing from her shoes' bite. So close. Amelia left the creeping shadows of the last buildings, apartments climbing higher and higher as she exposed herself to its light and humming generators, shouting men, screaming children, upbeat music, shutting gates. A metal grid was slowly lowering, another portacully, like the rocks, about to seal off the apartments from the desert, and her with it. She started walking faster, faster, ran, ignoring the limp that grated with each jolt. So close! Ten meters! Five! Shocked faces looked out. She didn't care. The gates hit the sand with a thud at the same time as Amelia lunged, whacking her shoulder against one of the bars and sprawling onto the dirt. On the wrong side of the metal. She was becoming sick of shoving her face into the sand. She clutched her shoulder, worrying it had popped loose again, felt the pounding of blood already gathering under her fingers. She picked her face up and crawled to the nearest bar, gripped it and pulled. Her mind flashed back to the rock, in the same position, tugging and yanking. Metal bars, the most horrible invention in history. Amelia pulled again, gaining the same results as she usually did. Tears and frustration. Although these bars had big gaps, her son had had flung through the gate to land safely on the other side. Maybe she could join it, if she just angled her body and squeezed. Back from the gate. I said back. Curfew's in effect. Won't be open till morning. Emilia squirmed out of the gate's grip and stared at the moustached face looming above. His mouth dropped when she turned her face to him. My God. Her vision was smeared with tears, but she saw the pistol in the man's hand. Are you okay? Hey! Amelia reached through the bars and grabbed her hat, picked up her bag, and sprinted back the way she'd come, not giving the man a chance to shoot. She rubbed her eyes and held back the tears, limp really starting to hurt. She returned to the expanding shadows, becoming engulfed in the dark alleys and echoing shouts of the desert town. The sun had been dead for hours, and in its absence, the town had come alive. The desert dwellers of no man's land emerged from their shelter to enjoy the night's coolness and each other's drunken madness. Scraps of music and chatter drifted from the apartments, ships clanged onto empty roofs, and trucks hissed as they screeched around corners and braked short of hitting the children running through the streets, horns blaring at their jackal-like laughter. 
Amelia pulled the blanket closer to her, frayed edges tickling at her chin. She kept a sleepy, unbruised eye on the doorway, its gaping shadow a shade lighter than the black around it. She huddled in the darkest corner of the room, on top of a dust mattress stuffed with rubble. She had swaddled herself in the blanket and squirmed in the pile of debris, trying to steal some comfort by moulding the loose stones around her. She sat frozen, not daring to move, and drew in the makeshift bed. The holster and pistol sat outside of her cocoon, within easy reach. Even an empty gun was better than none. Amelia kept telling herself this was perfectly warm and cosy. Only her body told her the hallowed cask of a house was freezing and miserable. But if she thought the opposite, then maybe her mind would believe the lie. Her fingertips and toes were chilly, and her skin still burned, only somewhat soothed by the lotion she'd rubbed on, adding to the sand, grime, sweat, and dried blood coating her. Like a slab of cold meat wrapped in dirty, boiling bacon. She didn't even want to dwell on the matted mess of knots that had replaced her hair. A chorus of ferocious barks exploded a few streets away. A set of voices shouted back, and Amelia heard the thumping of stones being thrown at the fighting animals. Street dogs. She was terrified of dogs. They could detect her fear better than any human. Never had met one that didn't want to growl and bite at her. She pulled the blanket even tighter. Her feet popped out the end, brushing the dust crumbs that formed one end of her bed frame. It was impossible to tell the time. Amelia had no smart gauntlet, no gauge on how slowly her waking mind crawled through the night, on how many more hours there were to endure. She nearly laughed out loud at how hopeless the situation was, but stopped herself when she remembered the skulking men on the streets outside. There had been a few of them as Amelia snuck back, and sure enough, they all had guns. It would be weird not to have one in no man's land. Her shoulder ached and throbbed from where she'd bashed it against the gate, but the pain was almost pleasant. It demanded attention, distracting from everything else. If only she'd been a minute quicker, then she would have gotten inside the apartments, safe with the tents and refugees. Well, not exactly safe, still amongst outcasts and thieves, but better than out here, where the more violent types lingered. Amelia shivered, despite the lack of another windy draught. The wave of bars of the apartments came down, sealing everyone inside, just like the cages in the rock. She'd been so keen to be locked in again, to run away from one enclosure and throw herself into the next. Not exactly the path she'd been hoping for. Where were the green fields and comfortable beds? The plentiful food, fashionable clothes, and kind men. All the things the woman at the rock had promised her. None of it was here. There was only one place that resembled the woman's fairy tales. The place she'd been aiming for all along. Shankmora. The city brimming with palm trees, white beaches, and bright blue water. She'd travelled to it on a ferry, freed from the main slab of no man's land by the ocean. Amelia had only been there once, for the briefest of times, but she'd never forgot what happened. It was a few years ago when she'd walked that sandy, straw-strewn street, lit by flickering orange torchlight and the moon's pale, waxy rays. Quidel had never been more than a step away from her, not that she'd considered running. Not that time. She'd been too scared of the people. So many of them. Hundreds. Maybe more. And these people had been strange, singing off-tune songs, arguing in slurred, happy voices. Shouting, not in anger, but just because they could. Some danced next to large boxes, tumbling music out onto the street. Smoking and cursing, kissing and chatting. It wasn't the acts that had shocked her. It was the way no one seemed to care about what anyone else did. And weirdest of all, the women were doing it too, smiling and talking with one another, sharing drinks and chortles of laughter. No collars, no chains, no owners. 
free to do as they pleased, completely in control of their own worlds. That was what scared her most of all. Were they really the same species? Hawker had been with them. Amelia remembered because he'd annoyed Quidel. Right, good luck with the job. I'm off to conduct business with my drunken clientele. It was only later that Amelia found out the city was celebrating something called Independence Day. Hawker, don't you dare! Ah, fuck it. Come on, Fuse. It wasn't the first time someone had disobeyed Quidel. Made her realise, despite how much she said it, Quidel wasn't all-powerful. Only Sawtooth was truly unstoppable. They'd taken her beyond the huts and bonfires to a quieter side street, where a single man stood with his back to them, pissing against a wall. Amelia was more used to that. Right, come here! Quidel turned and knelt. He'd changed since that night, when his mohawk was shorter and his skin smoother. She'd changed too. Back then, her body was still developing, breasts and hips still growing, and she felt embarrassed as Quidel scanned her, looking at the faded blouse and torn skirt they'd dressed her in. Looks good to me. Fuse leered from behind, fat tongue lapping. Shut up! Now, girly... You need to be convincing here, so I need you to look sad. Real. Wow. She's a good actor, she is. Amelia hadn't been acting. She'd let her mask drop, and they'd actually been paying attention for once. Good. Now listen. I need you to do everything like we said. Got it? Quidel had never sounded so pleading before. She'd almost expected him to say please. If you do this right, you'll make Master Sawtooth proud. But if not, you'll be very disappointed. Understand? She hadn't been given permission to speak, so she only nodded. Of course she had. She knew Quidel was manipulating her, but that didn't matter. There was no way she'd let Sawtooth down. I said fuck off. Can you not? The man who opened the door faltered. He glanced around the empty alley, looked back down at her. What are you, a stray? Amelia tilted her head, slightly to the side like she'd been taught. Let the fear on her face speak for itself. She had plenty to display. What's the matter? Don't understand me? You got a translator? She didn't react to the words like she'd been told, just gave him another baffled look. Guess not. Be too easy if you did, wouldn't it? Well, shit. He was slightly tubby, the eyebrows meeting in the middle, but his face had been honest, quick to display a pitying mouth and concerned lines on his forehead. Why did she always remember this part so well? Oh, I don't know what to do with you. He gritted his teeth and started shifting his weight from one leg to the other, looked along the alleyway again. She had tried to look away from his face, from the worried eyes and spread of whiskers around his jaw. Had tried not to memorise this, but that only made the memory stick harder. Well, perhaps I could. Oh, fuck, this is risky. Had to happen on my shift too, didn't it? He was hesitating. She'd been instructed what to do if this happened. Amelia cast her eyes to the ground, turned on her heel, and began slouching away. Ah, oh, fucking wait! Wait, wait, wait! What's right? Back here. Might as well come in. The inside light jumped out of the doorway and into the alleyway to greet her. The next bit was less vivid. Maybe this part didn't need to be relived so much because watching the man struggle with his emotions, choosing to take her side, was the part Amelia really hated. The rest was decided as soon as he opened the door into that house, filled with the weird-smelling packages. Only one other thing stood out, just because of how unusual it was. The object she'd used to bash the man's head in and smash apart the soupy insides. It had been heavy and solid, a metal model of a purple-hooded figure holding a curved blade. Amelia asked the woman later, amongst the darkness and whispers, what the figure meant. They had begrudgingly told her, the Grim Reaper of Death.
A shot banged in the night, and Amelia jumped in her blankets, ruining the shaped bed of rubble. The sound faded, and panicked shouts, louder than ever, took back control. Mind present again, Amelia felt the fresh tears on her face. Dared not wipe them away and disturb her semi-sleepiness any more. She was annoyed at the damp cheeks. She'd escaped the rock, not only to get away from the men, but also from these memories. Away from the unseen army of regrets, waiting to drag her down until she no longer wanted to move. Why had her mind wandered along that path again? Shankamora. There'd been death and suffering, and it hadn't felt right, killing that man. The same way it hadn't felt right killing Green. At least there had been less death and more joy in some parts of that rickety city. People living completely different lives, far away from Sawtooth's men. Free girls and women wandering around as they pleased. That's what fascinated Amelia. It had formed her picture of liberty. Instead, a lonely game of survival awaited, scrabbling from one cage to the next to avoid the flatness and death of the desert. She could choose to follow along or die. Only the strong got to truly roam as they pleased out here, and without any ammunition, she was no match for the desert thugs. Amelia's throat gulped and stuck, parched. She risked moving an arm from under the blankets to take a sip of water from the depleting bottle. Made her think of the two men that had given it to her. Kind men. The woman had promised they existed, but Amelia found that to be the most ambitious promise of all. Even more ludicrous than the floating fortresses and megacities to the south. Maybe the ones who'd given her supplies in the desert weren't so bad. And what they'd said about Rusk. Was she free because of these men? Maybe she should have talked, given them that little in return. It seemed people did that whenever they pleased out here. She had gone through all the effort to get here. How much harder could it be to open her mouth? Amelia knew it actually wouldn't be easy at all, but right now she was content with lying to herself. The action many hours away from her fantasies in bed. It made her feel a little better. Gave her something to cling on to, throughout a night where there was nothing else. Chapter 10 A Cold Morning He could curse the ungodly time he had woken. The cold, the mist, the hangover, walking through this forsaken city again, he could curse it all. But right now, Fen only had energy to curse the worse aspect. The company. Everyone back there, keep up! Especially you. Bingo narrowed his eyes at Fen before turning back down the road, forging a path of whacked branches and thickets with his gun's bayonet. Last night's rain had served another platter of moisture to coat every surface for the early morning, and Fenn's trousers were slurping up the leftovers. Legs soaked through to the thighs. His wet socks encouraged extra soggy thoughts. Why did Bingo say, especially you? It wasn't like he was falling behind their jolly party of eight members. There were two people behind him already. Why me? Fenn asked, his voice clapping from a row of plastic road dividers. Kofai, who'd been ogling every wreckage of skyscraper creeping past, didn't seem too concerned of his plight. Why me what? Why is it me Bingo's picking on? I can understand he's pissed off his friend died, but how come he's not giving you any flack? You know, this would be a great area for a run, Kofai said. I reckon it's because he sat next to me in yesterday's meeting. The only problem is all these potholes and plants would get in the way of a good track. I mean, if he'd sat on the other side of the table, say next to you, I bet he wouldn't give a damn about me. He's just taking his anger out on whoever happens to be in the line of fire. Actually, I need some better trainers before I even think about making it out this far. My current pair keep giving me blisters. Why are you talking about trainers? I'm dealing with a genuine dilemma here. I can't have Bingo out to get me. It's too much hassle having enemies. Would you stop moaning? You're giving me a headache. No one said you had to catch up and listen. Fen snapped at the newcomer. Kofai gasped. Fen! I thought you didn't want any more enemies. I don't. 
Then why are you insulting the broken hand? Who's a broken hand? That would be me. Fenn gave a proper look at the new man walking to his right. Dirty blonde hair sat atop a blocky head and a bulging set of muscle, obvious even underneath the thick fur-lined coat. The man wasn't naturally large like Bingo. In fact, he was the same slightly underwhelming height as Fenn, but his torso ballooned way out of proportion to the rest of him like a bodybuilder's. I see a scar. Fenn nodded towards the gnarly line running the length of the man's face, partly obscured behind a pair of dark wraparound shades. But no broken hand. The man lifted the arm hidden by his right side, revealing a metal clamp with three serrated prongs in place of his hand. Well, that'll do it. You should stop complaining, the broken hand said, in an accent far too reminiscent of Tonkai's. Fixating on such small things distracts from real problems. Problems like that one? Fen motioned towards the assault rifle strapped to the broken hand's back. Don't tell me that fires ordinary bullets. So what if it does? I don't need to carry a blaster rifle if we're dealing with just one man. Seemed Fen was right about him being a bodybuilder. Why else would someone carry around such an outdated and heavy weapon? Don't underestimate this one man. He's a demon that's already survived a match with a proper weapon. Your pea shooter's not gonna do a thing. The metal hand, was that his name? Snorted. If he's really as strong as you say he is, then she'll deal with it. Who? Hey. Wow. A woman with sharp angled features had emerged on the other side of Kofai, stomping along at the edge of their little group. She looked to come from the same gym as her buddy, but with extra height to complete the package. And, just to go the extra mile, a massive blaster launcher sat atop her shoulder. The tubular launcher was easily three times the size of Fenn's comparatively piddly BR-16. You're a bloody big one, Fenn remarked. Carrying that thing for both of you? The short-haired woman shot him a glare. Be careful, Fenn, Kofai whispered. They're both ex-frontliners. Frontliners? Fenn hadn't met many of the only people crazy enough in the freelancer ranks to take contracts fighting on the front lines for warring factions. She's the strong hand, Kofai added. Just how many damn hands are there? Only us two. Enough to keep an eye on you. She spoke with a blunt accent, far too reminiscent of... Ah, shit. You work for him, don't you? That twitchy-eyed bastard. Tonkai, yes. We are his hands. Fen grimaced. I always thought Tonkai's hands was some shit band he tried putting together. Keep making your little jokes. The hook hand again. But make sure your business isn't so funny. We've got our eyes on you. Join the club. Fen quickened his pace, putting distance between him and the trio, sticking his foot in a muddy puddle in the process. What a horrible morning this was turning out to be, and soon they'd arrive at the city central square where the infamous spy droid lay. Hardly a pleasant prospect, having to walk by that creepy hunk of long-dead metal. Three people were ahead of Fem, circling a vine-tangled bus. Bengo's massive frame was obvious enough, but he didn't recognise the bald, tanned man or the white-cloaked figure walking next to him. How had the person with the white cloak managed to avoid getting a single splatter of mud on themselves? Fen felt his own shoes being weighed down by the wet, squelching clumps clinging to his soles. And why were there only three people ahead of him? Was there not eight people in the... Fen! He jumped from the man who'd soundlessly slivered next to him. He wished people would stop surprising him like that. Didn't help that this man already knew his name. Hi. Fen realised he didn't recognise the man. Someone else he must have forgotten. Sorry, I can't remember your name. Oh, don't worry. I know who you are, but I assure you, we've never met. Fen glanced sideways at the man. Took in the smart shirt, well-kempt hair, and crisp winter jacket. You're well-dressed for a stalker. The man let out a soft chuckle. 
If you consider the gathering of information to be stalking, then I suppose you can call me a master of it. So you're a master stalker, then? Another chuckle. No, no. My name is Massif, and I, Fen, am going to change your life. From the black, someone spoke. Can you hear me? You need to wake up. All that pain and darkness. He must have died and passed on to the afterlife. To be greeted by God, or maybe multiple gods. He had looked forward to finding out if there was some other place waiting after death. Somewhere he'd been sending so many others. Wake up! Michael sat up, the shout ringing in his ears. He stared, but couldn't see anything. He hadn't expected the total nothingness of the next stage. Perhaps this was purgatory. Was it meant to be this cold and so... rusty smelling? I can hear someone approaching. Judging from the rhythm of footsteps, these are no wandering strays. The mysterious being inhabiting this realm had a strange way of talking. It slightly echoed in an otherworldly fashion, as Michael would have imagined, but with a harsh and unfriendly male voice. I had to wake you early before the final calibrations were completed, so you'll have to make do. Calibrations? What god talked about calibrations? Get up! You have to get higher and find a vantage point. Hello? Michael said aloud. His voice bounced and flared around the empty space, gravity to its presence. Not like the other voice, devoid of echoes. Where are you? Inside your head. God? I'm flattered at the presupposition, but I'm afraid I'm just as capable as you of perishing if you don't get us out of our current predicament. Michael hesitated. Presuppo... what? Move! Now! Michael stood and immediately began to sway, unable to grab his bearings in the void of darkness. Where should I? One moment. Light burst around Michael, burning his retinas as the universe imploded into a dazzling whiteness. What's going on? he asked, trying to shield his eyes. It was useless. His eyelids had no effect on blocking the whiteness that stung as badly as if staring directly into the sun. Hold on. I'll adjust your eyes. Adjust my... The blinding white dimension dimmed into a world of cool grey corridors with smoothed edges that stretched and twisted in either direction. What did you do? I'll explain later. You need to move. Where? The ladder, to your right. Climb it. Is this the way to heaven? The voice fell silent. Michael's arm suddenly, viciously, flared in a spasm of pain. Shit! He clutched at the arm, found it had stopped throbbing, the pain already retreated to wherever it had come from. That hurt me just as much as you, but trust me, I'll do it again if you don't do as I say. Michael silently cursed the voice and its stubborn impatience. And what do you want me to do? I want you to pick up your weapon and kill the approaching enemy. Upon hearing the last, all too familiar order, Michael realised he must still be alive. Seemed his duty wasn't over yet. What's this guy's name again? Massif, that's my name. He said with a wide, slimy grin. I can tell you've forgotten it already. A common trait of yours, Fen. Most people forget a name the first time. True, but I know of your particularly bad habit for it. As you can tell, knowing habits is part of my business. Fen sighed. He didn't like this smooth talking know it all. Why couldn't he bother someone else and leave Fen to lament the day in peace? Kofai's laughter echoed from the trio further back in the street, his brays reverberating down the empty city block. He could at least pretend to take this demon hunt seriously. You can tell, can't you? No one is approaching this task with the proper gravitas. 
Fenn wished Massif would stop accurately guessing all his faults. It was becoming very tiresome. In fact, no one has taken any aspect of running the freelancers seriously for quite some time. You don't say, Fenn murmured, checking his watch. Even if they didn't find the demon, they should still make it back in time for lunch, when the stalls and cafeteria had the freshest food. He'd be in trouble if the Holocloaks didn't find Bram's killer and were still out for blood, but he could deal with that on a full stomach. Take Bingo, for example. This guy's still talking? He likes to lead, as he's doing right now, taking charge at the front of the pack. But unfortunately for Bingo, he cannot manage people. There's a difference between leading and managing people? A kingdom of difference. You can bully and threaten, use your stature to put others down and create unquestioning subordinates. Good techniques for short-term obedience. But if you truly want to attract the loyal following, who will stay with you no matter what, then you first need to learn how to make people want to follow you. To manage them. And if you cannot manage people, then ultimately, you will lose the ability to tell them what to do. To lead them. Now, take Isaac. Who's Isaac? Bingo second in command. The man ahead to the right. Massif paused for a deep breath before continuing his speech. Isaac is better with people, and would be far more suited to being on the rung below Hilda Roth in the chain of command. Wouldn't that be a ladder of command? Massif continued, unfazed. But Isaac will never get that high, because his reputation has been totally eclipsed by the best fighter in the pits. Bingo. And so, the optimum system of management has forever been sealed off by this improvised hierarchy. Do you see what I'm saying? Massif turned his head and smirked, as if all this lecturing was supposed to be impressive. Fenn shrugged. So what? That's just the way it is. Exactly, Fenn! I wasn't trying to encourage you. Most people don't care. That's just the way it is. Take Tamar. Who's? The speechless killer, walking ahead with the white cloak. A quiet assassin with a suitably murderous reputation, yet possessing a rank barely above that of the hired muscle. Like most, she doesn't care enough to strive for anything more. Probably doesn't help that she never talks. Ah, you see? You do know who she is. For unlike the majority, you actually do care. No. I just guessed from the name. And it is men like you and me who do care that have to take action. Fenn groaned. It's too early in the morning for this. The freelancers are breaking, Massif continued, spurred on by the sound of his own voice. The hollow cloaks and steel breakers, crevers and wielders, have all responded to Arminius's decline, not with the morning spirit of a close-knit community, but rather with a cruel, self-serving malice. They no longer act as partners, but as competitors. Doesn't competition encourage the best results? Fenn asked, absent-mindedly picking at a loose thread on his jacket sleeve. Amongst rivals, yes, but against one's own family? It will only end in sorrow and tragedy. Even the gearheads have reacted poorly. I've been studying the clans and their chiefs. Key players, main dissidents, and the cogs in between. All from afar. A neutral position, if you will. Oh dear, you're one of those weird independent contractors. My neutrality gives me flexibility. Massif gave Fenn another self-satisfied smirk. It allows me to gain a new perspective. What an oddball. And a new vision. A soothsayer oddball. A vision of you and me ruling the freelancers together. Fenn drew his eyes from the approaching mass of skyscraper blocking the road to the smartly dressed man at his side. Ruling the freelancers? This man wasn't such an oddball after all. He was exactly like the clan chiefs.
A heavenly valley sat before him, a softly glowing golden-white basin of serenity. A gorge sliced from honeyed clouds gifted upon the earth. It was inviting, that soft landscape where the distant birds tweeted and a gentle breeze tickled at his face. This light, what does it mean? It means we're outside. I'll readjust your eyes. Michael blinked, and with the rising of his eyelid, the real world crashed into view. The bleak, moss-crusted slope at his feet reappeared. The discoloured skyscraper sprang back into place, and heaps of abandoned traffic queued along the misshapen roads. The sliver of cushioned relaxation had been replaced by the husk of discarded city Michael was all too familiar with. Only this time, something seemed a little different. The buildings in the distance to his right, across the grass-riddled square, were a little hazier, and the sky a lighter shade of grey. What changed? Everything looks... It's morning time. You were asleep for seventeen hours. Seventeen hours?! He'd never slept so long in his life, not even after arduous training weeks in the army. How did I sleep for seventeen hours? It would have been longer if I'd been given more time. More time to do what? The voice tossed the question aside like a used blaster cell. Move to that bush for cover. The voices are coming closer. Michael wondered what the voice had been doing to him as he slid down the black slope to the bushy shrub growing in a chink between two metal plates. Had he passed out, not because of some booby trap laying within the beast, but because the voice inside his head made him do so? How did it have such power over him? Michael knelt next to the shrub, struggling to get his bearings, both on the slope and in his own head. If he could still call it his head. Now, look to the road to your left. Not yet. He needed a minute to think. Michael rubbed his eyes. He didn't know what to do. Usually, he was calm in almost any situation. No matter how bad the odds, he always prided himself in keeping his cool. However, right now, this was all too much. There must be some way to... What are you doing? I said give me a minute. No, you didn't. Didn't I? Not out loud, you didn't. I can't hear what you're thinking. I thought you were inside my head. I'm using layman's terms for the sake of time. I'm not actually inside your head. I haven't integrated with any of your mental functions. I've only merged with your sensory receptors. My what? I can only read your five senses, not your thoughts. But how can you... Not now. Look to your left. Michael lifted his head and stared around the shrub's side to the massive street, blocked off further down by a felled skyscraper. As he looked, three figures appeared, climbing from the far side of a wrecked building and onto the top of the flat edge. Michael squinted, but still couldn't make out the details of a distant grip from the sky shining behind them. You were right, he whispered. Of course I'm right! The voice was far too loud for the quiet the situation demanded. I wouldn't have stopped my work to see off a pack of dogs. Now keep looking in their direction. I've got an eyeglass. I could... No need. The figures blew up, from small cutouts to looming giants. The land around them vanished as the three faces grew and expanded. The biggest of the three faces flicked its eyes towards Michael, its bulbous pupils looking straight into his. Michael yelped and tried to look away from the sudden nightmare. He averted his eyes and was met with smudgy grey, bleary black, indistinct brown. No more shapes, only blurs wherever he looked. He fell onto his back, scratched at his eyes in a panic, realised he couldn't see his hands. They were gone too, replaced by one uniform peachy colour. Calm down. Swift as a flicked switch, his fingers appeared in front of a leaden cloud canvas. Everything had morphed back into focus. I magnified your vision. I hoped you would study the enemy, not to lose your composure and... Would you stop messing with my eyes? Michael hissed. I don't know what you want, but I can't keep track of everything happening here. I told you, we have to see off the enemy. I'm still trying to work out who that enemy is. Fine. The voice paused. 
leaving a space that Michael suspected would normally be filled with a sigh. I see rushing through this situation is only going to get us both killed, so let's take this slowly, shall we? Michael didn't say thanks. Wasn't sure he owed it. Now, can you please look at the skyscraper again? When you do, I'll extend your vision gradually this time. The voice had adopted the patronising tone you would use with a slow child, but it was better than the impatient shouting before. Michael resumed his position behind the shrub, rifle in hand, and gazed at the distant group. Again, at a creeping pace, the silhouettes grew, gaining in presence and size. The surrounding landscape dropped away, and whenever Michael flicked his gaze to the side, the world became one incomprehensible blur, like swivelling a specifically focused telescope to another area. He looked back to the group. The largest man was a man with black skin and steely muscles straining under a tight camouflaged shirt. A brute with bullish eyes to match. A bald man accompanied him, bulging eyebrows shooting off to either side, and a cloaked figure in a remarkably clean white hood trailed behind. The two men were arguing with each other while the cloaked figure gazed ahead. Michael had a disturbing sensation it was directly towards him. I think they might have seen me earlier. If that was the case, they'd hardly be standing around shouting in the open. We need a plan. Michael felt himself grimace. I can handle that. Have you done this sort of thing before? So, the voice didn't know as much as it liked to pretend. A bit. And how would you approach this situation from tactical experience? Michael had already been thinking about it. He took out his compass, placed it on a nook in the shrub's branch, and examined the needle. They're coming from the west, the same direction as the fort. If they're with the same grip from last night, I mean, two nights ago, then they're not very organised. As he spoke, the large camo-shirted man gave the smaller one a shove, making him stumble dangerously close to the skyscraper's edge. The cloaked figure sidestepped the flailing man, paying little attention to the commotion. These men seem unruly in their approach, but I recollect that the group from the other night were drunk. You were... what was the right word? Awake for that? I've been conscious ever since you awoke from the tank. The entire time? Even when I've gone for a sh- Not that! The voice snapped with force, making Michael wince. I made sure to busy myself with other matters during those times. What other matters? Tasks more important than watching you chase rats in car parks like a buffoon. Hey! Watch out! More have arrived! Michael shifted his eyes, the smallest degree he could manage, still overshot by a considerable amount. He swabbled back to see new faces emerging over the skyscraper's ridge, recognised the closer, disgruntled face, saw the sweat trickling from the man's wrinkled brow, down his cheeks, and off the end of his white, pointed beard. Okay, Michael whispered. I've got a plan. Fenn struggled up the last block of concrete, awkwardly swinging his leg and scuffing it against the coarse edge. Another scrape to plaster over his protesting calves. He heaved himself upright atop the block, triumphant. His lungs immediately caught up with him to spoil the victory. He bent over, hands on knees, puffing for all he was worth. God's sake, why has no one built a staircase for this place? Ha, that would make it too easy. Coffee, like some accursed mountain goat, jumped from the last ledge and began stretching his legs. Why are you wearing gym gear? Fenn asked as Coffee removed his hooded jumper to reveal a neon yellow tank top. We're supposed to be on the hunt for a dangerous killer here. All the more important to be flexible, Coffee tossed as he ran towards Bingo, who was having a spat with his bald second-in-command. Fenn was glad he wasn't the only one pissing off the short-tempered giant. He hung back, staying well out of range of Bingo's outbursts. Massif, who he'd managed to lose in the climb, was right about one thing. Bingo was no people manager. The clamp hand climbed after Coffee, casually brushing down his too tight trousers as if he'd been out for nothing more than a slightly taxing stroll. Gods, maybe I should get fitter. 
Fenn clutched his side, whatever part got stitches, he'd forgotten the name, still aching away. Seems I should catch up on basic anatomy, too. She always gives me a pause. The coat hanger hand talked most solemnly indeed. Feng glanced in the direction he'd indicated, his least favourite part of the city, and it took some work to claim that title. The Spy Droid. He hated that monstrous hunk of metal, not only because it had once been one of the deadliest weapons to roam the planet, but also because it looked plain ugly, sitting there sprawled out across Central Square like some colossal bug squashed underfoot. The wreckage was notorious amongst the freelancers for causing strife between the clans over some nonsense about scrapping rights. Right then, only its partially buried head, glaring red eye and bulging neck were visible at the end of the road, the rest hidden around the end of the block. Unsightly, but nothing to give him a pause, whatever that meant. I wouldn't worry about, uh, her. The thing's long dead. Not the droid. The one hand tutted and nodded his head. Her. The speechless killer. Fen looked again, this time at the cloaked figure standing at the far edge of the skyscraper. Oh, isn't that the woman who rarely speaks a word? Not rarely. The blunt hand dropped his voice to a whisper, despite the hooded woman being well out of earshot. She never speaks a word. I've asked around, but no one has heard her utter a single syllable. It's like she's cursed. Or has a sore throat. What happens when you try talking to her? Fen asked at normal volume, making the trident hand wince. I've tried that, he whispered even lower. But all I get is a nod, a shake of the head, or worse. Worse? The deadly hand nodded, a grim look painted on his scarred face. It's her smile. Her what? Her smile. It's always a smile with her. I'd rather have a woman constantly frown at me than do... That. It puts me on edge. Like she's got some evil thoughts. Your friend with the blaster launcher probably has much more dastardly intentions, Fen said as the shaved woman came up the rise, blaster launcher protruding like a murderous chimney. You know, they say Tamar also smiles when she kills, and it always seems to be my direction in particular she's smiling. See what I'm saying? Wait, Tamar? How do you know her name if she can't speak? The wonky hand looked at Fen from behind his sunglasses, as if he'd just asked why the sky wasn't made of rice. You do know she can still write. So why don't you get her to write down the answers to any of these mad questions? Fen placed a consoling hand on the vice hand's shoulder, like gripping a flank of tough meat. Let me tell you. What's your name again? The Broken Hand. I'm in your proper name. Fen dropped his hand, the gesture making him feel silly. None of that gimmicky nonsense. The man's mouth formed a suspicious line. Wit. Well, let me tell you, wit. I'd drop her from your mind. Don't let your paranoia drive you into becoming a wreck. If you start worrying about people who smile at you, then what are you going to think of the ones who don't? Speaking of... Fen trailed off as Bingo stomped over to their side of the building. Where's my seath? He demanded, eyes caught between a mad bulge and a narrowing glare. I don't know. Managed to get rid of him when we started climbing. Get rid of him? He's controlling the drone! Why am I the one getting shouted at for it? The drone's not working. Masif had pulled another magical teleporting act directly behind Fen, making him jump. I'm afraid the drone was taken out. Taken out? Bingo seemed unable to comprehend the words. It seems a sea eagle took the drone for a rival invading its territory. It attacked, most unfortunately causing the drone to crash. So now the freelancers have angry birds to add to its growing list of enemies. We should head back. It's too risky to patrol ahead without the drone. Bingo's second-in-command, a man with eyebrows out to make a fashion statement, had spoken up. The party of eight fell silent, letting the sound of a whistling breeze fill the air. We don't go back. 
Bingo replied, ice in his words. Not before the other patrols. It's too risky. Eyebrows wasn't backing down. We can't see what lies ahead or above. I'm as sceptical of the old man's story as anyone else. Old man? But if he's telling the truth, then this attacker could be laying a trap ahead for us to walk straight into. A few of the party were exchanging agreeing looks, but Bingo wasn't having any of it. He stepped forward, slowly, his chest leading the charge. He walked up to eyebrows, all the way, and made the considerably smaller man take a few steps back. We. Go. On. Eyebrows glanced around, saw no help coming from the rest of the group. He averted his eyes. Braun had won the day. Bingo turned, and wordlessly, everyone followed. Eyebrows stayed at the back of the group, and Coffee no longer laughed. Even Massif had abandoned his ranting. The atmosphere soured in an instant. Bingo didn't seem to care. He turned on his heel as the silent procession reached the edge of the descent, scraping loose rubble over the side. Fen, you lead the way. Me? But I... Not another word. Bingo's expression dared him to argue. Fen stared back at the grip, mirroring Eyebrow's desperate plea for help from moments ago. At Coffee, flanked on either side by Tonkai's stone-faced hands. At Eyebrow sullenly staring at the ground. At Massif picking something from his teeth. And at the white-cloaked woman, outlines of a smile barely visible under her hood. No help whatsoever. Fen turned and trudged past Bingo, who at least had the courtesy to step aside for him, to the skyscraper's edge. They'd reached the metal girder in the corner sticking up at a 90 degree angle, which marked the rough path of steep debris stomped solid over years of patrols descending the rubble crevasse. The loose stones and glass tended to crumble and shift with each storm, and it was customary for the fittest member of each patrol to find and lead the way down the easiest route. Or, Fen reflected, the least popular. Don't worry, Fen. It wasn't Bingo following directly behind with comforting words, but Massif instead. I'll keep you company. Wonderful. A cold breeze blew along the shafts of skyscraper innards, forming their path, making Fen glance up at the hulking spidroid rising against the brightening afternoon sky as they sank downwards. I'll keep you company. There was only one thing he had the energy to curse. Michael adjusted the rifle, barrel resting on top of a branch near the shrub's trunk where it was strong enough to hold the gun's weight. Lined his eye along the iron sights, gouged out of the BR-16's curved top guard, like looking down a straight-edged valley of metal. Even if it possessed a scope, he wouldn't have needed it. His eyes were already surveying the far end of the road in near perfect detail. A definite upgrade from the eyeglass in his pocket. Another tool for him to carry out his mission. No longer was he in charge of the events about to... What's your plan? Shoot and let them come to me. And then the struggle would begin. The thin line between life and death, ever strained, would be pulled taut, snapping for some as both sides pulled even. And after that? What? Michael asked, annoyed at the voice flickering back into his thoughts. And what will you do once they come for you? I'll kill them. That's it? That's your plan? Yes. After that, fate will decide. Who? It's not a person. It's whatever has allowed me to keep surviving all these years. You can't be serious. The voice was becoming strained, increasing in pitch. Are you nervous? Michael asked, amused at the irritable voices panicking. You're not! Why should I be? I'll either win or lose. Doesn't get simpler than that. This must be some sort of joke. You're going to get us killed. Shush, you're too loud. You're the only one who can hear me. Still, I need quiet to concentrate. On what? Clearly complex thinking isn't your forte. I don't have time to worry about forts. Right now, 
I need to decide who to shoot first. I'll only be able to get a good few shots in before the rest run to cover. The first members of the group, eight in total, had reached the bottom of the skyscraper and were now emerging from a collapsed subway into the daylight. That was fine. A BR-16 magazine held twelve cells. Easy. Shoot the big one. Michael ran his eye up and down the large, black-skinned man, free from the front. No, he'll be an easy target, even on the move. I'm going to aim for him. Michael shifted his eye to the leader of the pack. He felt no twinge of guilt in taking out the bandits. These trespassers had taken the Alliance's home for themselves. Someone had to put things right. Why do I recognise him? He was there the other night. One of that night's drunken escapade? And I suppose picking off the weakest first is always a winning... The voice halted its sarcastic reply. Hello? Did you lose connection with my head or something? I do recognise him. He saw... Saw what? You should kill him. He's seen you up close. We can't allow him to identify you later in case you try infiltrating their numbers. Michael was impressed. Now you're thinking the right way. He continued to stare at the leader and the shirted man walking next to him adjusted his rifle by the tiniest of millimetres against the scratching bark. I always think the right way. Under our guidance, the fort can become an organised, professional force. We already are professional, Fenn snapped at Massif. He was in an even fouler mood after descending the toppled skyscraper, bruising himself more times than a poorly picked apple orchard. Anyone who gets paid for their work is professional. We are only such in definition. In practice, we are nothing more than amateurs. Masif seemed to have a quick response for anything Fenn said. It was exhausting arguing with him. The sound of crashing, echoing metal made Fenn spin around to his right, juggling the rifle off his back. He relaxed when he saw the white-cloaked woman, Tamar, run by on top of an overturned truck. He decided to keep his rifle held in front of him. Where is she running off to? Massif paused his soapboxing to glance over. Tamar has always been an eccentric character. Look who's talking. Massif grinned. Brilliance is often confused for madness. Try saying that to Arminius. Ah, now, it is important not to confuse the matter. Massif spread his arms wide. For it takes a special kind of madness to... The beeping on Masif's smart gauntlet interrupted him. Thank the gods. Masif opened his gauntlet as they walked under a sagging tree. The drooping, lobed orange leaves were being whipped by the strengthening wind, creating a ghostly whooshing sound, unnatural among the abandoned man-made mess. Fenn heard the others behind him complaining about the weather. He'd be happy as long as it didn't rain. Massif stopped, so suddenly that Fenn paused and looked back at the man's abrupt change of pace. What's got you worried? Massif looked up from his gauntlet with wide, staring eyes. Tamar just messaged me. The enemy's ahead. I don't see any... A flash of black popped in front of Fenn. Something hard hit his eyes, and his vision went dark as the sound of a blaster shot smacked his ears. Chapter 11 With a Chance of Rifle Fire Fenn and Massif were down. He hadn't seen how. Only the black flash of a blaster shot and the pair of men leading the patrol dive for cover. Or collapse into it. Wit poked his eyes above the loader's engine to survey the damage. The distant attacker was firing from a bush sprouting atop the spy droid's head. Black blasts zipped down, pelting the spot where Fenn and Massif sheltered behind the thick trunk of their own tree, flakes of bark scrambling from the blaster shot's bite. The assailant was confident with a rifle, firing with such precision from so far away. Probably had a scope attached. Maybe a stand as well. How were they supposed to take that position? Hopefully someone else would lead the charge. Then again, Strong would probably make him run first alongside her. Shit. It wasn't meant to go this way. Tonkai said there'd be no trouble. 
All they had to do was keep an eye on the old, bearded man. But here he was in a fresh battle. Again. Can you let go of my- Ow! I mean, I appreciate it, but it's getting quite painful. Wit looked to Coffee. The free prongs of his clamp were holding tight to the man's bare arm. He had instinctively grabbed and pulled him to a crouching position behind the old construction vehicle as soon as the blaster shot song filled the street. He was gripping too hard. Even after all these years, the damn clamp was still impossible to control. Sorry, said Wit, releasing Coffee's arm. Coffee rubbed it and gave him a pained smile. No problem. It's a good excuse to stop lifting weights for a while. Joking around while being shot at? Wit was amazed at the man's nerve. Another noise began to fill the air, like that of a blaster shot with more oomph, a deep ripping that sent vibrations through Wit's chest. He recognised the dreaded sound, and sure enough, when he turned, he saw the red. The bolts of a fusion weapon fired towards the spy droid's head, forcing the distant outline of the attacker to scramble further up the slope. Bingo. He ran ahead, shooting at the attacker with a fusion submachine gun. His accuracy wasn't great, but the rapid succession of blaring red bolts drove the enemy back. Come on, said Coffee, pivoting around the loader. We can get to Fen. Here he was, watching the fighting while someone else took the initiative. Had he been getting worse at this? Then again, this was exactly why he'd quit being a frontliner. Wit cursed and picked up his gun. Scurried after coffee down a chasm blasted into the road from a long distant battle. Seemed new scars would be carved into its face today. Hoped the same wouldn't be said for him. Wit copied coffee's slightly crouched position as he ran, although the man in front was probably finding the awkward dash much easier in sweatpants and trainers. Wit's trousers had shrunk in the wash, clinging uncomfortably to his legs. The sounds of the screaming fusion gun and booming blaster rifle echoed in Wit's ears, but he dared not look up from Coffee's sweating back. Knew it would only want to make him run in the opposite direction. They hopped a street sign, bent sideways, and landed in a patch of glistening tarmac guarded by the large tree. Half of the tree's thinly buried roots bulged against the tarmac, creating a bumpy web across the clearing that copied the branches in the canopy above. Only one of the men had opted for cover behind its trunk. The other lay among the tarmac-crusted roots, head completely removed. His face must have been hit dead centre by the first blaster shot. The floor was covered in sprinkles of skull and brain, scattered amongst the red-stained autumn leaves. It was the kind of sight that reminded Wit why he was so anxious to avoid firefights. The other man lay pressed against one of the tree's gnarled roots, clutching his blood-drenched head. Medic! I need a doctor, or a med pack at the very least. Coffee knelt next to the man and glanced over at Wit. Do you have anything? Shit. Had to forget his medical kit. Strong always carried that kind of thing, but Wit had no idea where she was. Everyone had split as soon as the shooting started. He unstrapped his backpack and clumsily groped through its contents with his poor excuse of a hand. Here. Wit tossed the water bottle. Coffee snatched it from the air and unplugged the cap, poured it onto the man's face. The blood came off in a thin stream, leaving behind reddish-black clumps in his pointed goatee. Wit glanced back at the fancy shirt sprawled limp across the ground. Looked like the famously talkative Massif would finally be quiet. Gods, I'm not getting back to the tavern, am I? Fen! cried Coffee grabbing the man's dirty head in both hands. What's wrong? I don't see anything. You can't, Fen gulped a few desperate heaps of air, eyes glazed and distant. Gods, you must be more blind than me. Wit stooped next to Coffee and examined Fen's face. You're fine. How can you say that? I don't look fine at all. Don't worry, that's normal, Coffee said, winking at Wit. Bastards, all of you, joking around while I slowly... What's the problem? interrupted Wit. My eye. I've been hitting my eye. I've only got moments left, I tell you. Coffee leant in and began prodding his fingers into Fen's eyes. 
What are you doing, you fiend? You're a wee bit daft of me! Here we are, announced Coffee, holding up his index finger. Wit had to squint to see the tiny white fragment sitting there. What is it? Piece of bone, I think. Coffee nodded towards Massif's corpse. From our friend. Fenn sat up, blinking the blood from his eyes. He glanced from the upheld finger to Coffee, then Wit. Oh, I guess that was it. He scratched at his cheek and grimaced. Sorry for calling you bastards and all that. What an idiot. Wit didn't lose his cool in the heat of battle. At least, not over a splinter in the eye. Is everyone all right? Oh, fuck. Not even Isaac's abnormally large eyebrows could hide the shock underneath them as he emerged from the chasm. That's it? I'm calling in reinforcements? There you are. Strong had followed Isaac to the impromptu meeting. Wit didn't know whether to be relieved or scared about reuniting with his shaven companion. Strong calmly surveyed Massif's corpse as she swapped his blaster rifle for her launcher, dumping the weapon on the ground with a fud. Look after the launcher. It's too heavy to run uphill with. Aren't you going to take cover? Coffee asked. She shook her head. Bengo's got the gunner distracted. We need to join him. She directed her last comment at Wit. Exactly what he'd been afraid of. And no way could he say no. He was too much of a coward for that. Isaac was on his smart gauntlet, pleading for help from the other party leaders, while Coffey tended to Fenn's shell shock, although it hadn't been much of a shelling to put him in that state. So it was just him and Strong going on the offensive. Shit. This better not cost him another hand. With barely a look of acknowledgement, Strong led the way, rounding the tree's foliage to the all-too-open road. Bingo stood a few metres ahead, using a decaying, waist-high taxi for scant cover. Wit might have been able to hear Bingo screaming, if not for the tremendous noise of the fusion bolts, the bright red painful to look at. He was still firing towards the spy droid, dominating the space between the street and central square. Strong shouted something, incoherent under the screeching bolts. Bingo cracked his head towards them, eyes round and crazed. When he got that look in the fighting pits, Wit and at least two other men had to restrain him before he killed his opponent. Berserk Bingo had appeared. Let's go rip that fucker apart, he shouted, flicking saliva at Wit and Strong. Wit had to use a full dose of willpower not to turn heel and escape the mad beast's eye. Were they really supposed to follow Berserk Bingo's orders? Lead the way. Strong had made the decision for him. Again. A blaster shot slammed into the taxi, making the metal howl and screech. Bingo turned and roared, firing another salvo up the slope. The fusion gun, magazine sticking out horizontally from its side, jumped and bounced in protest as it spat more bolts in a wide spray. Bingo's rage must have numbed his pain. His grip stayed firm on the weapon, whose whole perforated barrel shimmered and hissed with heat. Bingo gave another roar, and in one great bound, jumped atop the taxi, rust raining from its roof, and down the other side. Strong followed immediately, no hesitation in her steps. Hard to tell if it was out of loyalty for Bingo, or a shared thirst for blood. They were actually doing this. Should he ask Strong if this was the best idea? Never mind. They both knew who made the decisions in this partnership. Wit doggedly ran after the pair, hoping against hope and all its buddies that Bingo and Strong would suddenly realise how ridiculous this was and turn back. Maybe the attacker would surrender for lack of ammunition, or Wit could get a sprained ankle, fall behind, and regretfully tell his comrades to go on without him. Grim times indeed when the outcome you're hoping for involves broken body parts. Bingo yelled and fired another fusion bolt as he ran. Strong copied with a black blaster shot from her own rifle. Wit didn't bother. His conventional assault rifle was laughably weak next to the thundering energy weapons. The crunching tarmac and gravel turned to echoey poundings as Wit crossed onto the black metal of the spy droid, 
desperately trying to catch up to his two companions, could use their large backs to hide from the attacker's line of sight. The slope steepened, and Wit felt the familiar burnings in his hamstrings as they climbed. Maybe he'd skip his next leg day at the gym. Then again, climbing a slippery slope for a few minutes was hardly the same as intensive weight exercises, and... Stop it! Concentrate on the battle! Why had it become so quiet? Slapping footsteps and heavy breaths were the only sounds filling the eerie silence. They reached the bush the attacker had been shooting from, spent blaster cells littering the moss around its base. Past it. Bengos and Strong's breathing became laboured as they focused their efforts on climbing the sleek, slippery surface, grabbing foliage to pull themselves up. Both had stopped firing. And no one covered them. Wet paused, looked ahead at the steep rise where the slope of the spy droid's head ended and the rest of its body loomed above. A dark cliff beyond the lip. The outline of a circular-shaped silhouette poked out between the two. The attacker, he was standing on the neck, must have finally reloaded his gun, because he was taking aim. Shit. Wit lifted his rifle. Too late. The man fired, and the blaster shot shrieked down, hitting strong. She returned a scream of her own. Wit shot back, sending a clatter of bullets at the attacker. He heard them ricochet against the metal, but the man had already dropped behind cover. You fucking maggot! Bingo fired at the ledge, lighting it in crimson firework reflections. The lights only seemed to make him angrier. He yelled again and rushed upwards, shooting as he ran. Wit let him run on. He was dumb with chasing after the crazed bull. He hurried to Strong, knelt next to her, clutching onto a clump of moss and weeds for support next to a precarious hole in the metal. Strong's eyes were screwed tight, her teeth bared. She was on her knees, next to the crisp remains of her left arm. The blast had struck just below the elbow. Seemed Wit was no longer the only one-handed member of their duo. Fortunately, the hit had been clean, the passing heat of the blaster shot great enough to sear the rest of Strong's arm shut. Couldn't take it for granted, though. He'd seen instant blaster cauterizations like this one soon erupt, the pressure of the blood behind the thin layer of burnt flesh forcing its way through like a burst sewer pipe. Come on, Strong, said Wit, reaching for her one remaining arm. Let's go back. Strong slapped the proffered clamp away. Get off me, Broken! We're not going back until the job's done! But you just lost an arm! Strong glared at her new stump like she would an insulting drunk at the fort. Didn't stop you from fighting? No, but it had made him rightfully terrified of it. Couldn't admit that to the woman refusing to take any life lessons from her lost limb. He knew she was headstrong, but this was on another level. Must be anvil-headed thinking. Come on, you can't fight with one arm. Watch me. Strong slowly rose to her feet, letting her rifle dangle by its strap. She pulled her blaster rifle from its holster and held it aloft, snarl resting below a set of crazed eyes identical to Berserk Bingo's. These people, every one of them, why had it taken Wet so long to realise? He'd surrounded himself with insanity. Bingo bounded up the last few metres of the spy droid's head, reaching its neck, shouted an unadulterated anthem of rage when he saw his prey had already retreated. He looked around him before spying the cracked hole in the droid's armour. He yelled again and charged inside. That boy always had been quick to anger. Didn't he realise he'd get himself hurt running around like that? With the shooting over, everything had settled. The breeze's gentle whistle blew along the street once more, minus the calls of the birds and dogs, which had all fled from the racket of the men's toys. Tamar scratched at her itchy ear under the white cotton hood. Usually, she only wore the hood to conceal her face on foreign missions, but this morning proved to be terribly cold, 
and the full-length white cloak was the thickest she owned. This far up, it was especially chilly, the biting wind making the ends of her cloak play and snap with the knee-length boots underneath. Tamar nudged the folded gun further into the small of her back, carefully hiding it under both cloak and top. Best if the boys don't see it and become overexcited. She was glad to have made the climb, hopping from broken door frames and the tops of walls and wooden shafts in a ragged ascent that led to a balcony, partway up the skyscraper, cornering the end of the road. The spot provided excellent views of the downed spy droid's upper half, where the attacker had taken cover behind an intruding hazel shrub. Tamar had run ahead of the others and spotted the man hiding in the leaves, up to no good. She'd sent a warning message to Masif, but the cheeky thing had been too quick, firing at a very impressive distance. Poor Masif. She could see his body in the clearing by the oak tree plucked of most of its deciduous leaves, where the other three boys were still taking cover. Tamar ran her eye from the clearing to the spy droid, where no doubt Bingo was running a muck inside with the killer. She had no desire to go in after them. Well-lit, open spaces were much more enjoyable than dark, cramped mazes filled with angry men storming all over the place. She looked back to the spy droid's head and spotted Tonkai's hands arguing next to a large hole cratered into the metal. What horrible names! It suited the strong hand, that large, brutish woman with no manners or fashion sense, but it certainly didn't fit the broken hand. Poor wit, being called something so ugly. Tamar felt her smile widen and her cheeks lift as her eyes settled on him. What a lovely young specimen. Wit had a rough exterior, although she knew how kind and considerate he was despite appearances. He'd caught her eye a few months ago, and Tamar would be lying if she said she wasn't looking forward to their encounters. Not that she could say so, anyway. Plus, what a great body. She appreciated someone who took care of themselves. He was too far at the moment, but Tamar had already noticed the particularly tight pair of trousers Wit wore today. She'd make sure to get a peek at his lovely bum later. Smiling, she tilted her head back to the spy droid's improvised entrance. Wit had scared her half to death earlier, recklessly running towards the attacker like that. She would move closer to the battlefield. Then, if that man came back out, she could dispose of him quickly. Didn't want to risk anything happening to her one-armed stallion. You've backed yourself into quite the corner. Quiet. Michael whispered. Why? Do I have to keep reminding you that you're the only one who can- I can't hear him while you're talking, Michael hissed. He edged further down the corridor, straining his ears for any sudden sounds. Any sound at all that interrupted the stifling silence. Had he been followed? Surely there should be some noise coming from that mountain of a man. He'd shown no signs of slowing while shooting round after round of those strange projectiles. The red energy possessed a strength similar to that of blaster shots, strong enough to toast and fling pieces of boiling metal from Michael's cover, burning themselves into his arms and face. Ah! Steam started to rise from the metallic burn marks. That hurts, you know. Of course it does. I'm stitching and rebuilding cell tissue, not slapping a plaster on a scratch. If you can heal me anyway, then why don't we take this guy head on? I caution you not to take this ability of mine lightly. Every time I carry out this process, I use a substantial amount of your stored energy, and you are already running low. If you were to be as foolhardy as you were the other night, and get directly shot by that man's weapon, then it's uncertain whether you have enough reserves for me to revive you. If I don't have that much energy left, then why are you focusing on tiny burns? The voice hesitated. I'll decide what gets prioritized here. Michael stopped at a junction and scrutinised the corridors, each with identical metal walls and unlit strips of light in the ceilings. At least he could see in what would have otherwise been utter darkness. Hey, um, Flicker? Michael said the first name that had come to mind. It was distracting thinking back to the voice without any label for it. 
Are you talking to me? What was that name? If you could hear those men approaching earlier, why can't you alter my ears now? Why did you call me that? We don't have time for that now, Michael said, mimicking Flicker's earlier words. Flicker paused, then, deliberately slow, replied. It took me two days just to figure out how to adjust your eyes. You saw for yourself, in the full sense of the word, how incomplete my preparations were for your input. It will take at least that amount of time, if not more, to fine-tune another sensory function. A loud crash rang through the air, accompanied by the yelling of a very angry man. Come out of hiding, you bastard of a whore! I'll gut your belly like you did to my man! They were hunting him to avenge the man whose throat he'd slit, and with serious backup. He'd counted eight bandits outside. One was down, and the other injured, but there might be more on the way. You should have killed the one with the goatee. Michael could explain how he'd been trying to do just that. How the BR-16 wasn't ideal for long-range accuracy, and that he'd had no opportunity for a test shot against the interfering wind. But those were excuses. He didn't like excuses. Instead, he simply said, I'll get him next time. Another crash made Michael glance back as he ran. This metal labyrinth and his own footsteps within it were making it impossible to pinpoint the enemy. Signs flashed by. No time to read them. He would have to solve the mystery behind this lair another time. Things weren't going to plan. Not that there had been much of one to begin with. He was just following his gut. And his gut told him to get away from the runaway cavalry of a man who'd been undaunted by the hail of blaster shots. He'd turned out to be a lot bigger up close, and that mysterious red weapon gave Michael little comfort. He'd need to properly scout out the enemy before he engaged. Why don't you retreat? Michael glanced down the next set of corridors, dashed along the one lined with a length of snaking pipes. I am. I mean retreat from the battle. You've got nothing to gain from killing this man. It's not about what I have to gain. It's about doing what's right. How is this right? Michael stopped in his tracks. Didn't you hear what they were talking about the other night? They've been eating people. Yes, I did, and I have to ask. Did the possibility of sarcasm ever occur to you? Sarcasm? Yes, it's what's also known as humour. Jokes? Michael asked, raising his voice. Who would joke about that? And who would kill over it? I stopped a bandit in his tracks. There was no... A pop of light from the far end of the corridor. The pinpoint burst into an explosion of excruciating brightness. Michael shut his eyelids, too late to escape the afterimage scorched into his retinas. He turned, stumbling back the way he'd came, as a high-pitched roar filled the corridor. Something seared the edge of his left arm, and he smelt his flesh cooking as the skin blistered and crackled. The hairs on his arm were burnt down to their roots, jacket on top sizzled in an instant, as the superheated energy hissed by. He rounded a corner and sprinted, as hard as he could, hands stretched out in front to fumble ahead. He bit his lip and clenched his fist around the blaster rifle as Flicker began healing his arm and eyes. He must have heard you talking. Waited until he was in close proximity. Switched on a flashlight. Flicker rattled out the broken sentences, voice shaking. I wasn't able to adjust your eyes in time for normal light levels. I'm... He didn't finish the sentence. Michael blinked the tears and steam from his eyes, legs lagging, as yet another adrenaline boost left his system. Maybe retreating wasn't such a bad idea. The clouds had started to clear, allowing glimpses of white sky to poke through. The extra light wasn't harsh, but Wit was glad to have his sunglasses. They covered his wincing, oversensitive eyes. He surveyed the polarised landscape, metal dropping away on either side of their position on the slope, gnarled ribs of city wreckage lurking from the left, empty slab of central square flanking the right. He's still inside the droid. Both of them are. No one's come out. Good. 
Strong was talking to Tonkai using Wet's gauntlet. Her own had been destroyed alongside her left arm. The way she'd got on with her day as if nothing happened was beyond him. Clearly, Strong was named as such for more than just physical ability. Must be the same reason he'd been labelled with broken. When Wit lost his hand, he had blubbered and cried for the first few days. After that, he became reflective, pondering existence for weeks, and in the following months, he'd switched again to become disheartened at the unfairness of life. Had a feeling he was still wrapped in those final phases, but after a while, it's hard to remember what you were like before. Always easier to see how people around you change, rather than yourself. At least he had convinced Strong to contact the boss before running off on another suicide mission, and for once, he'd made the right call. I can catch the fucker if you let me. Don't try it, came Tonkai's rough voice on the gauntlet. Wait for me to arrive. We're very close. Was he genuinely concerned about Strong? Or was he after a personal stake in the killing glory? Hard to tell with Tonkai. Sure enough, the northern party began to emerge from a street further up the grid. A thin line of men and women dividing the tall city blocks from the vast open square to their left. No cars with fair patrol either. This was a hard part of the city to reach, every road clogged with the abandoned remains of civilization, like cholesterol-stuffed arteries. Maybe if they cleaned up the place a little, it wouldn't be so hard to find one man. Looks like Fen was telling the truth about this killer, shouted Wit to Strong, who still held his gauntlet open in one hand. She scowled at him, and Wit was sure Tonkai did the same on his end. Where is that fool? Back in the street, said Strong, crying with the other cowards. Broken! Go fetch that shirker and drag him up there if you have to. He's not getting out of work that easy. Seemed his boss had found yet another person to take a disliking to. Tonkai hung up without another word. Could have at least said bye. Strong was a few metres away, so she tossed the gauntlet to wit, and he awkwardly grasped it from the air with both hand and clamp. He slid the gauntlet past the metal prongs and clasped it shut on his forearm. At least he hadn't lost everything under the elbow like Strong, although it didn't seem she cared much. No point in consoling this particular woman. I'll head back down and get Fen, Wit said, eager to get away, even temporarily, from the new battle lines being drawn. Strong opened her mouth to reply, stopped mid-utterance. She reached for her rifle, forgetting she only had one hand, elbow swinging uselessly. Wit didn't stop to sympathise. He quickly turned and looked up the sloop, trying to match Strong's eyeline and see the commotion. Had the attacker come back? He tilted his head to the tropical sky, sunglasses doing little to stop it turning a brighter and brighter blue. Tropical? Not dreary and grey, but splendid sparkling azure, just like the colour of... Shit. The blast whooshed to his left and hit exactly where Strong was standing. The explosion pressed on his ears, threatening to burst his drums. Flesh, debris, and molten metal flew as the force banged against Wit's chest. He was tossed over the side, like a piece of leftover dinner flung through the window. A shot from a blaster rifle tore a man apart a force so intimately powerful that it destroyed whatever part it hit, so Fen wasn't entirely sure how to compare the impact of a blaster turret. Did it eviscerate whoever it hit, grinding them into tiny fragments and throwing away the evidence in every direction, not a scrap left behind? No matter the details, the fact was, the strong hand had been standing there one moment, gone the next. All that remained was a smouldering crater in the metal, Chunks still sprinkling down with little taps and a layer of fine pink mist, unsure of what to do with itself, floating where the woman had stood. Fen hadn't seen what happened to her clamp-armed partner. Vanished too in the flash of blue light. Eyebrows had stopped the frantic chattering into his gauntlet to gape at the explosion, as sudden as a lightning strike on a clear day. Now he talked faster than ever, telling every fighter available to come at once. 
Fenn could see the other party joining them from the far side of the spy droid. Another eight-person rabble. Nowhere near enough. What was that? Coffee asked, squinting at the glowing blob in the sky. A gunship, Fenn replied, struggling to think of a worse time for this encounter, especially considering he was on the wrong side of the fort walls so very far away. It's the Alliance. Chapter 12 And Gunships Tonkai's approaching patrol had started firing sporadic black blaster shots at the gunship, which was a very good thing. They were drawing its attention from Fen and his brave companions cowering underneath their tree. Alliance? Coffee asked. What are they doing here? Fen, still shaken from his lover close brush with death, took a second to answer. He stroked his beard in contemplation pulled his fingers away to find them covered in dry, flaky blood. A near brush with death indeed. One that's left me quite filthy. It looked like he'd be having a few more before the day was out. No idea, but at least it answers the question of who killed last week's patrol. Maybe they're connected with the mud demon. Gods, he needed a drink, but Bingo had already confiscated his hip flask that morning. Truly dire times. The gunship fired free blasts from its forward turret, the resulting explosions reverberating through the air as they hit the street hidden around the corner. Fortunately, there was no intact glass left on the roads to be shattered by the force of the monstrous turret. The gunship really did pack a punch. It had stopped descending and was currently hovering above the spy droid's head, laying claim to the slope from where it had swatted away Tonkai's hands. It was a very sleek-looking ship, a new model perhaps, which would make sense since Fen hadn't seen one in official use for years. The ones he was used to were older, more abandoned, or a tad stolen. This gunship wasn't drastically different from its ancestors. It still had that thin body with an angled cockpit ending in a pointed nose where the pesky rotatable blaster turret hung beneath. The two main wings, folded back during high-speed flights, had extended out to either side so it could hover, extra rectangular engines dropping from the ends to stabilise and assist the small jets of fire spurting from the main body. The main engine sat beneath a second set of smaller wings, tipped above the tail at the back, and was creating one hell of a roar to complement the turret's bangs. You'd think the Alliance designed their gunships for a fashion show rather than a war. Everything looked so damn fancy and modern. At least they'd taken the camo job a little more seriously, painting the ship in a soft matte grey to match the urban environment, finished off with sky blue trimmings. Or was that meant to be Alliance blue? The pilot wasn't going all out in his murdering. Fenn knew from past experience, and not the pleasant kind, that the extended wings could drop down an extra blaster turret each, but the compartments were staying mercifully closed. Three turrets would have been excessive in dealing with such a motley crew. The freelancer reinforcements were mustering a feeble defence, most of their blaster fire missing the ship. The few shots that did hit bashed the gunship in brief black bursts, failing to do more than scorch and scratch the armour. It would take a mountain load of those to bring down that flying tank. What are we going to do? Coffee asked. Tonkai will know. Eyebrows had finished his bleating for backup. We need to join his party. Fen had no intention of attending any party being thrown by Tonkai, especially one with hostile turret fire in attendance. I'm not going over there. Our closest gunship is near Shankmora. That's hours away. We have to do something to stop that thing until they get here. And stop them as well. The ship slid open one of its side doors, allowing a string of soldiers to repel onto the spy droid's head. Fenn didn't know what was more disconcerting, the brand new blaster rifles the soldiers were carrying, or their full sets of armour, with helmets too, equipped for action against a proper fighting force instead of a lightly clothed grip of ill-trained mercenaries. Fenn scanned the clearing, looking for the easiest exit spotted the strong woman's trinket from the start of the day, abandoned in the muck. 
she wouldn't be needing it now. A plan popped into Fenn's head. Not as good a plan as running away, but he was already in uncomfortably hot water at the fort as was, and that water would be heated to boiling point if he was found snoozing in one of the tavern's sofas whilst the Alliance made such a farcus on the doorstep. Fenn awkwardly crouch-walked over to the device, cursing his back, and attempted a lift. He barely got halfway off the ground before he swore and let the metal monster drop. Started cursing his flimsy arms too. Coffee! Come help me lift this launcher! Fenn shouted. He immediately swore at himself for yelling his surprise plan for all the Alliance to hear. Thankfully, the never-ending noise of blaster fire provided an excellent cover for his blunders. Coffee jogged over to Fenn, revealing his head and shoulders to the Alliance forces. It would be a miracle if this plan went unnoticed. Coffee knelt, wrapped his hands under the upper barrel of the launcher, and together they managed to heave the weapon into the air. Fenn teetered a bit before resting it on his shoulder, twisting the weapon so the handle stopped digging into his back. Fenn started to lead Coffee, launcher pointed backwards, in the opposite direction of the fighting. Good idea. Where are you going? Eyebrows asked. At least Coffee was happy enough to get tugged along without questioning jabbers. If you're thinking of running, then you better... I would never run away, Fenn shouted back over his unloaded shoulder. He swore again and lowered his voice. I have a reputation to uphold. Then where are you going? Up. There. Fenn was already losing his breath. I saw the white-cloaked lady on a balcony earlier. The speechless killer, Coffee added. That's the one. Miss Keller's gone now, but I reckon it can't be too hard to get up there. What about Tonkai's orders to join him? Fenn rolled his eyes, at eyebrows weaker than wet noodles counter-argument. You're welcome to join him, Fenn replied as they began to edge along a lane of trucks and buses. But right now, I'm carrying the launcher, so I'll call the shots. Good one, Coffee called. Did I make a joke? Another explosion boomed down the street, followed by the crashing of debris and a scream. That helped Eyebrows make his decision. Fine, he said, falling in line with the launcher. We'll come with you if you insist. I didn't. Fenn slipped on a loose piece of stone hiding amongst the mud and yelped as he juggled with the launcher. Careful with that trigger, Coffee said, or else this party is really going to go off. What is he on about? Hey, can't call him Eyebrows. You're at the back, come here. Eyebrows scampered over. What is it? Stand straight, there we go. Fenn heaved the launcher off his shoulders and onto Eyebrows' considerably more capable ones. Thanks. My back's killing me. Come out, come out, little mouse. The large man's words rang through the corridors, clapping off walls and ringing from metal. The pursuer had become impatient with creeping around in the dark and had started taunting, trying to goad his prey towards him. Thing was, Michael felt it working. He didn't like running from a fight, not if the only skin he was saving was his own. All I've seen so far is your back. Let me see your front so I can see how yellow it really is. Michael gritted his teeth. Does he really think that will work? How about we throw down our weapons and fight like men? As if we would really. Michael stopped running, turned on his heel and shouted. How about we do just that? A shock jabbed Michael's front like an electric rod. Run, you imbecile! Flicker hissed. Michael grunted and turned back down the hallway. Laughter clasped at the pounding slaps of Michael's feet. That's the spirit. You wait. I'm going to tear you apart for what you did to Bram. Why should we run from this guy? Michael asked. I can take him. You don't know that for certain. Well, there's only one way to find out. No, there is not. And additionally, I have no interest in answering such a... Quiet. What's that? A passageway, coming up on Michael's right, emanating a much brighter light. Michael noticed Flicker adjusting his eyes as he approached, 
dimming the surrounding areas to their normal levels of impenetrable black. Michael turned the corner. Nearly fell off it. He reached for the door frame with both hands, letting his rifle plummet. Grasped at the cool metal edges, holding with all his strength. His chest strained as his back curved in on itself, legs dangling, stomach dropping into the empty space. Scraped his heels, then soles, back onto the lip of smoothed metal. The rifle finally clattered to the floor, far below. He stood like that for a few seconds, arms pressed open, panting, staring. Below sat an open cavernous space, a massive cavity scooped out of the metal beast's body. Michael realised he was looking into its belly. The space might have seemed even larger if not for the heaps of clutter strewn over every surface. Toppled crane jibs jutted out from the floor and walls, stacks of empty drums and containers lay scattered, and piles of scrap metal formed mounds that buried crushed trucks and a strange, black-bodied object with four tubular engines and a red cockpit. A gunship with legs? He spotted an elongated armoured body lying on its side, identical to its vine-covered brother he had found on the street a few days ago. A set of legs sprawled from the underside of its body, a few curled, more stretched out in various directions, like an absurd metal woodlouse flipped onto its side. A smaller, mirror image of the gargantuan beast it nestled inside. Had this wrecked hangar been the base of operations for the strange metal creatures? For the destroyers of the city? A shaft of moat-filled light shone from the ceiling, through a huge hole ripped into the top of the thick armour. It wasn't only the cooling light of day pouring in, but also the sounds of distant, synthetic explosions. The weapon creating that noise had to be more powerful than a blaster rifle. It sounded almost like... a turret. Who was firing it? There's a fight outside! Yeah, let's go see what's happening. Go towards the explosions? If someone's fighting the bandits, then they might be on our side. But... I'm not running from another fight today. Flecker relented. Fine. I'm starting to realise calculated rationale doesn't appeal to your sensibilities. But if you do this, I'm only going to heal fatal injuries. Fine by me, Michael said as he lowered himself onto the first twisted ledge, towards his gun lying far below. That still gives me an edge over everyone else. Ringing. Buzzing. Screeching. His ears were filled with too many high-pitched noises. And there was so much bright light. A clamp appeared in front of his eyes, provided only three thin shafts of shadow to shield his face. Must be dazed. He had actually expected a hand to appear when he raised his arm. Wit shook his head. All that did was make the world wobble and throb. He tried raising his other arm, but was met with resistance. He sluggishly turned his head. A wire was wrapped between bicep and forearm, making the flesh around it bulge. He groaned and dragged his clamp through the air, used a serrated edge to saw through the plastic coating, cut the metal wiring next. Slowly, so very, it sprang apart with a twang. Wit's brain started to churn again with his liberated body. He looked about himself. Shiny, sharp, sheared metal ends stared back at him. A distant boom momentarily replaced the buzzing in his head. He was lying down. Sat up, tiny pieces of debris tumbling from his chest. He'd risen too quickly. Head started to spin again. Wit rubbed at his back with his good hand, where he could already feel the pain welting. He'd taken a serious bruising. It hurt particularly on his lower back, where he'd fallen on his gun. Thrown against it. Thrust from his feet. The gunship. Strong. Shit. A shrill string of blaster shots fired above. Wit shrank back against the metal and wires, staring wide-eyed at the hole's gaping top. Like a scared, cornered animal. 
He arched his back, wrestling the gum from underneath him, and pointed it towards the sky. Like a scared animal with a fully automatic assault rifle. His ears were still whining, a sure sign his tinnitus would be playing up tonight. And his front throbbed like a giant hand had slapped him all over. Quite the force had come from that turret, but not enough for the concussive wave to kill him instantly. He guessed it to be 75 kilowatts. Any more, and he'd be dead. Surely, he could sit like this and wait for the battle above to end? It was uncomfortable, although a lot cosier than going upstairs, and if anyone stuck their head into view, he'd just shoot them before they had time to react. But what if there were more than one? What about grenades? or guns held out in front of the shooter, fired blindly into the small hole, turning him and his bed of wiring into cooked mints. Plus, Fer was strong. He really should check on his partner of three years. Or more likely, Avenger. Then again, now she wasn't here to shout at him for running away. Maybe this was his chance to escape. Although... He was already on Tonkai's bad side, and it wouldn't look too good if he was found lifting weights in the gym while the Alliance whipped up a storm above the Freelancer's precious spy droid. Maybe he could escape the fort altogether, flee to Shank Mora, and start a fitness clam for all the drunks who wanted to lose their beer bellies. For all the farmers who needed a little muscle mass after their years of drug-induced lethargy. Or perhaps he'd hide out in no man's land, searching for a community of cowards like himself in the wastes. Most likely, this was all more daydreaming that would lead nowhere. A black blaster shot whipped through the sky above Wit's head, missing its target and seeking an alternative resting place. Wit didn't know what he'd do after this. The only way to find out was to take the plunge and climb out of the hole. Shit. He struggled to his knees and began to lift himself with one good arm, rifle handle grasped tightly in the clamp. It felt like a big event was about to happen, which wasn't a good thing. A life-changing moment you can see coming tends to be one of the bad sorts. He pulled himself up even more. What a sight he must be, little poof of dirt blonde hair slowly poking itself out of the hole. Wit took a deep breath and raised his eyeline the next couple centimetres. The gunship still hovered above, engines roaring, turret firing. However, it was turned the other way, nose directed north towards what must be Tonkai's patrol. What really concerned Wit was kneeling on the metal a few metres in front. A fully armoured soldier. Just one. His buddies must have descended the slope where the soldier aimed in the opposite direction of wit. Still, one was enough to give him a long, long pause. No one in the fort dressed like that. All the armour on the island after the APOC had been sold to other factions or no man's landers, far away from the safe confines of the jagged fort. Only active frontliners wore armour, and there were none here. True, Strong used to be one, but she'd quit when the fighting between the factions dried up during the stalemate, and Wit had left after Tonkai promised him safe, well-paid work here on Prosperity. Not this. Not jobs that involved facing down fully equipped Alliance soldiers. He could tell the man was with the Alliance, not due to the armor's generic urban camo, but because of its shape. Wit was close enough to see the individual squares, tiny interlocking metal plates of Martesian steel, each coloured black, grey or white, breaking apart and reforming into a hole as the soldier moved his head, flexing with the muscles. Those squares lined the whole bodysuit, ending at the ankles, wrists and neck. A flexible protective coating with a single gap. One piece of the armour, the size of a squared domino, had come loose. Wit sucked his teeth and swapped the rifle into his good hand. A rifle carrying old-fashioned bullets with brass casings. He'd bought this heavy piece of junk as a showpiece, a spare to disguise the fact he'd lost his blaster rifle last week and hadn't felt like cashing out for a new one, vainly hoping it would show itself. There was hope for you, 
getting in the way again. How was he to know he'd be up against proper armour? Wit scanned his crater for a foothold. Nothing, and he was on a thin ledge as it was. He'd have to climb out to get a good clip of bullets into the guy. Shit. Wit sensed his body getting impatient as it moved for him, keen to get this over with, throwing the rifle onto a patch of moss that softened its clatter. The gunship's thunderous turret continued to fire directly above. Damn thing. Hoped someone else had a plan for dealing with it. Blaster rifles would barely dent its armour, and his own gun was a joke in comparison to those. He tried to lift himself all the way, but one clean movement proved difficult, clamp sliding across the surface. He turned about and propped his bum onto the slope's edge, tucked his knees in and swivelled on his bottom until he once again faced the soldier's back, who thankfully hadn't seen any of the ludicrous display. He was too focused on the battle ahead, taking aim with his own weapon. Wit crouched into a kneeling position, copying his target and scraping up his rifle. Froze. Was this really the right thing to do? Probably a young man under all that armour. Could take an extra hit or two to take him down. Might be better to club him over the head. Hope the helmet didn't hold. The soldier shifted. The sudden movement made Wit pull the rifle's trigger, aiming for that small gap in the Martesian steel shell. The rifle jumped in his hands as it spat out a rattle of bullets. Wit kept the trigger down, making the weapon buck and thrust under his grip as it struggled to spring free like a massive power tool. The gunfire tore at his eardrums, nearly as bad as the air it ripped through. His tinnitus would be unbearable tonight. Under a monstrous blast of igniting gunpowder, Wit heard a series of tings as the bullets sparked against the armour. The soldier stumbled forward, placed a hand on the floor and steadied himself. Was that it? That was most of a clip at point-blank range. The salvo of bullets had proved worse than firing a water pistol. At least squirts of water wouldn't have attracted the soldier's attention, who was already turning to see who'd given him the slight shove. Everything slowed down with him, the twisting of the soldier's body controlling the momentum of time. Wit imagined the soldier's face, confused, startled, angry. Whatever the emotions, they were hidden behind the helmet and its darkened visor. He wouldn't even get to see his killer's face. All Wit had was his shirt and jacket. No use whatsoever against the blaster rifle. He just stood there, ready to accept the inevitable. Always knew he couldn't meet the mark. How unfair. The soldier finished his turn, raised his rifle, its muzzle ringing a black pit of barrel that would soon erupt in vibrant blue. Wit let the last slow breath fill his ears his chest relax and deflate. A calmness settled. The final resignation. The pit stayed dark. What was he waiting for? Wet tore his eyes from the gun to the soldier's helmet. Something stuck out from under it, between helm and shoulder. A knife protruding from the five millimeter slice of unarmored neck. Wit slid his eyes to the left, from the small hand holding the handle, along the white cloaked arm, to the hooded face. The sleeved arm twisted to the side and yanked the knife, stretching the gap and pulling out a chunk of fabric-covered flesh from between the squares. Time resumed as the figure stood, hood falling backwards. A great squirt of blood spewed from the soldier's neck, covering the cloak and splattering the newly revealed, toffee-coloured face. She smiled throughout the act. The smile of the speechless killer. The soldier's body collapsed to the side in a great wet clangor as the armor smashed against the blood-soaked metal. Wit didn't pay it much attention. His eyes were stuck on the killer's face, where flecks of red mingled amongst light freckles and dark brown hair. He looked into her light brown eyes. The lines deepened around them as the blood-drenched assassin continued to smile with full, closed lips.
a chill took hold of wit. One far more frost-bitten than staring down the barrel of the soldier's gun. Gods, that white-cloaked lady made this look too easy. Fenn heaved himself up the last edge, kicking his feet through the air as if that was meant to help propel him, and finally collapsed onto the sliver of balcony. He rolled over to face the dreary sky, gasping gulps of cold air. This must be his physical limit. Any more, and he would surely pass out. Fenn, come help me with this! No rest for the hard-working souls of this world. Fenn slowly got to his feet, and turned to coffee and eyebrows waiting below, blaster launcher peeking between their shoulders. Watch what you're doing with that thing! Fenn shouted as Coffey unloaded the launcher from his shoulder and shoved the first part onto the balcony's ledge. The shooty end, whatever it was called, directly pointed his way. You try carrying it for a while, Coffey complained. My shoulder's wrecked. Well, be careful. We don't know what could set it off. Coffey slid the launcher the rest of the way, making it jump and land with an unceremonious thud onto the balcony. Excuse you. Fenn grumbled as Coffey swung himself onto the overcrowded ledge. Any more room? asked Eyebrows, one inquisitive brow level with Fenn's feet. Um, how about you stay there and stand guard? Guard? The Alliance are moving in the opposite direction. The soldiers had climbed down the far side of the spy droid's head, little grey beetles chasing Tonkai's puny patrol further into the rubble. And there sat the gunship, overseeing it all, bombarding the street fighting with its godlike wrath of turret fire, lighting up the whole area in translucent blue flashes. The very definition of a one-sided fight. What's the plan? Coffee asked. Fenn nodded towards the gunship, whose massive back engine was at their level, creating enough noise and heat to put a forest wildfire to shame. Reckon we're close enough now, it won't have time to dodge. We're going to shoot a rocket right up its backside. That sounded pretty cool on my part. How are we going to do that? What do you mean? Coffee bent and cracked open the barrel of the launcher. We can't shoot it. There's nothing in here. What? You can't be... Fenn faltered when he saw Coffee's smile. Just kidding, he said, winking. The blaster cell's in here. Well, a bigger version of one anyway. How can you be making jokes at a time like this? Relax, I'm only having a little bit of fun. Guys, Eyebrows said from below. Fun? We're in the middle of a fucking battle here. My head was centimetres away from becoming a modern art piece. Guys. Okay, I get you're stressed, but there's no need to swear. I'll swear as much as... Guys, the fucking gunship? What? Fenn looked back at the battle, and the gunship, which had begun to rotate towards... Shit! Get the launcher! Coffee had already picked up the weapon. He steadied it on his shoulder. Took aim. One eye screwed solder tight. Hurry and fire! The gunship had finished half its turn, and was treating the balcony to a side-on view of its angular body, smaller engines howling. Its blaster turret turned even quicker, rotating in front of its host. The launcher won't fire! Coffee, Fenn whispered through clenched teeth on top of weak knees. Not another joke. I'm serious, it's not working! Fenn heard the clicking as Coffee pressed the dead trigger. What should we do? He asked, voice suddenly frantic. Fuck this! Stray glass and debris scurried away with eyebrows as he leapt back down the rough path. The ledge below didn't seem such a bad spot now. There was no way they'd be getting back down the balcony in time from the imminently approaching turret. Fenn didn't move. Only stared. Like in school, when he'd had a bout of stage fright. The older kids snickered as he gazed past them all, looking directly into the cold eyes of his mother. Only this time, he stared into the cold blue A of the Alliance insignia, stenciled onto the side of the gunship. The Alliance or his mother? Which one should he curse in his final moments? 
The gunship fired, letting loose its thunderous blue payload, not at Fen or Coffee, but to their left, where eyebrows had been running. The whole building shook as the blaster shot collided, creating a river of cracks along the wall whose tributaries spread out to the balcony underneath Fen's feet. The vibrations jolted him back to life. He heard a woman squeal, realised it was him. He looked around in a frenzy, nowhere to jump, everywhere a steep drop to the ground, far below. Fucking balconies. He looked back at Coffee, who still had the launcher propped atop his shoulder, staring in abject horror as if some demon had swooped down from the sky, just like the other night. Then, Fen remembered what they'd also done that night. He began to hit the launcher, making it sway on Coffee's shoulder, slapping it around the trigger where the cell rested inside. That's where it is, isn't it? What are you? The launcher came to life with a glorious symphony roar. It set the air ablaze as it spat out a tremendous black blast. It sailed through the sky, race car quick, and came to dock on the gunship's wing. The blast of energy exploded, engulfing the wing's engine in a black torrent. The right side of the gunship was flung back by the shockwave, skewing its next turret shot that flung wide of the balcony. The gunship continued to spin through the air, letting loose a corkscrew of black smoke and blaring alarms as it careened towards the ground. Fenn didn't see the rest of its journey. He turned and vomited over the edge, letting the thin contents of his stomach copy the gunship's fall to the ground. His head spun as he wished for a railing to lean against. Gods, I need a drink. And maybe a bite to eat first. She wasn't sure how it had managed the long journey across the sea, but Tamar loved watching the bald eagle that lived on prosperity, especially when it hunted. The way it hovered in the air, circling for prey. Noble and untouchable, so far above it all. Her favourite moment was when the mighty bird spotted its target, folding its wings into a teardrop shape as it dove in for the kill. The grey gunship looked just like that, an eagle beginning to fold its wings in for a dive, an action snapshotted and captured in metal. But the eagle had been hit, arrowed by a blaster shot. It spun towards the ground in a rigid fashion, impossible for an eagle to mimic. Men and women from Tonkai's party cheered as the ship went down. Another group joined their cheers. Tamar turned her head and saw the Southern Party running to join them. Yuna's group. They too must have left their truck behind in one of the jumbled streets. Always more comfortable to walk anyway. Tamar looked in the direction of the Alliance soldiers, armoured backs running towards the gunship where it was about to... Gone. The ship disappeared behind the spy droid's abdomen. The horrendous wrenching and crunching of thick metal hitting hard ground shortly followed. The Alliance's bludgeon had been smashed. The battle turned in an instant. Good riddance. To think that horrible man was about to kill poor Wit. The culprit's body lay next to her, oozing blood onto the sloped metal. Like a leaking, bloated snake covered in horrible metal scales. Tamar pivoted on the tip of her boot, flicking a spot of blood across the slick metal to face Wit. He stared at her with wide eyes. The attention made Tamar blush. She bowed her head, letting a few strands of hair drop around her face. She glanced up at him. He was still staring, right at her. Did he like her? A simple, needy thought, but she couldn't help herself. He wasn't being very subtle about it, although since it was sweet wit, she didn't mind. It was still cold, but Tamar kept her hood down. She sidled to him and heard his breathing quicken, shallow and shaky. She reached for his face, level with hers, and plucked away his sunglasses. The lenses were shattered with the frame intact, giving him a ridiculous look. He probably didn't realise he still wore them. The silliness of it almost made her giggle. With them gone, it revealed the full streak of scar across his face. 
It was an ugly thing, a white, puckered mass running from forehead to jaw, but that didn't matter. Wet remained silent. He must have been overwhelmed by all the excitement. Tamar was the same, giddy as a teenager. She had to control herself. Couldn't get carried away on this dead war machine. Time to reunite with the others. She stepped in line with Wit. It was amazing how big his arms were. She timidly reached for his hand, found a lump of metal instead. She'd forgotten about that. That didn't matter either. Slowly, Tamar glided back down the slope, leading Wit by the clamp. She felt her smile practically splitting the sides of her face. She squeezed the metal prongs. She was certain Wit would have squeezed back if he'd been able to feel anything there. What a wonderful day this had turned out to be. Coward! Come back here or I'll... Michael didn't hear the rest of the deranged man's words. The wind changed, snatching away his distant shouts. The red projectiles hissed behind. He heard them stop short and sizzle on top of the grassy paving. He was a long way from the metal beast now. Far from the second crack he'd found in the armour, an exit blown out of the underbelly, hidden by a thicket of grassy vines that led back into the square. Michael had fled. He didn't like it, but he was determined to find out who'd been causing all the commotion outside. He'd foregone the game of cat and mouse, scrambling about in dank corridors after an enraged opponent. He was tired of chasing rats in dark places. Tired of being the rat. What is that? Michael closed in on the plume of billowing smoke, its source obscured behind a gigantic length of metal leg. The smoke was coming from whatever had made that loud crashing sound a few minutes ago. Michael didn't have breath spare for Flicker, so he kept running, putting distance between him and his pursuer. He reached the wall of green encrusted leg, as tall as a lamppost, grabbed the nearest set of creeping vinery, pulled on it to confirm its strength, and began to grapple his way up the wall, pushing out with his legs as he leant back into a horizontal, seated position. You don't have much energy left. Michael ignored Flicker's words, well aware of the fatigue after his exertions of the last hour. Even the blaster rifle dangling from his back was taking its toll, weighing him down, urging him to quit. The thought only pushed him further. He would not be beat here. Top of the wall, Michael transferred his remaining strength to his arms and shoulders. Pushed swung over the top and rolled onto the leg before crouching. He slowly stood as he realised what lay before him. The wreckage was a gunship. The twisted, broken wings and flaming tail were proof of that. The earth beneath had been churned up and the concrete smashed alongside the limb-splayed body sprawled on the grass. It was none of these things that shocked Michael. He'd seen plenty of grisly crashes. His eyes were stuck to the sheet of metal lying in the grass, strewn from the gunship's side. In its centre was stenciled the letter A, intersecting the blue circle it sat within. It was a simple design, but one that made Michael's heart jump in a way it rarely had before. Like that of reuniting with a long-lost relative. A whole family who Michael had fought dead. And sure enough, there they were. Soldiers wearing sets of Martesian steel armour, the same as their fallen transport. A few of them had noticed Michael and were already advancing towards him, guns raised. I don't know if you have enough energy to escape them. Michael had no intention of escaping. He gently lowered his blaster rifle to the floor. Put your hands up, one of the soldiers shouted from the grass below, voice distorted by his helmet. How many are you with, and where are they? Michael did as he was told. Don't worry, he yelled, feeling slightly silly for having to shout down. I'm on your side. Who are they? More of the soldiers joined, ones not busy helping their comrades out of the wreckage. A few hesitated and glanced at each other when they heard Michael's words. They continued to look, 
from Michael to their neighbours and began lowering their weapons. One man even took off his helmet to get a better look, mouth agape. Are they suspicious of you? They weren't. This was a different kind of reaction, one Michael knew all too well. The soldier giving the instructions hadn't caught on. On our side? And how can we know that for sure? James, the soldier next to him interrupted. Can't you see who that is? The soldier with a woman's voice lowered her rifle, stepped forward, and through the distortion of her helmet, asked, Is it really you? Michael braced himself for the next words, already knowing what they would be. Are you Michael Conway? Fenn used to hate afternoon naps, but in more recent years, he'd seen the appeal of wasting away the empty daytime hours. Plus, one hour of unscheduled sleep during the day had the mysterious effect of allowing plenty of extra drinking that night. It just went to prove that the human body could adapt to any situation. What a tiring day, Coffee said, repeating Fenn's thoughts. How about we go for a jog later? You know, Coffee, Fenn said as he stepped over a chunk of smouldering metal dislodged from the careening gunship. Going for a run right now sounds like the worst possible... Ah, lovely. A group came into view as they rounded a truck, standing in a semicircle shape. They had gathered next to the spy droid, rather than the clearing, where Massif's corpse littered the floor. Plenty of similar decorations had been installed that day amongst the street's clutter. A man stood atop the tip of the old weapon's dead eye, where metal met earth, marking where the lethal jaw of the spy droid lay buried. It was Tonkai, shoulders pushed back, eye reined in to only half a twitch, looking down on everyone from his raised position. Like a gaggle of disciples listening to the sacred words of the Messiah. The Southern Party had joined the crowd, led by the Steelbreaker woman, whose thin face Fenn recognised, but predictably, forgot the name of. She glanced over as they approached, as much approval in her eyes as that of the other clan chiefs. That was to say, not a lot. What's her... That's Yuna, Coffee whispered, preempting the question. Saburo's second. Fenn! Tonkai barked interrupting whatever sermon he'd been giving to the blessed followers. Probably one concerning the saga of his arms business. Where were you? What the fuck has been going on here? Absolute pleasure to see you too. Why am I getting the grilling? Fenn called back to Tonkai and his cohort of Skylers. Bingo was the one in charge. I just spoke to him. A man, undoubtedly from the Hollowcloaks clan, piped up. He's given up on chasing the killer. He saw the man join the Alliance. A murmur went through the crowd, but Tonki wasn't about to abandon the spotlight so easily. So, Fen, how do you explain this? No mud monster? No mud demon? No result! Tonkai shouted, face morphing to beetroot purple. Instead, we have four dead, at least, and the Alliance has enemies. Do you have any idea what you've done? Hey, leave him alone! Coffee, Fenn whispered, grabbing him by the arm. There's no need. I don't care what this guy has to say. He's not to blame, Coffee said, shaking away the cautionary hand. Fenn's a hero! You have got to be kidding me. Another murmur went up from the crowd, as if they'd rehearsed their part in this pantomime. Explain, Yuna commanded. Who else do you think shot down the gunship? Coffee asked. Him? Someone asked, suitably incredulous of the statement. But he can't fight for shit, another said. Not untrue. Isn't he too old? Too old? Is this true? Yuna asked, one delicate eyebrow arched. Well, Fen said, scratching at his suddenly itchy cheek. It wasn't just me. It was all three of us. Three? Yes. Me, Coffee, and... Crap. What was his name? Can't call him Eyebrows. It was bad enough the man had died when the gunship's blaster turret cut short his retreat down the building. Now he couldn't even remember the poor bastard's name. 
It's not my fault. We were never properly introduced. And... Where's Isaac? A deep-voiced newcomer asked. And Isaac, Fen announced, a little too enthusiastically. Oh, and Isaac didn't make it. He didn't what? Fen recognised the new speaker too late. Bingo had returned, standing amongst the quickly separating mercenaries, camo shirt smeared with dirt, grease and grass stains, his nostrils flared. What did you do to him? Bingo asked, directing his venomous spitting to Fen. Settle, Bingo, Yuna said, making Bingo's death stare swivel over to her like a cooked-up owl. Fen's not to blame. He took down the gunship. There were mumbles of agreement. Oh dear, don't tell me they're actually buying that story. Two more people emerged from behind Tonkai, walking down the slope to join the rabble. Wit and the cloaked lady, Tamar the Speechless. Wit certainly looked the part of a war-scarred veteran, covered in fresh bruises and a ripped shirt, and Tamar had managed to swap out her white cloak for a red... Oh. It was blood. Even more strangely, she led Wit by the hand, or clamp to be precise. Fen thought Wit was terrified of the woman he was now out for a pleasant stroll with. He was white as milk, and... Shaking, too? Must have been in shock from being the first man in living memory to hitch up with a woman during battle. Tamar was certainly happy, smile spread across her glowing face. Broken! Tonkai snapped at the coupling stepping by. What do you think you're doing with? He trailed off when he saw Tamar and her blood-soaked attire. She smiled at him, released Wit's clamp and slung her hood overhead, silently slipping into the crowd. No one made to stop her. Fen wondered, if he wore blood-saturated shirts and never spoke to anyone, would people leave him alone too, or lock him up in an asylum? Tonkai's glowering kicked back into gear once Tamar vanished. Broken! I'm paying you to work, aren't I? We're strong! At least she does a job when I tell her! All Wit managed to respond with was a feeble, Huh? Yuna was on her gauntlet, telling the fort to be ready for the Alliance's arrival, although how anyone could prepare for a visit from this guest was beyond Fen. Everyone! Bingo clambered onto the slope, literally overshadowing Tonki. Collect the dead and injured and fall back to the fort. We have much bigger problems to deal with now. Bingo caught Fen with a dangerous eye before storming off through the crowd. What would it take to get off his bad side? Flowers in a box of giant-sized chocolates? Not that it mattered. Everyone on the island was in deep shit now. The group broke apart, grumbling amongst one another as people worked out how little they could get away with carrying for the long walk back. Alliance, eh? Coffee remarked, slapping Fen on the shoulder. Good thing we've got them on the back foot. Back foot? Of course! Now they've got no gunship. This should be easy. Easy. They'd just antagonised the third largest faction in the world. Or was it second? And how many freelancers were there? A few thousand? Yep. Easy. If you've managed to suffer my voice for this long then perhaps you can put up with one minute more. Firstly, I wanted to say that this will probably be the last part of the book that I narrate myself. As much as I enjoy making these audiobook sections, they take up a lot of time, and I have other commitments both within writing and with my job where it's just no longer feasible for me to keep narrating this book. Maybe if demand picks up, I can narrate more myself, but it's more likely I will hire someone to read the rest of the book, as I think a professional can handle this much better than myself, as you've probably already heard. If you've enjoyed what you've heard so far, then I'm very happy about that. I'm sorry you won't be able to listen to the rest of the book right now. If you do want to read further, then please check out the description below for more details about where to buy the book online. 
And if you are a fan of my work, then I can say that the best way to support me is to just leave a review, good or bad, any feedback is welcome. And it also helps spread awareness of my books, which is greatly appreciated from my end. So thank you very much, regardless, for listening this far and hopefully getting some enjoyment out of the book. See you later.